In the first episode of Cobra Kai, you get an inside look at how life's been going for Johnny Lawrence since he lost on that fateful day. And to put it bluntly, it hasn't been going great. I don't want to call the guy a bum, but he lives in an apartment complex by himself where the first thing he gets up in the morning and does is swig a beer. He gets up, gets himself ready, kind of, and heads off to take out the trash before going to work when he's approached by a new neighbor named Miguel. And Miguel introduces himself, but Johnny doesn't want to talk to Miguel at all. And Miguel only really wants to know about the building, what to expect, but Johnny tells him, look, one of the advantages of being here is I don't have to talk to people. So, see ya. So he hops in his Pontiac and drives off, where on the ride to work, he's reminded about his arch nemesis, Daniel LaRusso, thanks to a giant billboard for LaRusso Auto Group. And these are all over town as a constant reminder about a life that maybe could have been for Johnny. He despises seeing these things. He does reach the job for that day, which is working in the rich area of the town, doing handyman stuff, and as he's putting up a TV, the woman of the house starts yelling at him because he put it up on the wrong wall, although in reality, it's her fault and she doesn't realize it. Johnny's getting more and more frustrated and finally snaps at her, stop bitching at me. But all she heard was the word bitch. And when she tells her husband, Johnny ends up getting fired from the job. It's been a rough day for Johnny. So that night he heads to a mini mart and grabs mini mart pizza for dinner. And he ends up running once again into Miguel, who's getting Pepto-Bismol for his grandmother, but Johnny doesn't care, just wanting to really be left alone. He goes outside and starts eating the pizza, but then he gets yelled at by a homeless woman who tells him, stop impeding on my territory. I mean, that's how disheveled Johnny looks. He looks homeless. As he's eating the pizza, though, these four teenagers get out of a car and start walking into the mini mart. But when they come out, they're pushing Miguel, yelling at him because apparently Miguel accidentally tipped off the guy behind the counter that these kids were in high school, not in college, and they were trying to buy beer. And they're pretty pissed off at Miguel. Johnny's watching this all go down, but he doesn't really care that the kid's getting beat up. He also watches them take the Pepto-Bismol out and pour it all over Miguel, but once again, he still doesn't do anything. It's not really until Miguel... Miguel touches his car where Johnny stands up and says, hey, watch the car and leave the kid alone. These kids start making fun of Johnny for the way he looks, what he does for a living, and Johnny tells him, you're messing with the wrong guy on the wrong day. And that's when this little punk, who's the leader of the group, ends up pushing Johnny. And that's the breaking point. Johnny ends up busting out his karate, kicking the crap out of these kids. But beating up on teenagers is kind of frowned upon, and when the cops do show up, they end up arresting Johnny. The next morning, he is bailed out and he heads home. When he gets home, he runs into Miguel, who thanks him for saving him, but asks, what kind of martial art was that? Was that BJJ? Was that Taekwondo? And Johnny says, no, it was old school karate. Miguel asks him if he can teach him because Miguel's worried that once school starts up, those bullies aren't going to forget this incident. They're just going to pick on him more. But Johnny says, no, I'm not really interested in that. In fact, I don't even know if I'm allowed near kids right now. I got to worry about getting a job. Miguel tells him, well, why don't you get a job being a karate teacher? Open your own dojo. But Johnny doesn't want to help Miguel out, saying, if you want my advice, be less annoying. Maybe you won't get your ass kicked doing that. Johnny walks into his house where he finds his stepfather, Sid, because Sid is the one who bailed Johnny out. Sid made a promise to Johnny's dead mom that he would always take care of him, even though this isn't the first run-in with the law and Johnny. Apparently there was an incident with an Applebee's before, and Sid thought that Johnny would learn his lesson, but apparently not. And Johnny and Sid do not have the best relationship, but that seems to be a theme with Johnny because he has his own kid, named Robbie, who's about 15 or 16, that Johnny hasn't seen in a while. But Sid didn't come here just to give Johnny a hard time. He pulls out a check and hands it to Johnny because he's buying Johnny out of his life. Even though he made a promise to Johnny's mom, he says, you know, I think your mom would understand at this point. And I would tell you to get your life together, but I don't see that happening. Johnny, just losing his job, looks the gift horse in the mouth and tears up the check saying, I don't want your money, Sid. But Sid's feeling is, well, I'm done with you. Take the money or not. But I'm not helping you out anymore. That night, as Johnny is drinking his sorrows away watching an old 80s movie, the inspirational message in the 80s movie hits Johnny, really speaks to him. And it's picking Johnny's spirits up a little bit, but the movie goes to commercial break, and the first commercial is for LaRusso Auto Group. And man, is it corny. And Johnny, in frustration, ends up breaking his TV. He ends up going for a drive, but he's drinking and driving and not in the right mindset, constantly being reminded about everything that led him to the moment of getting kicked in the face. He even ends up driving to the All Valley Sports Arena, where he gets out of his Pontiac and walks over and is remembering when his sensei choked him out for winning second place because second place wasn't good enough. But as he's reminiscing over this, his car is suddenly hit by a group of teenage girls. The girls were texting and driving, and they're scared. They don't really know what to do because it's not their car, it's their parents, and they don't want to get in trouble. And as they're talking about what they should do, Johnny, who's drunk, mind you, freaks out and starts banging on the window for them to get out. 
And it's a kind of scary situation when a drunk guy starts banging on your window after you just got in an accident. They end up hitting and running. And Johnny's car is pretty messed up, so he has to get it towed. But when the tow driver gives him the location of where he's towing the car, to Johnny's dismay, it's La Russa Auto Group. So the next day, Johnny heads to La Russa Auto Group, but he walks in there looking like the Unabomber, not wanting to be seen by Daniel at all. He heads to the counter and tells the woman that he never wanted his car to go there, which the woman behind the counter can understand because apparently they have the best prices in the area. But he tells her, I just don't want to do my business there. He also encourages her to speed it up a little bit because he's, quote, in a hurry. But when he overhears one of the sales guys tell two people that just bought a car that Daniel would like to thank them personally, Johnny tries to get the hell out of there. But as he's leaving, Daniel ends up spotting him. Now, Daniel is thrilled to see Johnny, having not seen him in a long time, although Johnny is not really thrilled to see Daniel at all. Johnny tries to leave, but Daniel calls over two other sales guys to introduce Johnny to them, and he says how they went way back and how they used to kind of get into fights back in the day. And that's when one of the sales guys says, yeah, wait, isn't this the karate guy? The guy whose ass you kicked? And Daniel says, well, technically I kicked his face. And Johnny takes exception to that, saying it was an illegal kick, still harping on the past. But Daniel, trying to have cooler heads prevail, says, yeah, whatever, man, it's water under the bridge. And that's when the woman behind the counter comes back and lets Daniel know that Johnny wants to take his car elsewhere, which Johnny doesn't want to have him do because... He's worried that Johnny's going to get screwed over at another auto body place. He tells Johnny that he'll get him a great deal, but then when he sees it's a Pontiac, he says, time for an upgrade, right? Let's walk the lot together, but Johnny doesn't want to walk the lot. Johnny doesn't even want his car there. So Daniel starts crunching the numbers and says, you know what? It's on the house. You're an old friend. The guys could use the work on this old car, but Johnny doesn't want any handouts and says, no, I'll take care of it myself. And Daniel lets him know to fix the car is going to cost more than the car is actually worth. And when he shows Johnny the price, Johnny reluctantly seems to take the offer to fix the car for free. Daniel tells him, hey, hold on a second, I got something for you, and runs back to his office. But when he does, Daniel runs into his daughter, and Johnny recognizes his daughter as one of the girls in the car that hit his car. So Johnny starts to walk out, but Daniel stops him and says, hold on, I got you something, and hands him over a bonsai tree, because he gives every customer a bonsai. He then tells him, hey, I don't blame you for anything that happened back in the day. That was all Cobra Kai, and in fact... We're better off that that place closed anyway, am I right? Hey, I'll, I'll let you know when your car's in. And then sends Johnny on his way. But as Johnny's walking out, he chucks the bonsai on the ground wanting no parts of it. Because Johnny has decided to heed Miguel's advice. Grabbing Sid's check, cashing it, and renting out a spot in the same strip mall as the mini mart where he got arrested at. And Cobra Kai is officially back. So in episode two, Johnny opens up the dojo and he's trying to teach Miguel the old school 80s style of karate, but his methods aren't really hitting home with today's generation. He's trying to teach him how he learned. The first one being strike first, using the analogy that if you see some babes at a party, you want to be the first guy in there. You don't want to wait for some other guy to swoop in and steal them because everyone uses the term babe now. In the middle of this 80s style lesson, some rando walks in, and when Johnny asks him if he's there to learn karate, he says, no, I'm a city inspector. I'm making sure this place is up to code, and it most certainly is not up to code. He tells Johnny that he'll be back in a week, and he has to have the place up to code in order to actually open up the business. And Johnny had no idea he needed to do any of this. Luckily for Johnny, though, he has free labor in a very loyal student in Miguel. So him and Miguel start getting to work, and Miguel sees the trophies and inquires about how Johnny earned them. Johnny fills him in on his karate career, leaving out the whole getting kicked in the face part. But then Miguel gets a phone call from his mother. And when Johnny hears him say, I love you too, Johnny says, you have a girlfriend? He says, no, that was my mom. Miguel tells him how he told his mom that he's on the debate team because his mom would not approve of him being violent. And Johnny asks him, well, what about your dad? Would he approve of you getting your ass kicked? But Miguel fills him in that his dad isn't really a part of his life, which leads to a very awkward situation with the two of them. Now, Daniel, meanwhile, has attended a country club party with his wife, Amanda, and his son, Anthony LaRussa. And Anthony is a kid who's got his head buried in an iPad, and Daniel is trying to get his head out of that iPad unsuccessfully. And he goes over to vent to Amanda about it when they're approached by a family friend named Isaiah and his daughter Aisha. They start making small talk about what they've been doing over the summer, and Aisha inquires as to where Samantha is. But before Daniel can answer, Amanda says, oh, she's with her grandmother. I'll tell her you said hi. And when Isaiah and Aisha walk away, Daniel looks at Amanda and says, grandmother, I can't get her to call my mother. And Amanda says, what do you want me to tell her? She's out hanging out with her more popular friends? 
because Aisha is clearly a nerd. And Daniel's a little annoyed that Samantha isn't there, but Daniel's also on edge because earlier in the day as he was driving to work, he looked over to the left at a red light and saw the new Cobra Kai. So he's a little on edge, but he might have good reason to be because Samantha isn't just hanging out with her new friend. She's hosting a pool party at her house without her parents' knowledge. And some of those friends are Kyler and his group, the same group that beat up Miguel. And Kyler and Sam have a little bit of a thing going. When Daniel gets home, he kind of freaks out a little bit embarrassing Sam in front of her friends and kicking everybody out. Him and Amanda have a conversation about it, and Daniel can't understand why she won't hang out with Aisha or her old friends. He doesn't really like these new friends that she has. But Amanda reminds him there's nothing wrong with being cool. That night as Daniel is walking around the house, he sees a newspaper clipping from when he defeated Cobra Kai with Mr. Miyagi. And then right next to it is a picture of him and Sam doing karate when she was younger. And he's kind of reminiscing about how they used to bond doing that. And how he misses those days. He goes and talks to Sam, who is FaceTiming with her friends, and after she hangs up, he apologizes for kicking all the friends out, but she apologizes for having a party without his knowledge. He then inquires as to the boys that were there, and she admits, yeah, there's a boy named Kyler who I kind of have a thing for. We've been talking a little bit. So Daniel invites him to their family dinner that Friday night. And Sam seems pretty open to this, so she's going to invite him. The next day seems to be the first day of school, and Miguel doesn't really know anybody. He's new to the school. He doesn't know where to sit. Most of the tables are packed. So he finds a table with two kids and asks, can I sit here? And what you learn is that Miguel doesn't really pick up on sarcasm at all. The two kids at the table are a kid named Dimitri and a kid named Eli. And Dimitri is flowing with sarcastic one-liners that Miguel isn't picking up. And Eli is pretty quiet and reserved, very self-conscious because he has a cleft lip. After the group exchanges names, Samantha and her new popular friends walk by, and they've definitely got Miguel's attention. But Dimitri says, dude, don't torture yourself. Those are the rich girls. And Miguel says, well, do you ever talk to them? But Dimitri laughs at this, saying, oh, yeah, we hang out all the time. We make out. We give each other hand jobs." No, man. Do you know what table you're sitting at? You basically guaranteed you're going to be a virgin until the age of 30 by sitting at this table. Eli then notices that their queen bee, a girl named Yasmin, is looking in their direction. And he says, yeah, she's probably making fun of me. But Miguel says, you know, just because she's rich doesn't mean that she's mean. But no, that's exactly what she's doing. Mocking Eli for the way that he looks. She then turns her attention to Aisha, who just sat down at a table near them, calling her Fuglisha. And this is really awkward for Samantha, who's been childhood friends with Aisha for years. But Samantha doesn't stick up for her, just looking in her direction and smiling. Back with Miguel's table, though, Miguel isn't blind. He knows that these girls are gorgeous, but he can't figure out why Dimitri, who is clearly in love with Yasmin, won't get up and talk to her. And it comes down to the fact that Dimitri doesn't want to get rejected. So Miguel, remembering what Johnny said about striking first, gets up and starts walking over to the table. But before he can get there... Kyler and his group of friends swoop in, and they kind of give Miguel a look like, yeah, what do you want? So Miguel just sheepishly walks back to the nerd table. After school that day, Miguel heads to the dojo to continue his lessons, and Johnny starts teaching him the Cobra Strike, which is really nothing more than a punch to the face. Johnny then gets a phone call, though, from his son Robbie's school. And Johnny isn't the emergency contact. It's actually Robbie's mom, but she's not picking up. So the principal went down the list and had to call Johnny. And the reason she's calling is because Robbie has gotten caught with Molly, the drug. So Johnny gets on the phone with Robbie and says, what are you doing with drugs? You want to throw your life away? But Robbie finds that comical coming from Johnny, just handing the phone over back to the assistant principal. And she tells Johnny, I guess I'll continue to try to get a hold of his mom. When Johnny looks back over at Miguel, who's trying to perfect the Cobra Strike, Miguel's really just playing pitter-patter with this dummy. So Johnny says, no, 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 you're doing this all wrong. Envision your enemy. Punch through him. And Miguel envisions Kyler. And all of a sudden, those punches get real straight and real fast. Later that night, Miguel and Johnny continue to clean up the dojo, getting it up to code, with Miguel being tasked with going to clean the toilets. And that's when Daniel walks into the dojo, because Daniel had family dinner night where they invited Kyler. And Daniel noticed that Kyler had a black eye and his knuckles were all scraped up and asked what happened when Kyler lied to him, saying that him and his friends had gone to the mini mart in the strip mall for some protein bars when they were attacked by this random guy outside who busted out some karate. And since Daniel had seen that Cobra Kai opened up in a strip mall with a mini mart, he's been able to put two and two together. So he's shown up at the dojo to confront Johnny, saying, really, you're now beating up kids? But Johnny says, no, I wasn't beating up kids. I was beating up a couple of assholes. Daniel didn't come here for confrontation telling Johnny, just stay away from my daughter and her friends. But Johnny laughs at this, saying, well, your daughter's friends were wailing on a kid who was half their size, so 
Maybe you don't think you know your daughter as well as you think you do. Why don't you get your house in order? That's when Miguel walks out from the bathroom, having no idea that Daniel was there or this conversation was going down because he had headphones in. And he apologizes to Johnny for interrupting, saying, Sorry, Sensei. And when Daniel hears this, he finds it comical that anyone is calling Johnny Lawrence Sensei. Telling Miguel, Look, kid, I don't know what this guy's telling you, but if you continue to listen to him, you're going to end up just like him. He then turns back to Johnny and says, You and I? This? Yeah, we're not done. And starts to walk out. But Johnny yells at him, hey man, I'm right here. But Daniel just waves him off, basically indicating he's not worth it, walks out. In episode 3, the bold strategy of only having one student isn't really paying off for Johnny. He's quickly hemorrhaging cash. And he needs to find new students and he's stressed out about it. Miguel says, well, have you thought about advertising? And Johnny acts like he has, but he hasn't. But it's a great idea, so that day he hits the street. Hiring the homeless woman from the shopping center to stand on the corner and twirl one of those big arrows to drum up some business, but also walking the streets handing out flyers. And this is yet another example that Johnny isn't really from 2020. When he goes up to a bunch of kids in the park and says to them, hey, if you want those babes over there, you'll learn some cool moves like karate. They don't really jump for joy at his offer because some random guy coming up and offering them karate lessons in the park is kind of weird in this day and age. So Johnny's striking out, and it's not like Daniel's doing any better. Johnny's comments about not knowing his daughter have really stuck with Daniel, and he can't focus. Amanda tells him, we met this kid, Skylar. He seems like a good kid. Give him a chance. But he's a dad, and Samantha's his only daughter. So that day when he goes to work, he tells a couple of the sales associates at work about it, and their big suggestion is to grab her cell phone, because the truth is in everybody's cell phone. Check her text messages and see what's really going on. And when Samantha's in the shower, he does that. Seeing a text message from Skylar that says that he can't wait to see her at the dance, he's got a big surprise for her, and he'll give it to her when they sneak off. And Samantha is completely unaware of this. The next day at school, all the kids get a talking to from one of the faculty members about cyberbullying. This faculty member seems completely oblivious to the fact that she's doing more harm than good, telling all the kids that she recently had a parent call up that her son was crying because kids were making fun of his facial deformity. And there aren't a lot of kids with facial deformities in that school, so it's pretty obvious that it's Eli. She then goes into the school dance in appropriate costumes, but the kids aren't really listening to her. And Aisha slides up to the popular kids' table and starts talking to Samantha, telling her that she has the perfect costume to go as, sodium chloride, because they usually go as costume pairs. And when people ask what they are, they'll just throw salt. Yasmin, seeing that Sam is talking to Aisha, has to interject, saying, what is that, some stupid inside joke between you two? Not understanding that sodium chloride is table salt. I mean, the idiot. Yeah, I'll act like I knew that too. Samantha then tells Aisha that they've all decided to go as Laker girls, and maybe they can get an extra costume for Aisha, but Yasmin puts an end to that, saying even though they're one-size-fits-all, she doesn't think that's going to work for Aisha, really hurting Aisha's feelings. That night at dinner, Sam is telling her parents that she feels bad about it, but she doesn't want to go to a Halloween dance dressed as a molecular compound. And her mom is taking her side, saying, well, you don't have to, but it doesn't mean you don't have to hang out with Aisha as well. You can see her at the dance. And Sam thinks that's a pretty good point. But then Daniel mentions how he'll be chaperoning the dance. And Samantha is pissed. She feels like it's completely embarrassing that her dad is going to be a chaperone there, even though Daniel says, don't worry about me, I'll be a ghost. When in reality, his intentions are to keep an eye on his daughter. Now, back with Johnny, he might have actually had his ass saved by Miguel. Because Miguel shows up for training that day and Johnny tries to cancel it. But Miguel's been hard at work, creating a website for Cobra Kai and mentioning how they can do a whole social media advertising campaign. Something that Johnny was completely unaware even existed. So this really brightens up Johnny's mood and he decides to help Miguel. Because Miguel has been wanting to learn how to kick and break boards. So Johnny tells him, meet me at the school tonight at midnight. And when Miguel does... They meet at the school pool. Johnny ties a brick to his hands and then drops him in there, saying, if he wants to learn how to kick, he needs to learn how to use his legs. So kick up. And it takes a little bit. And a few times, Johnny does have to save him, but eventually, Miguel is able to kick up and avoid drowning. And through that, he's finally able to start breaking boards on a regular basis. But it's the night of the school dance, and Miguel's outfit is hard to look at. I mean, bless his grandmother's heart for making it, but it, it's ugly. And Johnny, who's going to go with him to the school dance to try to drum up some more students, Tells him, dude, you can't go like that. We have a reputation uphold. And has Miguel go dressed as a skeleton. The same skeleton that Johnny was dressed at when he kicked the crap out of Daniel back in the day. So while Miguel meets up with Eli and Dimitri, Johnny's just walking around the school hanging up flyers for Cobra Kai. And Daniel is unaware that Johnny's even there keeping his eyes on his daughter, who's hanging out with Skylar. But she breaks away to go talk to Aisha, telling her that she likes her costume. But Aisha says, 
doesn't really make much sense without the chloride part. Samantha starts to kind of apologize for how things have gone down and then tells her, you know, I'd really like to hang out. It's been a long time. And Aisha says, yeah, I'd love that. So things seem to be going great with Samantha, but her dad is suddenly having PTSD flashbacks because he sees Miguel walk by in that skeleton costume and then... Out of the corner of his eye, he notices a flyer for Cobra Kai. And he just has a hunch that Johnny is near. So he starts walking around the school and finds him and tells him, you can't be here. You can't be on school premises hanging this stuff around. But he gets distracted because he sees down the hallway Samantha run off with Skylar. And this is going to be where he gives her the big surprise. They sneak off into a room and Skylar tells her it's in my pocket, but I need help getting my belt off. And Daniel walks in and finds his daughter in a pretty compromising position. I mean, it looks bad. It wasn't really bad. And he breaks it up saying, all right, that's enough. I knew I had a bad feeling about you. But Skylar tells him, I was just trying to give her a necklace that was my grandmother's. It really embarrasses Samantha and she runs off, chastising her dad, meeting up with her friends and saying, hey, can we go? But Yasmin, who's holding her phone, says, yeah, in a second. And then all of a sudden, Samantha gets a text message. And everybody at the dance gets a text message. And the text message is of Aisha at the food table eating. And the video says, the buffet is under attack. And Aisha gets this, and everyone's laughing at her. And it just makes her feel really bad to the point where she leaves. Because these girls are straight up cruel. Now, a couple of guys that might not have gotten the Aisha text message because they're just not cool enough are Miguel, Dimitri, and Eli. And they're in the bathroom cursing themselves out because they didn't have the guts to go up and ask any girl to dance. But then they start hearing Skylar and his group talk about what went down with Skylar and Samantha and how Daniel broke it up. And apparently that whole BS about his grandmother's necklace wasn't even true. He's tried that before. But as the boys are eavesdropping, they knock over some lacrosse sticks and it alerts Skylar and his group to the fact that someone's listening to him. And when they see it's Miguel and the nerd herd, all of a sudden Skylar becomes Tommy Toughnuts again. Now Dimitri and Eli get the hell out of there, but with the newfound confidence that Miguel has from breaking boards and learning karate, he stands his ground. And Skylar tells him, you know, that guy's not going to help you now. But Miguel doesn't need it. Kicking Skylar down, although he does forget it's four versus one and eventually that group ends up grabbing Miguel and kicking the crap out of him and as Johnny is continuing to hang flyers on the halls he sees Skylar and his group leave the bathroom joking about what they just did and when he goes inside he finds Miguel face down on the ground beat up and yes it took me till episode three to realize that Kyler is the bully in this and they call him Kai After finding Miguel all banged up, Johnny took him to his house, where his mom yelled at Johnny saying, stay away from my son. And Johnny feels really bad about this, so he goes on a bender, walking aimlessly down the street, drunk, when he sees a guy spray painting, and he trades the guy beer for his spray paint can. Because across the street is a giant billboard for La Russa Auto Group, and he hops up there and spray paints a giant dick going into Daniel's mouth. So the next morning when Daniel's driving to work, he's already stressed out because he's been trying to make it with Sam, but she's been giving him the cold shoulder. And then Amanda calls him saying, hey, I don't know if you heard about the billboard. And he assumes that it's a billboard for his rival, Tom Cole, because that billboard is huge. But she says, no, I meant our billboard. And that's when he sees it. The giant dick. I mean, the thing's huge. So he calls the police and he wants somebody arrested. He's infuriated about this. But Amanda reminds him, if they arrest everybody who's walking around spray painting dicks, there'd be no room in the jails for actual murderers. She implores Daniel to not let it bother him. They'll just paint over it. And Daniel sends his two sales associates up on the billboard to do just that. Now, that same morning, Miguel wakes up and his mother is very concerned. She offers to call the school and tell the school about the bullying situation. But he says, no, you're only going to make it worse. He wants to continue training with karate, but his mom thinks that Johnny's a bad influence. And Miguel's grandmother is actually on Miguel's side, saying, hey, he just found something that he really likes doing. And clearly, he needs it, so let him do it. But his mom is very anti-Johnny and anti-karate. And Miguel is telling his mom he's a great guy, really defending him, having no idea that a few doors down, Johnny is passed out in a drunken stupor. And that's when Johnny is awoken by a phone call from Robbie's school once again. But this time, it's not like Robbie had drugs on him. No, no, he's just skipping school. Telling the school that him and his dad were going on a kayaking trip. But it was only supposed to be for two weeks, and that was a month ago. So Robbie hasn't been in school for a month, and the school tells Johnny that they're going to need him back in or he's expelled. So Johnny heads out trying to find Robbie when he runs into Miguel, and Miguel tells him, my mom's not really into this karate thing, but I think we can train. And Johnny just cuts him off, telling him it's not going to work. He's going to shut down the dojo. So Johnny heads to Robbie's house, and Miguel heads off to school. And Johnny finds Robbie at his house with a couple of miscreants, and Robbie's been spending his days stealing computers, selling them on Craigslist, just getting into a bunch of trouble. And Johnny starts taking some pot shots at Robbie's mom which Robbie takes real offense to. Johnny gets back on track, though, saying, I get it. School sucks. But you have your whole future to look forward to. 
And now it's Robbie's turn to take a pot shot back saying, oh yeah, maybe I can grow up and have my own karate dojo in a strip mall. Because Robbie has seen the Flyers, but Johnny doesn't take that bait, saying we're not talking about me, we're talking about you here. You can still make something of yourself. And Robbie takes another pot shot, saying, Oh, you mean like your old buddy Daniel LaRusso? Yeah, it must be real nice to be a winner. And that one really stuck with Johnny. To the point where he says, you know what, I don't even care. Go to school, don't go to school, do what you want. And that is part of the problem. In Robbie's opinion, Johnny doesn't care. He never did. So Robbie sends him on his way saying, I don't want to go to school. And my mom's cool with it and I'm cool with it. So you can leave now. But Johnny's not done. He goes and tracks down Robbie's mom in a bar where she's about to have lunch or dinner or whatever, you know, girls got to eat, with some random guy. And Johnny's ex running off to bars seems to be a habit, and Johnny starts lecturing her about it. But more importantly, the whereabouts of her son, which she finds hilarious because she says this is the first time that Johnny is actually aware of where his son is. She tells Johnny, I can't make him go to school. I can't make him do anything anymore. And Johnny says, well, then he can come live with me. I'll make him go to school. But she cracks up at that because Johnny isn't an actual dad. He has no parenting skills. But when she's laughing at him, he yells at her saying, well, at least I haven't given up on him. And she flips out at him because she's always been there for Robbie. Anytime a momentous occasion in his life has happened, she's been there, and Johnny hasn't. So Johnny just got told off by two people in his life. And the other person in his life currently is Miguel, who has gone to school and is talking with Eli and Dimitri about how he's going to have to give up karate, which Dimitri thinks is a great idea because it was giving him self-confidence. And in Dimitri's opinion, self-confidence only got people beat up. But the group's study session in the library is interrupted by Kyler and the bully version of Fortune Feimster, the comedian. They start picking on the group and really making fun of Eli and his cleft lip. And unbeknownst to Kyler, Samantha had watched it all go down, and she was not amused. And the two had plans to go on a movie date. Which is amazing considering that Kyler is able to get any girl with the hairstyle he's choosing. I mean, poor Eli can't help his lip. Kyler can help that hair. So he really should be grateful, but he's not. And when he goes to the movies with Sam, Sam really doesn't want anything to do with him. He tries to make some moves on her, but she tells him, I saw what you did in the library to those kids. He lies to her saying, yeah, well, we're friends. Don't worry about it. And he continues to persist, but she tells him to stop. But he continues getting a little too handsy. And that's when she busts out the karate leaving him in the movies. So that's what Sam did after school. Miguel after school is kind of a broken man. He gets picked up by his mom, and she attempts to take him to the movies, which is kind of ironic, but he figures that it's just a distraction from karate. And since he knows that him getting bullied isn't going to stop, the thought of karate is upsetting him. Luckily for him, though, his mom kind of sees this and allows him to do karate, with a little help from Johnny, who realized that the only person who hasn't abandoned him is Miguel. And Johnny headed to Miguel's house, knocked on the door, and pleaded with his mother to give him one more chance and let him teach her son karate, and she agrees. So, Miguel is allowed to go back to training with Johnny. But Johnny's nemesis, Daniel, has spent most of the morning obsessed with Dickgate. Although he's got to get on track because he's got a meeting with an advertising agency. And they show him their latest commercial for his main rival, Tom Cole. And it's obvious that Tom is taking shots at Daniel. Daniel gives out bonsai trees. This guy is giving out a cactus pointing out that we're in the middle of a drought and it takes a lot of water to water a bonsai. He also pokes fun at the fact that Daniel's whole shtick is karate, so he goes with the patriotic theme. And that's one thing that really bothers Daniel. No one seems to think that the whole karate gimmick is real. They all think it's a gimmick. And he has to remind the women, no, I was actually a two-time champ. But when he sees this advertisement, he gets really pissed off and heads to Tom Coles to confront the guy. And Tom seems like a douchebag, poking fun at Daniel for the whole karate gimmick. Even though Daniel reminds him that it's real, he still mocks him. But Daniel's not amused. It seems like Tom kind of makes amends saying, look, it's just a commercial, don't take it personally. There's room in this area for two auto kings. Hey, how about I get you a boba tea? But Daniel says, no, I'm good. And that's when Tom says, yeah, you're probably full from eating all that dick. And that is the straw that breaks the camel's back. And Daniel hits him with a spinning heel kick that knocks his boba tea out of his hand and shuts everybody in that auto dealership up. The next day, things are going much better for Daniel. Sam is now talking to him and tells everybody that Kyler's probably not going to be in the picture anymore. And he tries to hide it, but Daniel's relieved. But when he heads to work, the two guys that had painted over the dick on the billboard show Daniel what they found on that billboard. And it's a bunch of flyers for Cobra Kai, and now Daniel is fully aware of who painted that dick. In episode 5, Daniel needs to come up with a plan on what to do about Johnny, and he thinks he's found one. He invites a business guy over to his country club, and this guy used to be a member of the country club until he was kicked out for peeing in the shower. And this guy is a real estate mogul, so Daniel inquires into real estate in Reseda. Knowing full well that this guy only has one location in Reseda, and it's the strip mall that Cobra Kai is located in. And Daniel asks if he's interested in selling it. He continues to harp on the guy for a few days, calling him up and asking him, and... 
The guy can't figure out why Daniel wants this property so badly because Reseda is a shithole. But Daniel plays it off like, well, call it nostalgia. I'm from the area. But the guy thinks there's an ulterior motive going on. And Daniel tells him, I don't even know why you want to keep this thing. I mean, the strip mall down the street is charging twice the rent. But the businessman, sensing that he's being conned, says, no dice. And that was Daniel's plan all along. To plant that little nugget into him that he's charging too little for the rent. Now, back with Cobra Kai, Miguel and Johnny continue to train. Learning kicks, learning how to block. But one of the biggest things that Johnny is trying to hammer home is you can't expect your opponent to fight fair. And Miguel is still Johnny's only student, but that's about to change. Because Aisha walks through the door. But Johnny tells her, I'm sorry, there are no girls allowed in Cobra Kai. It's just like the United States Army. It makes no sense to have females in there. I'll keep hammering it home. This guy was like dropped from the 80s. Miguel pulls him aside and says, yeah, we need to talk about this. Because not only is it sexist, but Aisha's father used to play in the NFL which means he's loaded. And he tells Johnny, if you're looking to fix your issue of a paying student, you have one right out there. So Johnny allows Aisha to join Cobra Kai. And Johnny throws Aisha right in the deep end, telling Miguel to fight Aisha, even though it's her first day. But once again, you can't expect your opponent to fight fair. So Miguel kicks Aisha down and feels really bad about it. But Aisha gets up, harnessing that ability from her dad, and tackles Miguel landing on his ribs and taking him out. But this lesson is interrupted when they're screaming outside, and Johnny goes to investigate to find that landlord talking to the mini-mart attendant that he's upping the rent. And this is bad news for Johnny. He was already having rent problems as is, only having one student after all, to the point where he actually had to sublet out the studio to a yoga class, which hurt him to his core. So upping the rent is a big problem for Johnny. He tries to make rent that month by going to a pawn shop and hawking junk, not realizing that it's junk, but the guy tells him as much. He's depressed and he heads to that mini mart to grab some beer because he's all out when he hears from behind him a guy asks for spray paint and he recognizes that voice. It's Daniel LaRussa. He awkwardly asks him how he's doing and Daniel mentions how he overheard the rent was being jacked up and he can't understand how Johnny can afford it being a small business owner and all, but hey, good for him. He then tells the attendant to put his beer on Daniel's tab and he walks out thinking he got one over on Johnny. He then heads home to celebrate, thinking that he won this battle, and he starts telling his wife how he had planted the notion to jack up the rent in that mini mart to get rid of Cobra Kai, but his wife isn't in the mood to celebrate because she's actually disgusted. She says, did you ever even think about the other owners in that mini mart and how it would affect them? And this is all over your old high school rival? I don't know where the Daniel LaRusso that I married went, but I want him back. And it's a lot of food for thought for Daniel. The next day, Daniel heads to Mr. Miyagi's plot and is telling him, I wish you were here right now. Give me advice. And when he gets home that day, he decides to clean out his old dojo. He had been using it as really a storage facility, but he cleans it out and he starts training again. But Samantha has been going through a really rough time. Her friends are blowing her off and she can't figure out why. And she finds them smoking weed in a car and confronts them about it. Why have you been blowing me off? And they tell her it's because Kyler had told them that Sam said that she was better than them. Which Yasmin takes as an insult, saying, you were nobody before we let you in. But that's not the only thing that Kyler told them. Kyler has been spreading a rumor throughout the school that Sam went down on him in that movie. And Sam says that isn't true, but it doesn't seem like her, quote, friends are really interested in listening to her side of things. And she says, you know what, screw you, and leaves. When she gets to school the next day, her old spot at that lunch table with her old friends is taken by Yasmin's bag. She awkwardly goes up to Aisha's table, but Aisha says, yeah, don't even think about it. Why don't you go sit with Kyler? I heard he doesn't mind that you suck. And that's when she's had enough going up to confront Kyler, asking him, why are you spreading rumors about me? And he says, look, I don't know what you're talking about. All we did was see a movie even though I think I saw more of it than you did. And that little truffle shuffle friend that he has chimes in, yeah, I heard you really got choked up. And that triggers Sam to the point where she throws Kyler's food on the ground. He then loudly proclaims to the entire cafeteria, everybody see that dick drawn on the billboard? Yeah, that was Sam's dad. I guess it runs in the family. And Sam is about to use her karate on him. But Miguel has seen enough, stepping in and saying, why do you always gotta be a dick? And since they kicked the crap out of him a couple of weeks ago, they think they can do it again, but... Miguel's continued to train, and Miguel destroys all of them. I mean, they keep coming at waves, but he keeps knocking them down one by one, using all the training that Johnny had shown him, ending with smashing Kyler in the face with a lunch tray. And when the dust clears, all of the kids in the cafeteria have their camera phones out filming it, clapping, and also in shock that Miguel just did that to these guys. So right after school, he heads to Johnny's to tell him what happened, how he beat up all four of those guys, using all the training that Johnny showed him. Johnny's big concern, however, is... Great, now your mom's not going to let me train with you. But he says, don't worry about it. The school called, and my grandmother answered, and I don't think she's ever been more proud of me. So Johnny tells him, all right, I have something for you, and takes him out to his car and gives him his gi. 
the gi that he had trained with back in the 80s. Because Miguel had inquired, when do I get one of those? And Johnny had told him, you have to earn it. And by beating up all four of those bullies, Johnny feels like he has earned it. The next day, when Johnny pulls up at the dojo, worried about the rent issue, well, that's been solved. Because that viral video of Miguel kicking the crap out of the bullies has gotten around school for the people that weren't in attendance. And it's got a lot of bullied kids ready to learn karate. That Miguel video was the best publicity for Cobra Kai. But one of those kids is not Robbie, his own son. You get a look into Robbie's personal life at home with his mom. And it seems like all she's concerned with is going out and finding a husband, leaving Robbie alone most of the time, even though he does want to spend quality time with his mom. She does mention how Johnny had showed up and even talked about Robbie moving in with him. And Robbie had actually gone over to Cobra Kai to see his dad, but he saw his dad hugging Miguel, and that hurt. So in order to get back at his dad, he applies for a job at LaRusso Auto Group as a janitor with a doctored resume and Amanda hires him on the spot. In episode 6, Johnny is dealing with the fact that he is a packed dojo, but it's a dojo full of nerds and outcasts, which isn't exactly Cobra Kai material. He starts going through the line insulting all of these kids, but Johnny's insults are the whole reason why they're there. They hear all this stuff in school. So Johnny throwing it out there after school isn't really helping these kids. Two of the guys that are there are Eli and Dimitri. And when Johnny starts picking on Eli, calling him Lip because of his cleft lip, Dimitri stands up for him, saying how that's not helping. A few of the kids, including Miguel, tell Dimitri to stop talking back, but Dimitri says no. He's not a teacher. He can't fail us. We're paying him. And besides, it's not like he's going to hurt us. And that's when Johnny makes a little space and tells Dimitri, punch me in the face. And when Dimitri tries... Johnny turns him into a pretzel, telling all the kids, let that be a lesson to you. The next day at school, Miguel tries to convince Dimitri to come back, but Dimitri wasn't into it in the first place. He kind of just got dragged there by Eli, and he's definitely not into getting insulted and embarrassed and yelled at by some guy who he's paying. Miguel tries to convince him, look, you don't know him like I do. He's actually a really good guy. Just come back, but Dimitri's mind seems to be made up. The two are heading to biology class, and another person in that biology class is Sam, and Sam is still getting razzed about this rumor that Kyler spread around about how she went down on him in the movies. The kids are really creative, leaving blow pops at her desk, sneaking bananas into her bag. But when the biology class starts, they're going to be dissecting pigs that day, and Sam's partner is absent. So the teacher says, who wants to take her in? And nobody really wants to take Sam in. And that's when Miguel steps up saying, we'll take her, volunteering him and Dimitri to bring Sam into the group. And during the dissection, Sam thanks him for sticking up for her. He says, don't worry about it. Somebody had to stand up to those guys, but... She says, yeah, but nobody did except you. But then she starts breaking down the fight like an analyst, telling him how he telegraphed everything. And he's really impressed because she clearly knows what she's talking about. After school, Miguel heads to Cobra Kai to go through training, but a lot of the kids have bailed. And Johnny is kind of surprised about this. But he tries to spin the narrative saying, you know what, me treating those kids hard, that was a test. And you guys all passed. And then he sees Eli there and says, look, even Lip passed. He wasn't going to take that stuff. But he keeps harping on Eli's cleft lip. Even after Eli asks him to stop, he keeps harping on it, saying, no, you got to change the narrative. You think bullies are going to stop just because you ask them to? But he doesn't let go. And Eli ends up leaving. So after the class, Miguel has a talk with Johnny saying, you can't be this hard on these kids. You wanted a full dojo. You've got it now. But the issue is Johnny just didn't want a full dojo of nerds. Miguel shakes his head saying, you know what, man? You just don't get it. You don't know how it is to be us. I'll see you tomorrow. And he walks out. But that's not entirely true. When Johnny gets home, he sees the box full of crap that he tried to pawn. And one of the items in there is his Walkman. And it reminds him of the time where he came home excited because he had just discovered the Cobra Kai dojo. And he asked his mom, along with Sid, if he could do karate. But Sid thought it was a waste of money saying he would quit. And Sid was bringing up the fact that Johnny had no friends and he was a loser. And you learn that it really wasn't until Johnny joined Cobra Kai that he came out of that from being a nerd. The confidence of joining Cobra Kai led him to being who he is today. A real rad guy who gets babes. So the next day, he heads to training where even more kids have dropped out. And he tells them, I've been hard on you guys. And I'm not going to apologize for it because I know what it's like to be you. I was once you. I mean, not as nerdy as this kid over here, but close to it. And that's when some random new kid comes into the dojo, but Miguel recognizes him. It's actually Eli with a mohawk. And no one noticed Eli's cleft lip. And Eli says, I'm changing the script. And he gets in line. And Johnny stops calling him lip and starts calling him hawk. Now, late that night, Sam is sitting there studying when she gets a message from Instagram telling her that she's been tagged in a video. And she's hesitant to look at it because a lot of kids have tagged her in some pretty unflattering stuff. But when she opens it up, it's a video from Miguel pretending to be the dissected pig. And it really brightens up Sam's spirits. 
Now, it's worth mentioning that Daniel has no idea that Sam is dealing with harassment at school. He's cleared at the dojo, and he wants Sam to train with him, but Sam says, that was eight years ago, I'm not really into that, and turns him down. Anthony also turns him down, but it doesn't seem like Anthony is into anything except being a brat. So when he goes to work that day, Daniel asks one of the sales associates if he wants to train, but sales associate isn't into it either. Daniel then inquires as to how Robbie's doing because he's pretty new to the job, and Anish, the sales associate, tells him, oh, he's doing great. He's picking up everything. He's helping out a lot. So Daniel tells him to go over and tell him to keep up the good job. But Anish doesn't. Instead, heading over there with Louie, the other sales associate, who is Daniel's cousin, and busting Robbie's balls. Robbie starts to walk away, but Louie says, hold on. If you really want to impress my cousin, we have to change these cars around the showroom. So take that Porsche and put it closer to the window. But when Robbie gets in the car and starts it up, Daniel loses it on him because he started it up in a crowded showroom, scaring the hell out of a lot of customers. And Robbie Robbie, seeing that he was the butt of a joke, says, you know what, screw this, I'm out, and starts walking out of the place. But Daniel goes after him, and when he finally catches up to Robbie, Robbie turns around like he's going to clock him in the face. Daniel, though, tells him, if you punch me like that, you're going to break your thumb, and shows him how to properly make a fist. He then apologizes, saying, I should have seen your side of the story, come back to work. And when they find out that it was Louie who talked him into doing that, they make Louie do Robbie's work for the day. Robbie offers to help him out, but Louie says, no, you do the crime, you do the time. But if you're still looking to get in the good graces of my cousin, he needs these reports taken to his house every night, and it's just out of the way for me. So Robbie says, okay, I'll do it. Even though he is a little suspicious, it might be another prank. Robbie gets to Daniel's house that night, and he finds Daniel training in his dojo. And when he gives him the report, Daniel shows him what the, quote, report was. It was a magazine. And Daniel tells Robbie, you gotta start getting smarter with this, man. And Robbie feels like a fool. But then he starts inquiring as to what kind of karate Daniel's doing. And Daniel offers to show him some moves if he wants. And Robbie says, okay. Now Daniel has a kid he can mentor, and he starts teaching Robbie all the things that Mr. Miyagi taught him. Wax on, wax off, and turning everyday chores into karate lessons. But just like Daniel back in the day, Robbie doesn't see it like that. He just sees Daniel being lazy. But when Daniel gets in the dojo, he tells him, wipe the window, wax on, wax off. And that is an epiphany for Robbie. He finally sees, just like Daniel back in the day, that all of those things were actually karate lessons. And he buys in. The next day, Robbie's on his lunch break when his two buddies show up. And they had been razzing him about getting a job at LaRusso Auto Group, but Robbie played it off like he was doing it only to piss off his dad. But they have a new scheme, and that scheme is to get into LaRusso Auto Group. They don't want to steal cars, they just want to steal everything in a car. And they want Robbie to help them do that, giving them the key code. But Robbie doesn't have the key code. He also seems really hesitant to want to screw over Daniel. And they tell him, well, you can get it, right? Or maybe you just don't want to. Do you remember the last time somebody didn't want to help us out? Yeah, that guy got pretty messed up. So they threaten Robbie into getting the key code, and he's able to do it by filming Amanda going in. But his relationship with Daniel is continuing to grow, just like a bonsai, to the point where Daniel actually lets him trim the bonsais that they give out, which is a pretty big deal. And this is all because Daniel realizes that Robbie's a pretty good kid, he just had a rough go of it. He needs a positive male role model in his life. And Daniel goes and checks up on Robbie with the bonsais, but Robbie's having a tough go of it. And Daniel tells him, you just have to envision what you want the bonsai to look like and make it happen. And Robbie realizes that this is probably a metaphor, and Daniel says, yes, it is. You're the bonsai. Envision what you want your life to be and make it happen. But as soon as Daniel leaves, he gets a text from his boy saying, I'll see you tonight. Because that night is the night where they're going to break into La Russa Auto Group. But Robbie's made the decision that he's not going to allow that to happen. And when his buddies show up, he tells them, I'm not letting you in. He uses the karate that Daniel has taught him to fight him off. And it works for a while, but he is new to karate. And they do end up getting him cornered. And Robbie's only saved when he points at the security camera above his head. So they run off, but before they do, they tell him, watch your ass. Now, over with his dad, Johnny has realized that a lot of these kids during training are flinching. And he asks them, how many of you haven't been punched in the face? And to his surprise, it's most of the class. So he says, all right, before you leave today... You're getting punched in the face. But one of those kids is not Miguel. So while Johnny's sitting in his office listening to all these kids getting punched in the face, Miguel comes in because he's looking for girl advice. He wants to ask Sam out, but he's nervous that he's going to get rejected. And Johnny reminds him, you're Cobra Kai. You strike first. Don't take no for an answer. Be persistent. Miguel then notices that he's holding a flyer for the All-Valley U18 tournament. He asks, are we going to enter that? But Johnny says, no, I don't think we're ready. And Miguel seems a little disappointed about that. But he takes the advice from Johnny. And the next day he heads to school and he awkwardly asks Sam to go on a date. And she says, while she's flattered, after the whole bit with Kyler, she's not really in the market to start dating someone. But Miguel remembers to be persistent. Strike first. And he rewords it, saying, well, what if we just go and hang out? And it's not a date. We just simply hang out. 
And his persistence pays off, and she agrees, although they both kind of know it's a date. So when Miguel goes to the dojo that day after school, he's looking for some advice on where to take her. Eli says, take her to go get tattoos. And then he promptly shows off his back tattoo that he got, which his parents have no idea about. But the person he's really looking for advice from is Aisha, because she used to be friends with Sam. Although she does point out, don't look at me, we used to be friends. Miguel asks her, come on, you, you know her, what is she like? And Aisha says, well, she likes chocolate and astronomy. So that gives Miguel a pretty good idea what to do. But then he hears Johnny screaming on the phone. Because Johnny did call up about entering Cobra Kai into the competition, only to find out that Cobra Kai has a lifetime ban. And when Miguel asks what's going on and Johnny explains, Johnny tells him there's not much I can do. But Miguel is a little surprised about that because he says, we're Cobra Kai, we don't give up. Be persistent, don't take no for an answer. And Johnny looks at him and says, you know what, you're right, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to kick their ass. But Miguel says, whoa, whoa, that's not what I was talking about at all. Maybe... There's a smarter way to handle this. And Johnny thinks about this, and he decides, yeah, you're probably right. And he's going to head to the committee to plead his case. He meets up with Miguel beforehand because that's the night of Miguel's date with Samantha. And he asks, what are you planning on doing with her? And Miguel explains his plan, and he says, no, 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 that sounds terrible. Take her where I used to take my dates. And it's the Golf and Stuff Family Fun Center. And Miguel takes Sam there, or I should say Sam takes Miguel there because she drove. And the two have an absolute blast. They really hit it off. At one point, she's asking him, are you as bad at karate as you are at mini golf? And Miguel tells her, I'm the best one in my dojo. He starts showing her some stances and whatnot, and she ends up taking him down pretty easily out of nowhere, to which he is very impressed with. She then gets on top of him and tells him, this is the best date I've ever been on, and kisses him. And you get the feeling this is probably Miguel's first kiss. Now over with Johnny, he shows up at the committee meeting and tells them, I don't understand why my dojo has been banned for life. And all the members of the committee are shocked about this. They didn't even know they could ban dojos for life. But that's when Daniel LaRusso shows up, because Daniel is a part of the committee. And he starts showing them why Cobra Kai is banned for life. But instead of getting mad, Johnny pleads his case, saying how his old sensei is dead, and the other guy that they mentioned, he's never even heard of. And to the dismay of Daniel, they put it up for a vote, and it passes. Cobra Kai is back in the tournament. And after both of their successful nights, Johnny and Miguel meet up, have a victory toast, because Cobra Kai is back in the All-Valley Karate Championships. In episode 8, Daniel's mother has come over to help out, and the LaRussos are all eating lunch, when Daniel's really excited to tell her all about Robbie, his new protege. And through Robbie, he's realized how much he truly missed karate. But Amanda comes outside and says, I just got a call from the dealership that a bunch of sketchy guys on motorcycles were looking for Louie. And Louie, who's there, says, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you. I met these bikers at an auto convention and we really hit it off. And when they found out who I was, we came up with this really great idea. LaRusso Luxury Motorcycles. But Daniel is not into that at all and yells at him saying, you can't use my name for business. Louie starts to apologize saying, I'm sorry, I'll make it up to you guys. And Amanda says, yeah, we've heard that before. But Daniel's mom sticks up for Louis, saying he made a mistake, let it go. But this infuriates Amanda. She screams at Daniel's mother, a mistake is when you leave the shop unlocked, which she's done plenty of times. But this, this is affecting our business, so why don't you keep out of it? Now, Daniel tries to make Peacemaker because his mom's insulted at this point, saying she didn't mean what she said, but... Amanda says, no, I meant what I said. We wouldn't have this problem in the first place if it wasn't for your mother insisting that we hire Louie. This sparks a big fight between everybody at the table. Now, over on the other side of town, Johnny's been training all the kids for the tournament, but he's decided to focus most of his attention on Miguel because he says, let's face it, you're my only shot. But during training one day, Miguel gets a text message from Samantha and he starts to crack up about it. And Johnny wants to know what's so funny. And he says, oh, it's my girlfriend. She just sent me this photo. But when Johnny notices that it's Samantha, he says, whoa, is that Daniel LaRusso's daughter? And Miguel's a little surprised that Johnny even knows who she is. And he says, yeah. And Johnny says, let's go outside. I got to tell you something. So he tells him the whole backstory of his beef with Daniel LaRusso, how it started when him and his buddies went to the movies and there was these girls in front of them and they started throwing popcorn at him because it's an alpha move. But one of them stood up and stood up to the bullies and she ended up being Allie and Johnny was obsessed. He persisted and they started going out. But the summer before his senior year, they got in a fight and Johnny thought that they would work it out. But then he noticed that Daniel LaRusso, the new kid in town, was hitting on her. So he went down to the beach to have a civil conversation with her, but Daniel kept butting in. So Johnny told him to get lost. Daniel then sucker punched Johnny. Johnny and Johnny beat the crap out of him thinking that it was done a few months later though at the school dance he soaked him with a bunch of water so Johnny and his buddies hunted him down but little did they know Daniel had his own little karate master who kicked the crap out of him and his friends so they decided to sell their beef at the all valley tournament where Daniel won but the big loss for Johnny was the fact that he lost Allie in the process the whole reason he's telling him this is to tell him that the LaRussas cannot be trusted 
That night, Johnny and Miguel head home, and they run into Miguel's mom, who invites Johnny over for dinner. And since Johnny had no real dinner plans, he says okay. And at the table, Miguel's mom and his grandmother are asking Johnny about where he's from, getting kind of his backstory when Miguel gets a phone call from Samantha, and his mom excuses him so he can take it. And Samantha's a little on edge because of all the fighting that's going on in her family at the moment. But they're trying to make plans to go see a movie that weekend, although Miguel tells her, Sunday's not going to work, I have training all day. And she goes, really? Training all day? She then says to him, you know, there's a lot of dojos in the valley. I was thinking maybe you could try training at another one. And this is coming out of left field for Miguel. He doesn't understand why she's saying it. The reason why she's saying it is because earlier in the day, she had her dad, her grandmother, and her cousin for some reason telling her what bad people Cobra Kai are. Even though it's been years since Daniel squared off with these folks, Daniel doesn't think anything has changed. If you're part of Cobra Kai, you're bad news, and he instructs Samantha not to hang out with anyone from there, even though she knows plenty of good people that train there. But Miguel doesn't know any of this and says, no, I'd never turn my back on Sensei Lawrence. Their conversation, though, gets interrupted when Daniel asks for help because his mom and his wife are currently fighting, but then he sees that she's on the computer and says, who are you talking to? And instead of saying my boyfriend, she says, oh, it's nobody, just my lab partner. And that's kind of insulting to Miguel because they are dating. But over in the other room, dinner is continuing, and you find out Miguel's family's backstory. They're from Ecuador, and Miguel's mom got married at 18 and pregnant at an early age, but then she found out what her ex-husband did for a living, and she tells Johnny, let's just say he was a bad guy and I needed to get away. Johnny apologizes, but Miguel's mom says, don't apologize. You can't let the mistakes of the past determine your future. And that really resonates with Johnny. And when dinner's over, he heads to his apartment and decides to clean up his act. But first, he decides to clean up his actual apartment because it's a mess. The next day, he heads to Sid's place. And Sid thinks that he's there for another handout. But in fact, Johnny's there to give him back his money. Sid says, you'll be back for this next week. But Johnny says, no, I won't, Sid. Turns around and walks out. And man, does it feel good to be able to cut Sid out of his life. But he still needs to figure out a way to make amends with Robbie. And Robbie shows up for training at the LaRussas, but he ends up seeing Sam for the first time. And he is mesmerized because he's a guy with two eyeballs and she's gorgeous. Kind of fumbling over his words a little bit. But she thanks him for scratching the karate itch of her dad because if he didn't do it, she was going to have to. She tells him, enjoy the tree. And he doesn't know what the hell she's talking about. And Daniel says, you'll find out. Him and Daniel then head off to a really secluded, serene spot in the woods with a lake. And they start going through training because this is the perfect place for Robbie to focus. And one of the lessons is to do a bunch of kicks on a tree that's fallen over without falling off the tree. And Daniel tells Robbie, okay, after you've mastered these kicks and you don't fall down, come find me. And it takes a little bit, but Robbie's able to do it. And when he finds Daniel, Daniel is doing a one-armed handstand. But Robbie distracts him and Daniel falls over. And Daniel tells Robbie that that was the last thing that Mr. Miyagi taught him. It was this special kick that freed up two legs and... Daniel's never actually been able to pull it off. The fact that he actually got this close today is a big deal for him. But the next test is finding the car because they need to get back home. And when they get home, to Daniel's shock, his mom and his wife are getting along great because whatever Sam did at the mall worked. And Daniel invites Robbie over for dinner that night and Robbie had no plan, so he stays. But unbeknownst to everybody, Miguel had planned to come over that day because he'd gone to the movies with Eli and Aisha, but he couldn't focus on the movie because of all the weird things that are going on with Sam. He knows that Daniel hates Cobra Kai and feels like if Daniel hates Cobra Kai, then ipso facto, Daniel would hate Miguel. And he knows that Sam is keeping a secret because he hasn't been invited over yet. But Aisha reassures him, I've known Mr. LaRusso my entire life. He's a great guy. Just talk to him. And Eli tells him, dude, just grow a set. Head over there. And it's worth mentioning that Eli, unaware of the backstory of Johnny, is throwing popcorn at the movie theaters. Really on-brand move for Cobra Kai. But through the peer pressure, Miguel heads over there, and he practices this whole script that he's going to say to Daniel, but when he peers around back, he sees the entire family eating dinner. And more importantly, he sees Robbie being really friendly with Sam. And since he has no context of what's going on, he feels like Sam has been hiding him from her family because he is the other guy. And that night, his sensei, Johnny, had sat down to write Robbie a letter. He tried to call, but Robbie wasn't picking up the phone, and he doesn't do email or text, so he's going at old school. And he's writing this heartfelt letter about how he needs to change his life and how he realizes he made some mistakes when he hears glass shatter outside. And when he goes outside, he finds Louie and two bikers bashing up Johnny's Pontiac. When he asks them, what the hell are you doing? Louie says this is a message from Daniel LaRussa and continues to bash his car. But Johnny busts out some karate on the bikers and takes them all out. 
And then he focuses his attention on Louis, who says, whoa, man, we can work this out. But Johnny wants to know where Daniel lives. Louis tells him this had nothing to do with Daniel. This was all me. All that stuff I said, they were lies. But behind him, one of the bikers that got beat up says, hey, man, burn in hell. And he throws a lighter into Johnny's car, which has been doused with gasoline, and the car goes up in flames. And that infuriates Johnny. He once again jacks up Louis saying, where does Daniel LaRusso live? And Louis gives up his address. Johnny hops on one of the motorcycles and heads off. In episode 9, Johnny shows up at Daniel's house the next day and wants to know what the hell his problem is. But Daniel's wondering why the hell he's at his house. Because Daniel has no idea what the hell he's talking about with the whole car burning situation. Although he quickly realizes, oh my god, bikers, burning car, it must have been Louie. And the reality is the whole thing is a big misunderstanding, but it doesn't stop two meatheads from squaring off. Luckily, though, Amanda steps in and says, How about instead of fighting, you guys just settle this out over breakfast? And they do that as they argue a little bit about whose fault it is. And Daniel brings up, why would I even burn that car? I fixed that car. And Johnny brings up the fact that he had to fix the car because it was his daughter who crashed into it in a hit and run. But this is the first time the LaRussos are hearing about a hit and run with her daughter. Johnny says, well, why don't you just ask her about it? This powwow isn't really getting any better. And Amanda pulls Daniel aside and says, you're going to have to give him a car. Daniel doesn't want to do that, but she convinces him to just go to the used lot and just give him a car. Doesn't have to be a perfect one, just a car. So he picks out one, and it's a beautiful charger. But just to tweet Daniel, he wants to test drive it, making sure that he's not selling him a lemon. And unfortunately for Daniel, it's Robbie's day off. Louie's been fired for what he did, and Anish is out. So Daniel is going to have to take this guy on for a test drive. And they slowly start to bond a little bit over Ario Speedwagon. But Daniel has him pull over to the apartment complex that Daniel moved into when him and his mom first moved to California. And they start having a conversation about how both of their moms wanted to do what was best for them. Johnny then says, hey, there's a bar around the corner. Let's go grab a drink. And they bond even more over the fact that both of their karate instructors were really their father figures. They're slowly starting to realize they're not so different. Johnny ends up bringing up Allie and wondering what she's up to, and even though Daniel says he hasn't heard from her in years, he starts filling them in, and Johnny can't figure out how he knows all this, and Daniel says, uh, Facebook. But Johnny has never heard of Facebook. They then see pictures of Allie's new husband, and they just start ripping into the guy. So they're actually getting along pretty well. Now that day, Miguel is in an SAT prep course, but he cannot focus because of what he saw with Samantha and Robbie. And when he gets out of the prep course, Sam can tell that something's up with him. He brings up the fact that I haven't been invited over to your house yet. And she says, well, I haven't been invited over to yours. And he says, well, there's an open invitation. I want to meet your parents. They sort of make plans to do something that day, but they end up going their separate ways. And he goes to meet up with Aisha, Dimitri, and Eli in the park. And he's saying how he saw what he saw. He's convinced that she's cheating on him. But Dimitri's trying to talk him down, saying that she has never given you any reason to not trust her. I mean, all you saw was a guy at a family dinner. But Miguel's big fear is that what happened to Johnny is going to happen to him. Now, Aisha's been on her phone this entire conversation, and she's scrolling through Instagram when she sees a comment from Yasmin on one of her videos making fun of her weight, and she wants to get revenge immediately. And luckily for her, Yasmin is planning on holding a VIP-only party at a local beach. So the group comes up with the idea of crashing the party before it even starts, crowding the beach with a bunch of Cobra Kai people, and ruining Yasmin's birthday. The group heads to the local mini-mart to stock up for this party, but all Miguel can focus on is getting in touch with Sam because she's not answering his texts or his calls. And that's because when she got home that day, her mom confronted her about the hit and run and found out that what Johnny said was true, so she grounded her, taking away her cell phone, her computer, her smartwatch, anything that she could get in contact with the outside world, it's gone. But Miguel doesn't know any of this, and he's upset. The group, though, then heads to the beach, and when Kyler, Yasmin, and Moon show up, they can't believe what they're seeing. And Yasmin tells Kyler, go get these nerds off the beach, but when Kyler sees that it's Miguel and his group, he says, ah, let's go find another spot. Moon, however, has noticed Eli and his mohawk, and she is digging it. So she tells Yasmin, ah, I'm staying. I mean, they have free beer. And throughout the night, Eli and Moon end up hooking up, and Dimitri can't believe that this is actually working. So he tries to shoot his shot with Yasmin, but fails miserably. Now, over with Robbie, he headed to the LaRussos that day for training, but he gets told that Daniel is out because he's driving around Johnny. But when he finds out what's going on with Sam and how she's kind of under house arrest, he devises a plan to break her out, faking an ankle injury so that she would have to drive him home. And she's really grateful, and he says, all right, where are we going? And she says, a party. I'm sure my boyfriend is wondering where the hell I am right now. And this is the first time that he's heard that she has a boyfriend. So they fasten the furious their asses over to the beach. One person that got sick of being at that party, though, is Yasmin. She walks over to Aisha and confronts her and calls her a bitch for breaking up her party. She then looks at Moon and says, we're getting out of here. But Moon says, no, we're not. I apologize to Aisha, and I think you should too. I'm not leaving. But instead of apologizing, Yasmin walks through Aisha, bumping her, 
And that's the final straw for Aisha. She calls Yasmin's name, and when she turns around, she gives her a front wedgie and embarrasses her in front of everybody there, sending a clear message to Yasmin to not fuck with her anymore. Now, unfortunately for Sam, she missed all this go down, even though she drove really fast to get there. And she drove really fast because she wants to see Miguel. And Robbie says, what's the big deal? I mean, you're a little bit late. She explains how their relationship has been a little bit awkward and she can sense that something is off because she hasn't told her dad about Miguel. And the whole reason is he's Cobra Kai. And she feels like Miguel knows that she's hiding him from her dad. And Robbie can commiserate. He's well aware of what it's like to hold this secret. But when they head down to the beach, Miguel is blitzed. I mean, he's been drinking all day. And when he sees Robbie heading down with his girlfriend, he gets really pissed off, demanding to know why she wasn't answering any of his calls all day. And she tries to explain how her phone got taken from her, but... He's not really listening to her, really focusing more of his anger on Robbie. He ends up pushing Robbie, and Robbie tells him, dude, try that one more time. But Miguel takes a swing at Robbie, and instead of hitting Robbie, he accidentally hits Sam. Sam is in shock and can't believe what just happened and looks at him and says, you know what, my dad was right about you. All you Cobra Kai people are bad news. And then Robbie and Sam head off. When Robbie gets back to the LaRussos, he's waiting in the dojo for Daniel to show up because he feels like this is a good time to tell Daniel that he's Johnny's son. But when Daniel shows up home, he shows up with Johnny. They're talking about how they're going to do one last fight like in Rocky 3. But when Johnny sees Robbie and Robbie sees Johnny, it gets really awkward. Daniel, having no idea about this, says, hey, Johnny, I have a little protege of my own. But Johnny gets enraged and ends up pushing Daniel. Robbie gets in between the two saying, dad, if you're going to fight him, you're going to fight me first. And that's when it clicks for Daniel that Robbie is Johnny's son. Johnny is hurt and just walks away. And Daniel's hurt. Asking Robbie, was this all a ruse? Were you playing me? Get out of here. Don't come around the dealership. Don't come around my house. Just leave. In the season finale, today is the day of the All-Valley Tournament. All the Cobra Kai members are waiting outside to go in for Johnny, but Bert tells him that Johnny might not show up. He says the previous night he went to the Mini Mart and saw Johnny outside, drunk off his ass, pissing on his new car. And this is cause for concern for everybody because it's the first they're hearing of it. But Johnny does show up, saying he's never going to back down from a fight. He gets everybody together and says, I've taught you guys a lot of things, but the last thing that I need to teach you is no mercy. They then go to get dressed as the crowd files into the tournament, but there are a few people who aren't there, and those are the LaRussos. Daniel doesn't want to go to see Johnny, and Sam doesn't want to go to see Miguel. But Amanda reminds both of them, we are the primary sponsor of this tournament. Somebody has to go. So reluctantly, all of the LaRussos head to the tournament. And they show up, they get front row seats. Miguel and his grandmother, they're also in the stands. His grandmother is baked out of her mind, good for her. And they start introducing all the teams in the tournament. But the last person they introduce in the tournament is Robbie who was unaffiliated. And Daniel had no idea that he was even entering this thing. And neither did Johnny. So it's a surprise for everybody there. Now everybody from Cobra Kai wins their opening round except Bert. In round two, Eli and Miguel win their rounds, but Aisha is defeated by last year's champion, and she is pissed off. She's really mad at herself, and Sam, seeing this, runs after her, trying to comfort her. But Aisha says, I don't need your pity right now. Because Aisha is still pissed off at her. Sam apologizes, saying that she never should have hung out with those girls, and she never should have hurt her oldest friend. She does tell her that that front wedgie was pretty cool, and Yasmin isn't going to mess with her. And Aisha can't believe that Sam saw it because she wasn't there, but Sam says, says, yeah, it's all over social media. She then compliments Aisha's gi, saying it's pretty cool, and Aisha says, well, I can get you one if you want to join Cobra Kai. We need another girl. But Sam says, no, I'm not going to do that. My dad would literally kill me. The conversation makes both of them feel way better. Now back to the tournament, Miguel is now faced up against the former champion, and Miguel beats him. Eli is faced up against Robbie, and Eli gets the first point, but when he doesn't get the second, he gets pissed off, and as Robbie turns his back, getting ready to square up, Eli kicks him, getting disqualified, letting Robbie advance, but also, in the process, injuring Robbie's shoulder. And Johnny is pissed off at Eli, wondering what the hell Eli was thinking, because it was a dirty move. But Eli's trying this whole bad boy look. And when it happened, Johnny ran over to check on Robbie, but the judges told him to get over to his side because the only people that know that Robbie is Johnny's son are Robbie, Johnny, and Daniel. And after the way Aisha acted when she lost and now Eli acting when he loses a point, it's really strengthening the stereotype that Cobra Kai had coming into this tournament. Not a good look. But Robbie now needs to get ready for the finals. He's going to be facing Miguel. Problem is his shoulder is really messed up. So Daniel goes to get a medic and they tell him that his shoulder is dislocated. They pop him back into place, but he's going to be in pain for a couple weeks. Daniel tells him you don't need to go fight, but Robbie's going to fight. He then has a conversation about letting go, the anger towards Johnny, because in the end of the day, Johnny is his father. 
And if he lets that anger go, he's going to feel way better about himself. He tries to tell Robbie that Johnny learned from the worst sensei ever, a guy that taught them the wrong way to do things, really trying to humanize Johnny to his son. Now, outside of the locker room, Miguel sees Sam walking back from talking to Aisha and tries to apologize to her the previous night, but he doesn't really apologize. Trying to really plead his case, like, what did you want me to do when I saw you with another guy? But she tells him, I expect you not to fight the guy. I mean, I don't even know who you are anymore. And that really enrages Miguel, who tells her, you just wait to see what I do to Robbie. But she's not going to wait, asking her mom if she can leave, and the LaRussos pack up. But one LaRusso that doesn't leave is Daniel, because he's decided to coach Robbie. So Robbie is no longer unaffiliated, now fighting under Miyagi-Do Karate's banner. It's tied at one when Miguel notices that Robbie is favoring his shoulder. Even with the injury, Robbie gets the second point, pulling off that one-arm handstand that Daniel had talked about. But when Robbie goes over to help Miguel up, Miguel yanks on his shoulder, injuring it worse. Johnny pulls him aside and says, we don't have to win dirty, but Miguel tells him, if it's winning, it's not dirty. I mean, you taught me that. And at that moment, he's realizing that he really did teach these kids the wrong message. The whole winning at all costs and no mercy has created a bad, toxic culture. Miguel ends up winning the tournament, but as Miguel and the rest of Cobra Kai are celebrating, Johnny feels kind of dirty and feels like he should go apologize to Robbie, so he chases after him. Robbie tells him, it's okay, Dad, and then walks off. But Daniel says, well, you got what you wanted, Johnny. You won. But Johnny didn't get what he wanted. And neither did Miguel. After the tournament, he's looking for Sam all over the place, but Dimitri tells him, she left a while ago. And she actually went home and started walking around the dojo at her house and started training a little bit, trying to get out that pent-up frustration. Daniel was going to give Robbie a ride home, but instead of giving him a ride home, he took him to Mr. Miyagi's old place, telling him that they're going to have to clean it up, but welcoming him to Miyagi-Do Karate. Daniel feels like he can't let Cobra Kai control karate in the valley. All they need is more students. Johnny, though, went back to the dojo, staring at a first-place trophy but really drinking his sorrows away when he hears the door open, and he thinks it's Miguel, but it's not. To his utter surprise... It's Kreese, alive and in the flesh. Kreese is talking about how the entire area gave up on Cobra Kai. But Johnny just did what he always knew he could, become a winner. He tells Johnny they thought we were done, but now they'll see that the real story is just beginning. Episode 1 of Season 2 kicks off right where Season 1 left off, with Johnny and Kreese in the dojo. Johnny thought Kreese was dead, and Kreese says, yeah, a lot of people did. But Kreese starts to take credit for Miguel winning the championship, telling Johnny, you taught him well, but you taught him well because you learned from me. And that really upsets Johnny to the point where he takes a swing at Kreese, but Kreese ends up putting him on the mat. And Kreese looks down at him saying, I taught you everything you know. But Johnny says, yeah, you didn't teach me everything, and kicks him in the face, knocking his cigar out of his hand and into the trash can. The two end up getting into a really stupid fight with nobody winning, and it eventually ends when the sprinklers from the dojo go on because that trash can lit on fire. After this stupid fight, Johnny goes home and starts to ice his hand when he gets a knock at the door, and it's Miguel's mom who has made him trace leches to thank him for mentoring her son. Although she does say she is worried about the look that Miguel had in his eyes during a fight, but she chalks it up to his, quote, game face. Johnny reassures her that Miguel's a really good kid and he's not going to allow him to go astray. But then his house phone rings and it's Kreese on the other line, telling him to meet him at a diner the next day. Now, while Johnny and Miguel's mom have their first date, Miguel is out celebrating his victory with Cobra Kai. And Sam, who is at home, sees Aisha's video about them celebrating their victory on Instagram and decides to scroll through Miguel's Instagram looking at the good times that they had, but then ultimately deciding to block him. At the restaurant, though, the table consists of Eli, Moon, Aisha, and Dimitri. And Dimitri makes mention of the championship that they won at Robot Camp, doing an impression of a robot talking to Eli, but Eli is not into that at all, telling him to cut the nerd shit, even though everyone at the table found it funny. One person noticeably absent from this table is Miguel, whose food is getting cold, And that's because Miguel is sitting in a corner by himself, looking for Sam on Instagram and realizing, holy shit, I've been blocked. Eli and Aisha come over to make him feel better about it, mainly Aisha, because Eli gives him terrible advice. But Aisha tells him, don't worry, give her time, she'll come around. Although Miguel feels like he's run out of time and that he's blown his only shot with her. Now the next day, Johnny heads to that diner to meet up with Kreese, and Kreese starts telling him the backstory about where he's been. He's been off-grade training SEALs, training soldiers, training everybody, but he's come back to lend a helping hand to Cobra Kai because he feels like the kids nowadays are just soft. Johnny tells him that while the world needs Cobra Kai, Cobra Kai does not need Kreese, and walks off. 
He then heads off to training that day where a bunch of new kids have arrived after hearing about the championship wanting to sign up. And Eli has already started to kind of bully him a little bit. But when Johnny shows up, he tells the kids to go away. They're not accepting new students today. Although, come back tomorrow, bring your checkbook. Because he wants to ream out his kids. He has Eli and Miguel up front and starts asking them, Did you kick your opponent when he was turned away? Did you attack your opponent's weakness? That's a pussy move. He then poses a question to Aisha. You have two cobras in a jungle. One attacks an injured animal, another attacks a tiger. Which one do you want to be? And she obviously says, I want to be the cobra that attacked the tiger because it's a stronger animal. He hammers the point home that they didn't win right. And he tells him no more cheating, no more fighting dirty. From here on out, those are pussy moves and you don't want to be a pussy. He makes Miguel and Eli give him 50 push-ups while Aisha breaks the class down. But Miguel is upset and he goes to talk to Johnny about it because he feels like he's being punished for winning the tournament. And it was Johnny who taught them no mercy. It was Johnny who taught them to win at all costs. And what Miguel really can't understand is the fact that Johnny had no problem with them attacking anybody else. So why is he taking pity on Robbie? Johnny doesn't tell him that Robbie is his son, but instead telling him that he was never taught the difference between mercy and honor. And because of it, he paid the price. And if it seems like that he's extra hard on Miguel, it's only because Miguel is the best and he has the potential to be better than Johnny ever was. After training that day, though, everyone heads out and to Aisha's surprise, Sam is waiting for her. Sam wants to know if she wants to hang out, but Aisha says, I wish I could, but I can't. We're all getting together and watching this movie called Over the Top. She then sees if Sam wants to come with him, but Sam sees Miguel and says, I'll take a rain check. Even though Aisha implores her to go, saying that they really should work their differences out. Now, Sam's dad and Robbie have been hard at work getting Miyagi-Do up to par. Fresh coat of paint, getting new boards... The whole nine. Although his wife is concerned that he's not doing this for the right reasons. And he basically admits as much saying, I can't let Cobra Kai win. Someone has to do something about those bullies. And they still have some stuff they need to do, so they head to the local hardware store where, ironically, Johnny has also headed there. Because Johnny needs to replace mirror glass that was broken during the stupid fight with Kreese. But he overhears Daniel along with Robbie, and he's watching their relationship from afar. But Johnny ends up getting caught when the guy at the hardware store says, Yo, Metallica guy. Somehow that's a dead giveaway that it's Johnny. And he sheepishly comes out from behind the one aisle and gives kind of a nod to Daniel and Robbie. Although it doesn't seem like anyone's real thrilled to see the other. It gets real awkward when the hardware store guy recognizes Daniel from his car commercials and says that Robbie looks just like Daniel. Johnny then tells him to go take his stuff into the loading dock, and Daniel, sensing that Johnny wants to talk to Robbie, takes his stuff up to the counter to pay for it and leaves the two alone. Johnny asks how Robbie's shoulder's doing, but Robbie is pissed off because he feels like Johnny told Miguel to go after his shoulder even though he didn't. He tells Johnny, I know I'm supposed to forgive you and all, but right now it's a little tough. And Johnny says, so you're just going to go and train with that douchebag? But Robbie gets really pissed off, saying, you don't even know Mr. LaRussa. He's way better of a guy than you'll ever be. And he walks off. And when he gets to the car, Daniel asks how it went, and he says, same as always. He's more concerned with his rivalry with you than he is with me. When Daniel gets home to his surprise, he finds Sam in the dojo. He starts critiquing what she was doing, but then admits that he's had so much time building the dojo that he hasn't had enough time to talk to her about what happened with Miguel although she has no interest in talking to her dad about her boyfriend. But whether she likes it or not, she's going to have that awkward conversation. And Daniel tells her about his first girlfriend and about how he thought she was the one. And then his second girlfriend and his third and his fourth. And the whole message is sometimes you're obsessed with somebody, but life goes on and you find somebody else. The conversation, though, then turns to why he's opening up Miyagi-Do, saying that he's going to fight back against Cobra Kai take him down. But Sam tells him, I don't want to fight them. They're not my enemy. In fact, most of them I'm friends with. At least they used to be. She then thanks him for trying to help and then she walks out. And that comment was a lot of food for thought for Daniel. And he needs to refocus, heading into the dojo and practicing a meditation ritual that Mr. Miyagi taught him. And Robbie catches him in that meditation ritual and asks what he was doing and he fills him in, saying he needed to refocus because he realized he'd been doing things all wrong. Ever since the tournament, he had been focused on taking down Cobra Kai, when in reality, they're not his enemy. No one is. They just learn how to do things the wrong way. So it's up to him to teach them a different way, a better way. And that's when Sam asks them, do you have room for one more? Because she has agreed to join Miyagi-Do. Now, Johnny is also in his dojo, but he's working hard to fix it from the damage that was done when the sprinklers went off from that stupid fight when Kreese walks in. And Kreese isn't here to fight. He's actually here to make amends, apologizing to Johnny. 
He tells him that he realized that he was too hard on him. He went overboard. Johnny was his best student and he had so much potential. And Kreese just couldn't stand seeing him lose. He tells him for years he had regretted the night that he choked out Johnny for winning second place. And when Kreese heard that Johnny was bringing back Cobra Kai, he thought maybe it could be an opportunity for Kreese to redeem himself. He then pulls out a massive trophy from the bag that he was holding and it's Johnny's second place trophy. He tells him he fixed it and he leaves it. He then tells him that it might say second place, but in his opinion... Johnny was always the better fighter, and then he walks out. But he doesn't get too far in the parking lot before Johnny comes out and says, Hey, wait a minute. In episode two, Robbie is awoken in the middle of the night by some random guy sneaking into his house. So he does what any normal person would do. He attacks the guy. But then his mom flips on the switch and can't believe that Robbie attacked him. But she hasn't been home in like two weeks. So he thought somebody was breaking in. She tells him that this is her new boyfriend and he's taking her to Cabo. And don't worry about the bills, he's going to take care of that. She'll be gone for about a week, week and a half tops, but Robbie has the whole place to himself. And she acts like this is a positive, but it's not exactly what Robbie wants. Before they leave though, Robbie does tell the guy, if you hurt her, I'm going to hurt you. And the guy takes it as an empty threat, he's not really scared of Robbie. He then heads off to Miyagi-Do for training, where Sam has also arrived that day. And as she's walking in, she gets a phone call from who she thinks is Aisha, because the phone says Aisha, but in reality, it's Miguel using Aisha's phone because Sam wasn't getting back to him. And it was desperate times call for desperate measure situation and he just wants to apologize and wants things to go back the way they were but she gets pissed off with the fact that he used aisha's phone and when she walks in and sees robbie she says i can't talk right now i gotta go daniel walks in and starts going through the first lesson he draws a circle in the sand and has them stand in it and they're going to practice this defense choreography that's really nothing more than a dance although he swears that if they master it they will be able to protect themselves the problem is, in order to do it correctly, they have to be in sync, and it's hard to be in sync when you can't see your partner. They both are getting frustrated, and they also feel like this is just stupid. It's a waste of time. And while Daniel's trying to convince him that it's not, he gets a text message from Amanda saying there's a work emergency, head to the dealership ASAP. So he tells him to keep practicing and heads on over, and the work emergency is the fact that two of their sales associates were poached by Tom Cole. And they had to sell 10 cars in order to meet their quota by the end of the week. And Daniel's frustrated because he just opened up Miyagi-Do. He doesn't want to abandon the kids for a week while he tries to sell 10 cars. So he vows to sell them that day. And him and Amanda team up and they go to work on these customers. Schmoozing all of them and selling all 10 cars. And at the end of the day, Amanda and Daniel toast and celebrate the fact that they just made quota in a day. She tells Daniel, I forgot how good of a salesman you really were. And Daniel says, well... I wish I was that good of a sensei. Because Mr. Miyagi was such a good teacher and Daniel doesn't feel like he has those same tricks. But Amanda reminds him that Miyagi-Do has been open for one day. And if Mr. Miyagi had his tricks, then just come up with your own. You don't have to be Mr. Miyagi, you just have to be Daniel. And that's when, while he's looking in the service center, he sees a tire spinning around and he has an epiphany. Now, over with Cobra Kai, after he got off the phone with Sam, Daniel had to start getting ready for class that day, where Bert, Aisha, and Eli were all razzing the new kids. But right before class, Kreese walks in. And Johnny is a little surprised to see Kreese because he told him to come the next day, but Kreese is going to come on Kreese's time. So Johnny gets everybody in line and tells him this is Mr. Kreese, he'll be observing today. He then has Daniel break them down, and Daniel's doing a good job until the last thing he does is in a playful manner. And all the kids are laughing, and Johnny feels insecure, like he doesn't have order of the dojo in front of Kreese. Johnny kind of yells at Miguel for joking around, but Aisha takes it one step further, making a Cobra Kai joke that, in Johnny's opinion, makes him look really bad in front of Kreese. So he tells him that class is canceled for that day, and they need to show up tomorrow at 5 a.m. If they don't, they're off the team. And the next day when the kids show up, they're all mixing cement, having really no idea what Johnny has in store for them. But Johnny has ordered a cement truck, and when it arrives, he starts to tell them that they've gotten complacent. They won one tournament, and all of a sudden, they think they're the bee's knees, but they're not. And just like the cement in that truck, if the truck stops, the cement gets hardened. And right now, they are the cement. They need to make the truck move in order to keep the cement flowing. So he tells them all to get in the cement truck, actually get inside of it and make it spin. But the kids are really hesitant to do that. They start apologizing to Johnny, telling him that they learned their lesson and then start complaining about the safety aspect of this whole thing when Kreese jumps in saying, this man led you to the mountaintop, and now you're questioning him? I mean, look at you guys. I can't believe this pathetic group actually won the All-Valley Tournament. I mean, that right there is a minor miracle. And who's responsible for that miracle? Johnny Lawrence, the best student in the history of Cobra Kai. My student. And that's when Eli says, whoa, you were Sensei Sensei? And Chris says, damn right I was. And I've never trained a tougher student in my entire life. And if you know what's good for you, you listen to every single thing Johnny Lawrence has to say. And slowly, some of the kids start getting in the cement truck. And it takes a little bit, but they do end up moving it. 
And that's a slight minor miracle because Johnny had no idea if this was going to work. But afterwards, he's hosing the kids down and telling them that he's proud of them. And he knows that their parents would be proud of them if they knew what they did here today. But he tells the kids not to tell their parents. The final message he gives them is if they just keep pushing forward, they can go to new heights that they never even dreamed of. Now, the experimental training method that Daniel has come up with has to do with the floating wood in the pond. But Robbie's had a rough morning because the previous night, as he was looking for food in his house, the power went out because the bill wasn't paid. So he's in a mood when he arrives at Miyagi-Do, and when Sam asks him a simple question on the choreography, he kind of gives her a lot of attitude. They then walk out and see Daniel taking the bonsai off of the wood, and he tells them to get on it. Because on the ground, they can't sense what their partner's doing. But if they're bouncing in the water, it's going to help them sense what the other's doing. And at first, they fall in the water quite a bit. But eventually, they do end up getting it. After the training session, Robbie apologizes to Sam for how he acted in the morning, telling her, I'm just going through a lot at home. My mom left with some guy. The power's out, but hey, I'll see you tomorrow. And then he leaves. But Sam ends up going to Daniel, telling him about Robbie's home situation. And when Daniel finds out about this, he goes and picks Robbie up and brings him back to the LaRussos. He's talking to Amanda about keeping Robbie there. And Amanda's fine with him staying a few days, but she tells Daniel if he's going to stay there longer than that, we have to talk to his parents. And Daniel's tried to get in touch with Robbie's mom, but Amanda says he does have a father. So Daniel heads over to talk to Johnny at the dojo, and Johnny is doing paperwork as Kreese tells him that what he did today took balls, putting his students in danger like that. It worked, and it takes guts. Johnny then thanks him for giving the kids a sort of kick in the ass to get into that cement truck. And then Kreese asks Johnny if he wants to go get a beer, and Johnny can run him through the next day's lessons. And Johnny says, so you're coming tomorrow? And Chris says, well, if it's okay. And Johnny doesn't put up a fight against his former sensei. The two do go to that mini mart and grab a beer while insulting the mini mart attendant. But when they come out, there's Daniel LaRusso, shocked. Because he, just like Johnny, thought Kreese was dead. He asked Johnny, was this all a part of your little plan? But Johnny says, I don't know what you're talking about, man. And Daniel starts to walk away, saying, you know what? I've seen plenty. But Kreese steps in, saying, well, if you want to see more, this guy right here, is going to take Cobra Kai to new heights. And he puts his hand on Johnny's shoulder, but Johnny kind of shrugs it away, walking up to Daniel and asking, what do you want? But Daniel just says, I got my answer. And I'm going to tell you guys right now, you're in for a rude awakening. Now, back at Johnny's house, Johnny wasn't there. So when Miguel went to drop off food that his mom made for Johnny, he had to use the spare key to let himself in. He puts the food in the refrigerator, but when he looks up, he sees a picture of a boy from 2010 playing soccer. And somehow... Miguel knows that this is Robbie Keane, even though the photo doesn't say Robbie Keane anywhere on it. Anyway, now he's wondering why his coach has a random picture of Robbie Keane from 10 years ago. At the behest of his students, Johnny has bought a computer in episode 3, and he is not very tech savvy. It takes him a while just to figure out how to turn the thing on. But after connecting to Wi-Fi, he realizes the power of the internet. He does what every guy does. Starts looking up porn. And then he does the second thing every guy does. Goes to YouTube and starts looking up videos. And he stumbles across a karate video, but right before it plays... An advertisement plays for Miyagi-Do Karate, and it really pisses off Johnny. And he's not the only person. This ad is kind of the talk of the area. A man is giving the cold shoulder to Daniel because Daniel spent a large portion of their advertising money on this commercial. And while he's apologetic, his thing is we have Valley Fest coming up, and that drives a lot of traffic to the dealership. And yes, you're right. I should have consulted you, and I'll do it next time. But with Crease back in town, I have to step my game up. I mean, this is a guy who faked his death twice. I can't let this guy sink his claws into the valley. But then Daniel gets welcomed into 2020 because Anish comes in and tells him that he loves the advertising, but he doesn't think that it's whitewashing. Since it's 2020 and people need to get offended about everything on the internet, Daniel, dressed in a gi with Asian music in the background, has been dubbed as whitewashing, even though Daniel's legit. So it seems like no one's really loving this ad. After work, though, he heads to training where Robbie and Sam are already there, and Robbie thanks Sam for doing what she did getting him a nice place to stay that actually has power. But right before the lesson kicks off, the advertising apparently worked. Two new kids show up. And the advertising was for free karate. But Daniel doesn't handle this too well. When the kids show up, he says, Great, grab a bucket of paint and some paintbrushes. The fence needs to be done. And these kids think it's a scam. That this guy was promoting free karate when in reality... He just wants them to do chores around the house. Even after Robbie tells them it'll all make sense soon, don't worry about it, the kids are pretty pissed off. They have no patience, and they say, let's go check out that karate with a snake on it, i.e. Cobra Kai. 
Now, over with the Cobra Kai people, Eli, Miguel, and Dimitri had headed to the beach before training. And a couple of girls came over to Dimitri because he had a Cobra Kai towel, and they asked him if he's Cobra Kai, and he went along with it saying he was. And Eli comes over and asks Dimitri, when are you just going to rejoin? But in Dimitri's opinion, this whole pretending to be Cobra Kai and not having to deal with the pain is working out pretty well. Miguel, however, needs to talk to Eli immediately about the whole Robbie situation. He tells Eli that he's pretty sure Robbie is Johnny's son, and after a deep dive on the internet, Eli can confirm, yep, they're related. But their conversation about Robbie in the dojo is interrupted when Aisha sees the advertising for Miyaki Do Karate. And while she's showing Eli and Miguel, Johnny is showing Kreese. And Kreese feels like this is a declaration of war. Daniel's giving out free karate. How is Cobra Kai supposed to compete with that? They need to respond immediately. And they do so with an advertisement of their own saying, if you want free karate, you're going to get what you pay for. Why learn karate defense when you can learn karate offense? Right after they film the advertisement, though, Eli and Miguel confront Johnny about the Robbie situation. Their feeling is that no mercy was fine when it wasn't the coach's son. And Johnny's a little taken aback, and he's a little pissed off about the fact that they're even thinking he gave preferential treatment to Robbie. So he punishes them by having them clean mats. But Kreese overheard this conversation, and now he's aware of the fact that Daniel is teaching Johnny's son. And when Johnny leaves the dojo that day, Kreese tells him, you know, you shouldn't be having Daniel LaRusso teach your kid karate. You should be the one to do that. Johnny tries to nip it in the bud, saying it's not going to happen. Kreese then says, well, it's a good thing you have that Mexican kid, and Johnny does correct him by saying he's from Ecuador. Kreese says, yeah, whatever. You better just hope to God that Daniel LaRusso doesn't snatch him from you. And it seems like Johnny hadn't even had that thought. So that night, Johnny takes Miguel to a restaurant and tells him that he never grew up with a father. And his mother was everything to him. And when his mother died, that's around the time that he found out that he was going to be a father of his own. But being a father scared the shit out of him. And the night that Robbie was born, he sat in the very restaurant that they're currently eating at, capping off a three-day bender, trying to get the courage to walk across the street and into the hospital and welcome Robbie into the world, but he never did it. He tells Miguel, I failed my son the day he showed up in this world, and I've been failing him ever since. And failing his son is one of the most painful things in his life, but one of the happiest things he currently has is training Miguel. He tells Miguel that he'll always be by his side and he'll always have his best interest in heart. Miguel, though, then gets a text message from Aisha telling him that Miyagi-Do is planning on doing a demonstration at Valley Fest. Daniel felt like this would be a great opportunity to get some eyeballs on Miyagi-Do and show everybody what it's all about. But Cobra Kai feels like they should respond, and Daniel, unfortunately, has no idea about this. So they start going through the demonstration, and everything's going pretty well. And then it gets to the big finale, where Daniel is planning on breaking the ice block, just like he did years ago with Mr. Miyagi. But right before he can do that, Cobra Kai swoops in, stealing all the shine, and putting on a badass demonstration that's capped off by Johnny breaking cinder blocks that are on fire. And Miyagi Do is left to just sit there, watch it all go down, and then walk away with their tail between their legs. After what happened at Valley Fest, Robbie and Sam are getting together to train, and Robbie says, you know what the problem with Miyagi-Do is? It's all about defense. You never see our offense. And she says, well, what do you want us to do? Go to the mall and pick a fight and record us defending ourselves? And Robbie says it's not the worst idea, but Sam thinks it's a terrible idea. Sam then goes and finds her dad working on Mr. Miyagi's old car, and her dad has realized that he needs to go for a more personalized touch to get people through the door. He then tells Sam to grab Robbie because they're going to take a drive to their beach club. Daniel has an idea to preach to the parents, not the kids. He's banking on parents doing whatever it takes to protect their kids and forcing their kids to learn karate. And this is a long shot, but Daniel's exhausted every other avenue to promote Miyagi Do, so why not try this one? But when they arrive at the country club, Robbie recognizes it because he worked there, and it did not end well. So he's a little hesitant to go in, even though he's going in as a guest. But him and Sam are going to chill by the pool while Daniel goes and tries to drum up some business with the parents. Now, over with Cobra Kai, Kreese is telling a bunch of the kids about his war stories. The issue is, he's messing up, and Miguel notices it. He gets countries completely confused. And he tries to play it off like, well, when you've been in the sand as long as I have, that's bound to happen. But Miguel finds the behavior odd. And training is starting a bit late because Johnny is in the back arguing with the landlord. The landlord wants to raise the rent yet again on Johnny because he has more students. But Johnny tells the guy basically to piss off. He's not going to pay the guy more rent just because he has more students. Johnny then starts class and notices that there's a few new people in the room. One of them is the guy from the hardware store that sold him the mirror glass. He asks all the new people, which one of you guys has the balls to take on the champ? And then all the way in the back, a girl named Tori raises her hand. She tells the room that she saw their demonstration at Valley Fest but wonders if they can actually fight. And Miguel is tasked with showing her. The two get into it and she's no joke. I mean, she's got serious skills. And her and Miguel continue to go back and forth with nobody really winning, but each one surprising the other. After class, Aisha runs into her at the mini-mart, 
And Aisha's stressing because her mom wants her to come to the beach club, but she doesn't want to see Sam. She's still pissed off at her. And she asked Tori if she wants to go just so it won't be as awkward. Maybe she has a friend there. Now, two guys that won't be going to the beach club are Miguel and Eli. Eli is outside FaceTiming with Dimitri, and Dimitri had heeded Eli's advice. He headed to the dojo to rejoin, although he did so with a list of demands. But he didn't give the list of demands to Johnny. He gave him to Crease. And then he started nitpicking Crease's tattoo. And that's when Crease beat the shit out of him. Now, Eli thinks that Dimitri should just suck it up because he walked into a karate dojo. That's what happens. But this is even more strange behavior from Crease that Miguel just can't ignore. So he brings it to Johnny, telling Johnny that he's a little worried about the behavior from Mr. Crease. Johnny tells him that he and Crease go way back. And the guy has his issues, but everybody deserves a second chance. But that doesn't mean that Johnny isn't going to look into it. And he overhears Crease on the phone arguing with somebody. He asks him if everything's okay, and he says that he's at the Sheraton, and he's pretty sure one of the housekeepers stole his watch. Chris then leaves, saying, I'll see you in the morning, but Johnny decides to follow him. And luckily for Johnny, his car is very inconspicuous. I mean, it's only a Dodge Charger with a yellow racing stripe that has the Cobra Kai logo all over it. And he ends up following Chris to a homeless shelter. He asks Chris if any of it was true, or was everything he said a lie. And Chris tells him, well, you knew me when I was on top. It's kind of hard to let that go. Things got pretty rough for Chris after he lost the dojo. He tried to re-enlist in the army, but he couldn't pass the psych eval. He kind of just sputtered through life until he got old. And for the last 10 years, he's been living in homeless shelters. When he heard about what Johnny did in the All Valley, he figured that might be his second chance. He's kind of giving Johnny a little bit of a sob story, and Johnny tells him, that sounds a lot like defeat, but I was taught... That defeat does not exist in this dojo. If you want a chance to redeem yourself, you've got it, but you have to do things my way. And Kreese, with no other real option, accepts the offer. Now, back over with the beach club, Daniel is schmoozing the parents, and he's doing a really good job of it, describing why they really should get their kids interested in karate, specifically Miyagi-Do. But then Aisha's mom shows up, and she tells the table how much karate has done for Aisha, giving her confidence. And they ask Daniel, is Aisha one of your students? And her mom cuts in and says, no, she goes to Cobra Kai. And basically gives Cobra Kai a two-minute commercial that has all of the parents enamored with it. I mean, there's no real shot for Daniel to redeem this one. It seems like if these people are going to get their kids involved in karate, it's going to be at the Cobra Kai Dojo and not Miyagi-Do. So Daniel seemingly just takes the L and decides to walk on the beach. His daughter, meanwhile, is getting some sun when she notices Aisha show up with Tori. And she's still pissed at Aisha for ruining their performance, but Robbie convinces her to go talk to her makeup. And they talk it out with Aisha not being cool with the fact that, in her opinion, Daniel made a commercial going at Cobra Kai, and I just laid out the problems that Sam had with Aisha, but they realize it's pretty stupid to spend the entire summer fighting about karate. Aisha then says, man, it must really suck to sit there the entire summer training with abs, aka Robbie, but Sam reassures her, we're just friends. And Aisha says, either way, I'm not going to tell Miguel. And as Sam and Aisha continue to chat, when Tori then shows up with a bottle of vodka that she poached from the bar, Sam tells her, you know, you really should put that back, you're going to get in trouble. And then Aisha awkwardly introduces the two. So after exchanging somewhat pleasantries, Tori tells her, no one's going to miss a bottle of vodka. I could probably swipe half the silverware in this place and no one would notice. But Sam tells her, you know, you really shouldn't steal anything. And Tori says, what are you, a nun? She then tells Aisha, come on, let's go. Let's have a drink. Let's have some fun. And the two head off. Now, while this is going on, Robbie gets approached by the manager of the beach club, telling him, you know what I told you. If you ever come here again, I'm going to call the police. And he tries to call security to get him kicked out, but Amanda shows up and says, what's going on here? The manager tells her, we're going to get this delinquent out of here, but she tells the manager, he's our guest, he's staying. Amanda then asks Robbie, though, what was all that about? And he does say, before I met you guys, I was a different person. I worked here, and me and my friends got into some trouble. We didn't hurt anybody, but what the manager said is correct. I probably should get going. Amanda reassures him, though, that everybody deserves a second chance. It's what we do next that counts. So Robbie's staying put at that beach club. But right as the family's about to leave, Amanda notices that she doesn't have her wallet with her. And Sam is pretty certain she knows who took it. So she goes and hunts down Tori along with Aisha and says, Hey, my mom's missing her wallet. Why don't you just give it to me before I call security? And Tori is taking this as an insult. She can't believe that she's being approached after telling her, that she could steal all the silverware and the fact that she stole a bottle of vodka. I mean, it's not that far-fetched of an accusal. Tori starts to walk away, but Sam grabs her bag and Tori pushes her onto the food table with food going all over Sam. Now, Tori walks off, but Aisha does come over and say, are you okay? And Sam, who's covered in food, says, hey, real nice friend you've got. And instead of sticking up for her lifelong friend, Aisha says, well, you shouldn't have accused her and walks off. But while that mini fight was going down, Robbie thinks he has a pretty good idea of where the wallet is. 
He heads down to the beach, and sure enough, he finds that along with a bunch of other wallets. Because his old friends used to do this. You find out that stealing wallets is what got Robbie fired in the first place from that beach club. But he hears his friends coming, and he sets up a camera. He feels like this is a really good opportunity to show that defense can be great offense. He tells his friends, I found your stash, and you're going to give it all back. But they say, yeah, no, we're not. Did you not learn your lesson last time? Do you want to get your ass kicked? And Robbie squares up, ready to take him on. But then he gets hit in the back of the head with a paddle. Because Robbie clearly forgot this was a three-man job. And the guy who worked at the beach club, who was stealing all those wallets, took Robbie out. They start beating up Robbie, even threatening to stab him when Daniel, who was walking the beach, sees what was going on, and ends up taking all of the bullies out using his own karate. When they get back to the dojo, Robbie does apologize, saying what he did was stupid, but does show Daniel that something good came out of it. It was the video that he made. A former All-Valley champ taking out three criminals? That video could go viral. It could be the advertising that they need to get a packed dojo. But Daniel doesn't want it. He says Miyagi-Do is about self-defense, not taking credit. It's time to just be patient. Let those who need us find us. And at that very moment, somebody has found them, and that person is Dimitri. So Miyagi-Do Karate officially has their third student. And in episode five, Dimitri starts with his training, but to be frank, he's a whiny bitch. He does stuff, but it's only after complaining about it and asking if there's an easier way. And it becomes obvious to Daniel that Dimitri doesn't want to be here, and he asks him, why are you here? And Dimitri tells him it's because his whole life he wasn't popular, but at least he had friends. And then when Cobra Kai swooped in, all of his friends became douchebags. And now he's getting threatened by his best friend, so he wants to show that he can defend himself. And it's a sad state, because Dimitri just lacks confidence. Now over with Cobra Kai that day, they have a lesson. And the main message is, even if you're going to get hurt, sometimes going all in is worth the risk. And afterwards, Kreese compliments Johnny about the lesson, but says, are you even listening to your own words? Your kid is getting coached by your enemy. Go all in. So Johnny decides to go searching for Robbie, bringing a new skateboard to his apartment, but when he gets there, there's an eviction sign, and his ex-wife isn't answering the phone. So he goes to three separate LaRusso auto dealerships looking for Robbie because he knows he works there when he meets Anish, and Anish is a douchebag to him, not answering the question of where is Robbie, to the point where Johnny jacks him up against a car in the dealership and demands to know where his son is, and that's when Anish reveals, I'm not sure, but he did move in with the LaRussos. And when Johnny hears that, he goes on a bender, arriving back in his apartment drunk off his ass where he runs into Carmen who's doing laundry and Carmen feels bad for him so she brings him into their apartment to sober up and shortly after he fills her in on why he went down this bender the whole backstory with Daniel and how the fact that Daniel LaRusso just took his kid in makes Johnny want to get vengeance on him but she tells him that's not going to make you feel better trust me I know from my ex-husband the only way to end a rivalry is to rise above it be the bigger person. Now, Johnny wanted to know where Robbie was, but Robbie headed to the mall with Sam and Dimitri to grab some food. But shortly after the group sits down, Dimitri realizes that the comic book store has released the new comic of one of his favorite series. So he runs off to grab it. And while skimming through it, he's approached by Eli and a couple of other the newbies from Cobra Kai. Because Dimitri wrote a scathing review on Yelp, and Eli wants him to take it down. Dimitri tells him, though, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to risk my journalistic integrity on Yelp. But Eli pushes him. And Dimitri tells him, I know who you actually are. Are Eli. I'm not going to be intimidated by you. But then he turns around and there are two other guys behind him. And now it just looks like it's going to be gang warfare. So it's time to use that training that he's had, even though he is not ready. He tells Eli that Eli isn't the only one who knows karate. He's been learning Miyagi Do. And he gets in a fighting stance, but he gets taken down pretty easily. And when that happens, he just runs off running through the mall to try to get away from Cobra Kai. And it's not like all of the people that are chasing Dimitri are down with this. The one kid turns to Eli and says, yo, I think he learned his lesson. We don't need to do this. But Eli just bullies him up and says, shut up and go after him. And they end up catching up to Dimitri at the food court where Dimitri cannot find Sam or Robbie. And as the Cobra Kai members converge on poor Dimitri, that's when Robbie and Sam swoop in protecting him. Now it's five on about two and a half, really, because of Dimitri, who poses no threat. And Eli feels pretty good about this, but Miyagi-Do wins out. Both Sam and Robbie's practice with that choreographed dance fighting thing ends up paying off big time. They fight off the Cobra Kai members, including an epic roundhouse kick from Robbie into Eli's face that knocks him out cold. And when they get back to Miyagi-Do, Robbie and Sam are pumped. They're reliving the moment, excited that their hard work paid off. And Daniel's excited too, although he is concerned that they're okay. But after finding out they're okay, he's proud of them for defending each other. And that's when he looks over in the corner and there is Dimitri, sitting by himself, feeling very insecure because he could do nothing. And when Daniel goes to talk to him, trying to make him feel better, 
Dimitri compares himself to Samuel Tarley, where Robbie and Sam are Jon Snow and Daenerys. But to his surprise, Daniel watches Game of Thrones, and he tells him if there's anything to take from that message, it's that anybody can do anything, because Samuel Tarley killed a White Walker. Never forget that. He then starts going over some defense moves with Dimitri, making it a little bit more easy to remember. Now, on the flip side of that battle, you have Eli, who got his ass beat, and the 180 turn of Eli has been insane. I mean, this kid went from crying to his mom about the kids making fun of him, saying he'd never get a girlfriend, to now becoming the biggest bully in Cobra Kai and having a girlfriend, but not for long. Because when Moon finds out of what he did, she's no longer interested in dating him, telling him, I like your mohawk, I like your muscles, but I'm not going to date a bully. And he does not take that well at all. Storming back into Cobra Kai and taking his rage out on a heavy bag. But that's when Kreese walks in and can tell he was in a fight. And Eli fills him in that they lost to a bunch of kids from Miyagi-Do, but Kreese tells him, the fight isn't over until you say it is. So Eli rounds up some other members from Cobra Kai, they grab some spray paint, and they head to Miyagi-Do, and they completely trash it. And when Sam, Robbie, and Daniel wake up in the next morning, they find a wrecked Miyagi-Do. And it's pretty bad, but it gets worse when Daniel realizes that they even took Mr. Miyagi's Medal of Honor. And Daniel gets really emotional about that. They also spray painted Mr. Miyagi's car that says Cobra Kai never die. And that is a final straw for Daniel who gets in the car, drives over to Cobra Kai and confronts Johnny. And Johnny says, I have no idea what you're talking about because he really doesn't. But Daniel, who's almost brought to tears about the fact that they stole Mr. Miyagi's Medal of Honor, tells him just because you steal a Medal of Honor doesn't mean you actually earned it. They then look like they're about to square off and fight. And Daniel tells him, well, you know, I'm not going to throw the first punch. What are you going to do? But Johnny remembers the message from Carmen. Rise above it, be their bigger man, and he tells him, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to be the bigger man. Daniel then proclaims to the entire dojo that it's not too late. You don't have to learn like this. Miyagi-Do is welcome to everybody. And then he leaves. And behind him is about half of the dojo leaving with him, including the kid in the mall who told him, hey, Eli, we don't need to do this. And he tells his friends, I didn't really like it here in the first place. Now, just because Eli's relationship ended doesn't mean it's all been bad. Miguel took the advice of going all in, and he's trying to win Sam back with a graphic. He needs a female's perspective, so he shows Tori, not realizing that she's been hitting on him this entire time. And when Tori sees that it's Sam, Tori's advice is to delete it because he seems desperate and girls aren't into desperate guys. So act like you're over her, then she'll come back. But in the meantime, let's have some fun. And that fun includes making out with Tori under the stars and trying to get Miguel to forget about Sam entirely. And over with Sam, after kicking the crap out of some Cobra Kai goons, she's making s'mores with Robbie that night when they get really close to hooking up, but Robbie pulls away, saying, there's nothing against you, it's just I got a really good thing going here with your dad, and I don't want to screw it up. And I don't think hooking up with you would be screwing it up, but I just don't want to take that chance. So, love is in the air for everybody except Eli. In episode 6, they need to fix Miyagi-Do. Daniel, Dimitri, Sam, and Robbie start going back to work, cleaning up the mess that Cobra Kai left. Now, at one point, Robbie does try to address the elephant in the room, but Sam shoots him down, saying, we didn't do anything, so there's nothing to talk about. It is kind of awkward, though. While they're cleaning up Miyagi-Do, the kids from Cobra Kai that left Cobra Kai show up at Miyagi-Do asking if this is the right place. But Robbie's looking for a fight, because he recognizes the one kid from beating up Dimitri. Daniel tries to stop him, but... Robbie says that's one of the guys who was beating on Dimitri. He probably helped trash the dojo too, but Chris, the kid who left, says, hey, we didn't have anything to do with that, and then addresses Dimitri apologizing for what he did. But Dimitri does not accept the apology. He doesn't want to let these kids in Miyagi do, and he's not the only one. Robbie's hesitant to do so as well. But Daniel is willing to forgive and forget and says to him, we're happy to have you, and everybody starts going to work. Daniel gives all the kids individual tasks when Amanda calls asking if he's going to make the sales meeting. But Daniel says, I can't. We just got a bunch of new recruits and I don't want to leave Miyagi Do, so just cover it. But this is the second sales meeting in a row he's missed and Amanda is concerned. Especially when Daniel says, well, something important just came up, I got to go. And Amanda finds that kind of ironic since he thinks that a free dojo is more important than his business. But the important thing is the fact that Dimitri and Chris are going at it. Dimitri insulting Chris for just simple accidents. And the fact is, Dimitri is still pissed off Chris for trying to rough him up in the mall. So Daniel decides to have them work together to lift a stone that Dimitri, Sam, and Robbie were having trouble lifting earlier in the day. This way, they're going to have to use teamwork to pick it back up. But Dimitri and Chris are having a tough time doing it, and Dimitri continues to insult Chris, so finally he pushes him. But when Chris pushes him, Sam and Robbie step in, thinking that he's getting bullied again, trying to come to his defense, when in reality it was Dimitri who was being the douchebag. So when this mini skirmish breaks out, Daniel runs out saying, what's going on? You guys are on the same team now. And Robbie says, no. Once Cobra Kai, always Cobra Kai. But Daniel says, that's not true. I know that's not true because I was once Cobra Kai. 
He brings all the kids in the dojo and explains that he wanted to continue fighting after the All Valley, but Mr. Miyagi didn't want him to, so he joined Cobra Kai, and it did make him feel tougher, but he also noticed that he was getting angrier, and he didn't like that side of him. So it doesn't matter who anybody was before they stepped into this dojo, because today, right now, we're all Miyagi-Do. And after that impassioned speech, Chris and Dimitri go out, work together, and are able to actually lift the stone up. And then the two have the most awkward high-five pound thing. It's just weird. But they'll work on that chemistry, I'm sure. But Daniel has done it. He seems to have a full dojo and been able to successfully integrate former Cobra Kai members with Miyagi-Do into one. Now, over with Cobra Kai, Johnny's trying to get some answers as to what went down in Miyagi-Do. He's having the kids do up-downs until somebody says who did it. He tells all the kids, we don't do that here. But these kids are winded, and they're promising Johnny that they don't know who did it. Johnny, though, then has to step away because he gets a phone call. And he recognizes the voice on the other end, but he finds out that one of his friends is doing really poorly in hospice. So he heads out, leaving the dojo in Kreese's hands. And Kreese gives the kids a two-minute break where Eli does walk up to him and says, I think I should tell Sensei Lawrence what happened, but Kreese tells him, say nothing, I'll handle it. And he continues to work the kids to death. And because of the frustration, there's a little bit of infighting. So Kreese says, you know what, I'll tell you who did it. It was Hawk. And Eli's face looks guilty. But then Chris says, and it was Miguel, and it was Robertson. And he lists everybody in Cobra Kai, saying that if one of them does something, they all do something. He then tells all the kids to get in the main dojo because they're about to start their real training. He squares off Tori and one of the new kids, and Tori dismantles the kid pretty quickly. She gets awarded the point. But while the kid's down, Chris says, hit him again. And Tori's kind of surprised about this message. She's reluctant to do so, so Kreese says, do you have a problem with that? A fight isn't over until your enemy is finished. Show your enemy no mercy. So Tori nods, and she's about to clock this kid when Miguel speaks up, saying, this isn't what Sensei Lawrence has been teaching us. There's no honor in being merciless. Tori won. She got the point. And Kreese slowly makes his way over to Miguel, saying, well, Sensei Lawrence is right in a way. I mean, in a tournament, the fight stops when you get a point. But in real life... It's not about scoring points. It's about being a winner or a loser, and there are no losers in this dojo. After class that day, Miguel's getting some extra work in when Tori comes into the room and has him hold pads for her. Miguel asks her, don't you think that some of the what Sensei Kreese is teaching us is wrong? But Tori doesn't. She tells him a story about when her and her brother were growing up and the hardships they faced, and the message of it is, Life shows you no mercy, so why should they? Before the next class, Miguel does go in beforehand and tell Kreese that he's sorry for speaking up. He shouldn't have done that. But Kreese doesn't seem mad. He tells him, you have allegiance to Sensei Lawrence, and allegiance is nothing to apologize for. So they seem to be on a good page. Now, over with Johnny, that phone call that he got was from hospice for Tommy, one of his best friends growing up from Cobra Kai. And Tommy is in rough shape. Bobby, his old friend from Cobra Kai, is the one who gave him a phone call. And they go in to see Tommy, who's thrilled to see Johnny. Shortly after, though, Jimmy shows up, and they're all saying hi to Tommy, but they have to leave when the nurse comes in. And they've conspired to get Tommy out of there because they can't let him wither away in a nursing home. And Johnny's big fear is that Tommy's going to be too weak to even get up. But when they walk back in, Tommy's already ripped off all of the heart rate monitors, and he tells them, let's get the hell out of here. They all rent motorcycles and head off to have one killer weekend again, just like the old days. They end up getting to a bar, and they're talking about life and what they've all been up to, and Johnny tells them that he's opened up a dojo and he's called it Cobra Kai. And Cobra Kai is the only thing that's back, so is John Kreese. And his buddies aren't thrilled to hear this. They tell Johnny all that bullshit that we dealt with from Kreese, that no mercy crap, and hell, you dealt with it the worst. I mean, don't you remember what he did to you? But Johnny says, yeah, I remember, but people can change. I'm trying to change Cobra Kai. I'm trying to change the image. But even his buddies don't believe it, because John Kreese always has something going on. Tommy, then to break up this awkward conversation, says, hey, does anybody want to go play pool? And Johnny says, yeah, I will. But when they go over to the pool tables, there's some jerk getting way too handsy with a female, just being an overall douchebag. And he tries to act tough with Johnny, while insulting Tommy at the same time. And when the guy puts his hand on Johnny, uh, game on. All of the former Cobra Kai members go in on these goons, bringing back their karate and beating the hell out of all of them. That night, they go camping, and Tommy reveals to Johnny that he was actually always in love with Allie the whole time. But Johnny struck first. And that is why Tommy joined Cobra Kai. He wanted to have the balls that Johnny did when he asked Allie out. Johnny does reveal that he doesn't think he ever got over Allie. He tells Tommy, right now all I want to do is... Make sure my students don't make the same mistakes we did. I don't want these kids to look back at their life full of regret. And Tommy looks at him and says, you'll do it, Johnny, because you're the champ. And that is the last thing that Tommy ever tells Johnny, because the next morning, Tommy passed away in his sleep and the group finds him. In episode seven, Johnny returns after burying his friend, heads into his office to find that Kreese has organized everything and even managed to put up a picture of himself, making himself really feel at home. 
And Johnny's not too thrilled about it, but he kind of just puts it to the side, walks out, and tells the kids to put their geese on because they're going to start the lesson. But the kids are all confused because Kreese told them that they were planning on going to the woods that day, a place called Coyote Creek, to do a special secret training thing. And when Johnny finds out it's Coyote Creek, he tells Kreese, I don't think they're ready for that. But once the kids hear that, they start telling Johnny that they are ready. And Johnny's feeling the peer pressure, so he agrees. Cobra Kai heads to Coyote Creek, and everybody is divvied up into teams, red versus black. They're all wearing headbands with their team's color on it, and the whole goal is to grab the other person's headband. And the team to grab all the headbands is going to win. But Kreese is a little overdramatic, telling the kids that the headband is their life and there are no rules to this. Get a headband at all costs. Johnny, however, reminds the kids, this is simply a training mission, that's it. Now, Miguel and Tori are on the same team, and they're walking through the woods together when they come across one of the guys from the other team. And they toy with this poor guy. But after Tori gets his headband, Miguel ends up, quote-unquote, finishing him. And Johnny sees this from afar, and he is not a fan. Now, Eli, meanwhile, is on the other team. And Miguel sees him grab a headband, but then he also sees Eli start bragging about the fact that he has five, quote, kills. And I guess that's why he has a Medal of Honor alerting Miguel to the fact that it was Eli who trashed Miyagi-Do. And it ends up coming down to Miguel versus Eli. Eli walks up to him saying, all right, finally a worthy opponent. But to his surprise, Miguel isn't very playful, pissed off about the fact that Eli is the one who trashed Miyagi-Do. But Eli tells him, well, they're the enemy. I had to put them in their place. And Miguel can't believe what he's hearing, telling Eli they're not the enemy. That's stupid. Now, Eli thinks this is all about Sam, but it's not. And he tells Miguel, well, if you want the Medal of Honor so bad, come and take it. And that's exactly what Miguel does. And when Miguel claims victory, Kreese yells, finish him. So Miguel does that. But Johnny walks up to him afterwards and says, what the hell was that? I didn't teach you that. Is that really how you want to live your life? And then he walks away disgusted. So now Johnny has an issue with Kreese. And when they get back to the dojo, Johnny asks Kreese, what have you been filling my kids' heads with? And Kreese explains that it's the same stuff that he taught Johnny back in the day. But Johnny tells him that didn't work then and it doesn't work now. Cobra Kai is always going to be badass, but there's a huge difference between no mercy and no honor. Kree starts trying to justify himself, but at the same time, rile Johnny up. And it gets to the point where Johnny just cuts him off and says, you know what, this isn't working out. I thought it would, but it's not. And he kicks Kreese out of the dojo, forcing him to leave, and Kreese reluctantly does. Now over with Miyagi-Do, Daniel has gotten an early start to the day, but he gets a phone call from Amanda who once again woke up in a bed that was empty. He tells her that he got an early start to the day and tried to get an early start in the lesson, but she reminds him that they have a meeting that day with Anush. He reassures Amanda that he's going to be there and quickly gets off the phone because he hears something outside. And to his surprise, it's not anybody from Miyagi-Do, it's actually Kreese. Now, it's worth mentioning that this interaction did happen before Kreese's trip to Coyote Creek and before Kreese got kicked out of Cobra Kai. But the visit to Miyagi-Do was really a warning shot from Kreese to Daniel. That what happened back then isn't going to happen again, and all of us kids are going to be ready, and this is war, and yeah, the same douchebag rhetoric from Kreese. It's really just a tactic to try to intimidate Daniel. Now, while this is going on, Sam had linked back up with Moon. And Sam wants Moon to help her pick out an outfit, but Moon can't figure out why because it's just workout clothes. And then she figures out, oh my god, you have a crush, and it's got to be Robbie. And Sam kind of admits to having a crush on him, but also tells her that nothing's happened yet. So with that information, Moon does help her pick out an outfit, but it's extremely hot that day. And none of the kids really want to train because it's so hot. They're all whining. And the training method that day is one person standing in a circle, everybody has a number, Daniel yells at the number, that person goes in to attack the person in the center of the circle. But they're all struggling with it, so Daniel decides to flip the script and put them in a freezer. He tells them that the muscles twitching from the cold and the fact that you can see your opponent's breath, that'll all help you. But as he's in the middle of this lesson, he gets a phone call from Anush, and he sends the phone call straight to voicemail. And Anush is sitting there with Amanda wondering where Daniel is, visibly annoyed. And because his phone call went straight to voicemail, he figures that Daniel isn't coming and he walks out. And Amanda frantically calls Daniel, but he's not answering because he's too busy with this lesson. Now, the good thing about the lesson is he was able to help Dimitri defend himself. The bad thing about the lesson is once he's done with it, he sees a bunch of missed calls from Amanda and he knows that he screwed up. So he frantically heads to the dealership to make up with Anush, but he finds that Anush is gone. And Amanda tells him, yeah, he left. And Daniel thinks that he just left for the day, but she explains, no, Daniel, he left. He got a better offer from Tom Cole, and he was willing to let you match it, but you blew him off once again. You've been an absentee owner, neglecting this place while you've been off at karate camp. And Amanda isn't wrong, and Amanda's very sick of it. But back at the house, with Sam's parents, both at the dealership, arguing about Daniel's ownership strategy, 
Sam and Robbie finally hook up. And shortly after that happens, there's a knock at the door, and Robbie yells for Sam to get it, but she's upstairs, so Robbie answers the door, and to his surprise, it's Miguel. Miguel is returning the Medal of Honor, and explains to Robbie that he wasn't the one who trashed Miyagi-Do, he was just returning the Medal of Honor. They're not all douchebags. But when Sam comes downstairs after Robbie closed the door and asks who was at the door, instead of telling her the truth, Robbie says, oh, it was nobody. They just had the wrong house, and puts the Medal of Honor in his pocket. In episode 8, Daniel is in the doghouse, and he's forced to sleep on the couch. A secret that he's trying to keep from his mom, who has shown up to help out around the house, but it's hard to lie to your mom. She knows something's up. And the arrival of Daniel's mom has really put a wrench into the makeout sessions of Robbie and Sam, who are forced to make out when real tiny people. They do, however, have to go outside when they hear a commotion, and it's because Dimitri has, quote-unquote, found the Medal of Honor. And Robbie just plays it off like, yeah, it must have just been around a bunch of rocks. And Daniel was unaware of all of this because that day he headed into the dealership to try to make good with Amanda buying her a bunch of sushi. But Amanda sees right through it and tells him to give the sushi to her customers. And since that peace offering fell flat on its face, he decides to bring the kids to the dealership and having the lesson there by getting all of Miyagi-Do to wax on and wax off the cars. And when Amanda sees this, she says, okay, that's cute, but 10 more minutes of this free labor. But Daniel cuts her off saying, no, 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 this isn't a training session. This is me trying to help. This is me trying to say I'm sorry. But Amanda explains to Daniel that she knows that none of this is permanent. You can't put a Band-Aid on an open head wound. And Daniel can't believe that she's actually comparing their marriage to an open head wound. And that's when Daniel really realizes that he has his work cut out for him. That night, Daniel just wants to remember the good times, so he starts flipping through a scrapbook and his mom shows up. And they have a conversation about relationships and Daniel's father a little bit. But in that scrapbook, there's one photo that really sticks out to Daniel, and it's the opening of La Russa Auto Group. And in that photo, Amanda is very pregnant. But that night, they snuck away to sit in a car and have some sparkling cider and just talk about the future, map everything out. So with that photo, Daniel now has a plan to get his wife back. He heads to the dealership dressed just like he did that night, but instead of sparkling cider, he's got actual champagne. And he brings Amanda into one of their cars, and she has to give it to him, telling him that it's a pretty good plan doing this whole trip down memory lane. But Daniel says, nah, screw the dealership. What I remember the most about that night was planning out our future together. He then goes on to apologize, but admits that opening up the dojo made him realize how much he missed Mr. Miyagi, but also missed karate. The two do end up kissing in the backseat. Super adorable stuff. Now over with Cobra Kai, Johnny has realized that he sort of has a crush on Carmen. But when he goes over to their apartment to ask her out, she's not there. She's actually arriving in the apartment with her boyfriend. And it makes for a super awkward interaction with Johnny. He then needs to regroup because he's got a class that day. And he heads there and tells the kids that Kreese is out. And the words on the wall, strike first, strike fast, no mercy, they just make you out to be an asshole. Because in life, there's a lot of gray area. And in those gray areas, that's where Johnny Lawrence's Cobra Kai is going to show mercy. He then has the group square up and practice their headbutts, but Miguel goes to check on him, knowing that Johnny and Kreese were pretty close. But Johnny tells him, don't worry about me, worry about little girlfriend out there. And this is the first indication that Johnny's known about Miguel and Tori the entire time. Miguel then tries to turn the attention to Johnny's love life, but Johnny turns the attention to Miguel's mom's love life. And Miguel explains that he likes this new guy, and she's had really bad luck with guys in the past. She met this guy on a dating app and tells Johnny that one of those could work for him too. And Miguel offers to set it all up. And Miguel does that, but none of these dates are going well. And while sitting at the bar, he ends up messaging Allie via Facebook. But before he hits send, and it doesn't even look like he's going to, a woman bumps into him. And when that happens, his thumb accidentally hits send. The message goes out. But this woman was practicing a tactic that Johnny had talked about earlier. The old, you bump into someone at a bar and then apologize by offering to buy him a drink. And she does that, and the two hit it off. They're having a nice night. But then Johnny overhears somebody to the side and realizes that it's Carmen's boyfriend. And he's telling his buddy how Carmen, she's kind of pathetic because she lives in an apartment with her mom. And Johnny's trying to ignore it, but the more the night goes on, the more he can't ignore this guy. Because at this point, he's making out with some random girl. So when the guy goes to go to the bathroom, he's forced to go in the alley because the bathroom at the bar is broken. And Johnny follows him out there, leaving the girl at the bar, and telling this guy in the alley, you're going to leave Carmen alone. And the guy tries to act tough with Johnny, but ends up getting his ass kicked, although Johnny does show mercy. And the guy does end up leaving Carmen alone. A couple days later, Johnny sees Carmen all dialed up and asks how she's doing. And she says, I guess I got stood up on my date. And Johnny feels like this is a good opportunity, slides in and says, you should never be ghosted. No one should ignore you. And he asks Carmen out on a date and she accepts. 
Now, that's not the only date. Because Miguel has been looking for an opportunity to go out with Tori for a while. But the best they can come up with is going to Tori's work, where she works at a roller rink. And they're having an 80s night. So Miguel's going to head there, borrowing Johnny's jacket that makes him look like Michael Jackson. And he just plans to wait for Tori to get off. But unbeknownst to them, Robbie and Sam are headed to the exact same place, needing to get away from Sam's house because her grandmother is there and they just can't get any privacy. And they both are dressed in like a pretty and pink setup, although Robbie really looks like Don Johnson. But as soon as they get in there, she flags down one of the waitresses to get a menu. And when the girl turns around, she realizes, crap, it's Tori. And Tori is extremely rude to her. The awkwardness and insults are broken up when Miguel shows up and sees that Tori is talking to Sam and tries to introduce them, only to realize that they already know each other and they have quite a history. But right before Tori skates off to go back to work, she makes out with Miguel right in front of Sam. Now, Sam is trying not to let this ruin her night, but Sam skate breaks, and she goes to get it fixed, where she once again runs into Miguel. And this isn't an accidental bump in. Miguel showed up to apologize to her, but the conversation ends up turning into, I can't believe you're going out with her. Well, you showed up with him. And from afar, Tori is watching all of this go down, and jealousy is getting to her. So when Tori sees Robbie and Sam skating by with drinks, she ends up bumping into Sam really hard, where Sam ends up spilling her drink and falling all over the ground. And she doesn't exactly apologize, saying, sorry, princess. And Sam's had enough. She goes after her, tripping her. The problem is everybody saw what Sam did and no one saw what Tori did. And Robbie and Sam are kicked out of the roller rink with Miguel in complete shock that Sam just did that, even though Tori started it all. In episode 9, Robbie and Sam have decided to go public with their relationship and tell the LaRussos. But when they go to walk in the living room and actually tell them, to Robbie's surprise, his mother is sitting there, crying. She tells Robbie that Cabo was a mistake, which he scoffs at, saying, Yeah, I could have told you that. And then she reveals to Robbie that she has to leave again. And he gets his back up, saying, Where are you going to go now? Las Vegas? Jamaica? But she says, No, Robbie, I have to go to rehab. And immediately, to Robbie's credit, his mood changes and he becomes very sympathetic to his mother, and also proud of her for realizing that she has a problem and she needs to fix it. Now, the LaRussos have been nice enough to let Robbie stay there, and they're going to continue to do that. But she does tell Robbie, you know, you can stay with your father. Although Robbie has no interest in that whatsoever. She tells Robbie, I know you don't have the best relationship with him. But don't let my relationship with your dad ruin your possible relationship with your dad. Because, believe it or not, he does actually care about you. Even after this talk, though, it's pretty set that Robbie's going to stay with the LaRussos. It's also pretty set that this is not a good time to tell the LaRussos about the relationship, so they put that to the side. And that night, Sam gets on FaceTime and is telling Moon about the incident that happened at the roller skating rink, but more so about the fact that she can't believe that Miguel is actually dating Tori. And Moon says, yeah, but what does it matter? I mean, you guys have both moved on. That's a good thing, right? Although it seems like Sam has definitely not moved on. The whole point of this conversation, though, is to invite Sam, along with the rest of Miyagi-Do, over to Moon's house for a party that she's going to have. And the party just happens to coincide with Daniel and Amanda's date night, so it actually ends up being perfect. Daniel has decided to take out Amanda, trying to show her a good time, going to a Mexican place and going out dancing. But when they show up at the restaurant, the restaurant is packed, and the only table they have is sitting next to Johnny Lawrence on his first date with Carmen. And Johnny and Daniel are not happy to see each other. But that doesn't stop Carmen and Amanda from being friendly. But both tables' conversations morph into a mini pissing contest about who has the bigger dojo. And finally, Amanda goes, really? Is, is, this, is this how it's going to be the whole night? So the women actually push the two tables together, forcing Johnny and Daniel to just talk this out. Because both women realize that the two aren't that different. And it actually ends up working. When the women go to the bathroom, Daniel found out that Johnny really didn't know about Miyagi-Do being trashed. He also finds out that Johnny had no idea that Kreese came over and threatened him. And Johnny tells Daniel that Kreese is no more, he's gone, and he's trying to change Cobra Kai for the better. And after this mini clearing of the air, everybody has a really nice night. Now over with the kids, Miyagi-Do shows up to Moon's party, and to their surprise, Cobra Kai is there. And it leads to a very awkward staring contest between the two dojos. Moon quickly shows up, though, and welcomes Miyagi-Do into her house. But Sam tells her, I didn't know that Cobra Kai was going to be here. And Moon says, school's starting soon. Can we just squash this beef and go back to being friends again? And for a little bit, it works, although the beef between Tori and Sam does not go away. Tori's playing this game where you balance one leg on a stool while drinking, and if somebody falls off, they lose. And Tori is demolishing the competition. And when she sees Sam walk outside, she challenges Sam, 
and Sam doesn't back down. The two start drinking against each other, and Sam ends up winning. Tori falls off the stool and loses, and she's in a bad mood. But this competition leaves Sam blitzed. And when she goes into the house, she continues to try to drink, but Robbie, looking out for her, says, hey, maybe you should cool it. Let me go get you some food. And she can't believe that Robbie is trying to be a babysitter instead of a boyfriend. Although Robbie's not the only one that noticed this because so did Aisha. And she's also concerned about how much Sam is drinking. And when she approaches Sam about it, Sam says, you're just pissed off because I kicked your friend's ass. You can consider that payment for trashy Miyagi dough. But Aisha tells her that she had nothing to do with that. Neither did Tori and neither did Miguel. I mean, hell, Miguel returned the Medal of Honor. And this is the first time that Sam is hearing this, not even believing it. But Aisha fills her in that Miguel went to her house gave the Medal of Honor to Robbie, and then left it at that. He wanted to do the right thing. And this is a lot for Sam to think about, so she just heads outside. So the party continues on, and Eli, who is at the party, has got his eyes on his ex, Moon. But when he sees a new girl walk in, he turns to one of the guys from Cobra Kai, one of the newbies, and says, you want to know how you get a babe back? You make her think that you're over her. And he walks up to the girl and starts chatting her up, flirting with her, but then all of a sudden, Moon pops up out of nowhere, welcomes the girl, and then kisses her, because that girl is Moon's new girlfriend. And this is blowing Eli's mind. And he spends the entire night just staring at his ex-girlfriend making out with this chick. And Dimitri notices that his old friend is hurting. So he sits next to him and asks him if he saw the new Doctor Who trailer. But Eli tries some tough guy shit saying, I don't watch nerd shit anymore. Although the more that Dimitri talks about it, the more it becomes clear that Eli is still very much into Doctor Who. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, I don't watch it, but, you know, to each their own. Dimitri does, however, cross the line, though, when he tells Eli that... He needs to get over Moon because she's clearly over him. And that kind of triggers Eli a little bit, so the point where he stands up and pours a beer on Dimitri's head. But for Dimitri, that's the last straw. He gets up in front of the whole school and is just torching Eli, telling all the kids that he wet the bed until he was about 15. Just really embarrassing stuff. I mean, just roasting this kid, alerting the entire school to who Hawk really is. Now, two people who aren't witnessing this go down are Sam and Miguel. They're outside, and Miguel stepped out to go check on Sam to make sure that she's okay, but Sam gave him a lot of attitude, and Miguel started to walk away, and Sam said, hold on, wait. I heard what you did about the medal. That medal means a lot to my family. I do really appreciate it. I had no idea. She then kind of trips into him, and the two end up kissing. And since Tori's thing is to spy on her boyfriend from far away, she ends up seeing this. So she just leaves, pissed off. And it's a good thing, too, because with the roasting of Hawk slash Eli going down, Miyagi-Do and Cobra Kai were about to come to blows when the party gets broken up by cops. And all the kids are frantically running out of the house, including Robbie, who has gotten Sam, but Sam doesn't want to go back to her house. She doesn't want her parents to see her like that. So with nowhere else to turn, Robbie heads to his dad's place. And Johnny has just arrived back home from his first date with Carmen. In the season finale of season two, the LaRussos wake up and their daughter is nowhere to be found. And they kind of go into panic mode. Because she's not answering her phone and neither is Robbie. Although lucky for the both of them, Aisha has messaged Sam to find out if she got a home okay that night because she was drinking a lot. And the two see it because her computer is connected to her phone. They also utilize the Find My iPhone app and find out her exact location. And that location, unbeknownst to them, obviously, is Johnny Lawrence's place. So they head over there. But while they're on their way, Robbie has woken up and he thanks his dad for letting him crash there that night. Johnny tells Robbie, look, man, that's fine, but I'm going to have to tell LaRusso about this. I mean, it's his kid. And Robbie tells him don't, because if he sees her like this, it'll crush him. Let me take the fall. I'll tell them that I got really drunk and I told Sam to bring me here. And she stayed because she wanted to make sure I was okay. And that's all well and good. But when Daniel arrives and finds that the location is Johnny Lawrence's place, all the goodwill that happened the night before on their double date goes out the window. It doesn't help with the fact that when Daniel confronts him saying, is my daughter here? Johnny's first instinct is to tell him to calm down. Daniel ends up forcing his way into Johnny's apartment and the two start squaring off like the old days, getting into a full-on fight. This ends up waking up Sam, who is sleeping in the next room, and that's when the fight stops because Daniel turns his attention to his daughter, asking if she's okay, and when Sam says yeah, he then wants to know, well then why didn't you call or text or let us know where you're at? Robbie tries to come to Sam's defense, but when he does that, Daniel turns on Robbie, saying, I tried to give you a second chance, but you screwed this up. If you want to end up like him, meaning Johnny, go ahead. He then instructs Sam to get in the car, but right before he leaves, he mean mugs Johnny Lawrence like nobody's business. Both kids, though, need to put this behind them because they've got school the next day. And Robbie is enrolled at Sam and Miguel's school. Daniel drops Sam off, and Johnny does the same with Robbie, actually giving him a book bag with a bunch of stuff in it because 
He didn't really know what Robbie needed, but Robbie definitely appreciates it. But Johnny can tell that something is bothering Robbie, and Robbie reveals that he doesn't like the way he left things with the LaRussos. And he knows that Johnny doesn't want to hear it, but Daniel was really good to him. And it was Miyagi-Do Karate that helped Robbie out a lot. In the middle of their conversation, though, Miguel ends up calling Johnny, and Johnny sends it straight to voicemail because he wants to hear Robbie out. And Robbie's whole message to his dad is that you and Daniel could probably learn something from each other. You're not that different. Robbie then hops out of the car and ends up linking up with Sam at her locker, joking around with her that he needs help finding a couple of classrooms, but Sam is still bothered about what happened the night before, feeling like an idiot. She apologizes to Robbie, but Robbie says, there's no need to apologize, this is my fault too. He does then reveal to her, though, that Miguel gave him the Medal of Honor. That had kind of been weighing on him a little bit. And the whole reason he did that was because he didn't want Miguel to earn any points with Sam. Their relationship was fresh, and he just felt insecure. And Sam is about to tell Robbie that her and Miguel kiss, but then the bell rings. All the kids go to homeroom, including Miguel, who sits next to Eli. And Miguel has had an issue because he hasn't heard from Tori since the night of the party. And he's starting to get really concerned because Aisha tells him that she also hasn't heard from Tori. Tori's just MIA. He ended up confiding in Eli that he kissed Sam, and Eli thinks it's awesome, but Miguel feels really bad about it, feeling like he just shouldn't have done that to Tori. But the conversation is broken up when this kid walks up to Eli and tells him that there's nothing to be ashamed of about wetting the bed till you're about 15, just because, you know, kids haven't forgotten that little story that Dimitri told at the party. And this is all happening during the morning announcements that no one's really listening to, but everybody's ears perk up when Tori hops on, announcing to the whole school that Samantha LaRusso knows what she did, and now she's going to pay for it. So when classes adjourn, the whole school surrounds Sam and Tori, and it leaves Miguel and Robbie rushing to break things up. But there's no breaking up this fight. And when Miguel sees Robbie put his hands on Tori, Miguel comes to her aid thinking that Robbie's trying to get in the way, and it's really just a big misunderstanding. But now you've got Sam and Tori, and on the other side, you've got Miguel and Robbie. And Eli, who's become such a meathead, is ready to throw down with anybody. So you've got both dojos going at it. I mean, just former friends beating up on each other. Total chaos in the hallways of the school. And the fight is moving to the main entrance of the school, to staircases. And teachers aren't breaking it up because they're not paid enough to do that. And because it's full-on chaos, Eli thinks that this is the perfect time to get revenge on Dimitri for telling that story at the party. And he goes after Dimitri, hunting him down. But when he finally catches up to Dimitri, Dimitri uses Miyagi-Do to kick the crap out of Eli. That, however, is on a totally different area of the school. They were by themselves, really. Because on the main staircase, Robbie and Miguel continue to fight, but each one is trying to get to their girlfriends, trying to break it up. Although anytime they get close, the other one grabs them and the two end up continuing to fight. And the fight between Tori and Sam is just continuing. Sam is winning, yelling at Tori, is that the only way you know how to fight is dirty? And Tori looks at her, harnessing her inner Cobra Kai, telling her this isn't a tournament. There are no rules. And she puts this spiked bracelet around her fist and starts going after Sam, trying to legitimately hurt her. And she is able to. But Sam ends up using Miyagi-Do and winning that fight. However, most of the school is still focused on Robbie and Miguel. And Miguel has Robbie dead to rights. But he remembers what Johnny said about Mercy. And even apologizing to Robbie, dropping his arm and saying, I'm sorry. But Robbie does not accept that apology. Rage just envelops him and he ends up getting up and kicking Miguel over the balcony and Miguel ends up falling probably three flights and injuring his back I mean he is knocked out and it is a serious injury that has the entire school stopped dead in their tracks and right away Robbie knows that he went too far he knows he screwed up I mean Sam can't believe what he did Tori has gone to Miguel's aid and all of the parents are alerted Johnny finds out and hears Carmen scream from getting the news And he heads to the hospital with Carmen and her mom. And the doctor tells Carmen, you've seen your fair share of these. You know the next 24 hours is critical. Johnny is really concerned and asks, is he going to pull through? And the doctor doesn't really reassure him, just saying, we're doing everything we can. And Carmen is inconsolable, understandably so. Johnny apologizes to her, but she says, sorry. Before Miguel met you, he was a sweet boy. He avoided fights. Now look what you did. I never want to see you again. Johnny's just left to kill time walking the halls, and he ends up seeing Sam getting stitched up in another room as Daniel and Amanda try to calm her down because Sam feels like it's all her fault. Johnny then checks his phone, though, and sees that he has a voicemail from Miguel. It's from the phone call that he sent straight to voicemail when he was talking to Robbie in the car. And it's Miguel telling him that he's having girl issues, and Johnny's always been better at that sort of thing than Miguel, so he really needs to talk to him. The moment ends up bringing Johnny to tears because he doesn't know if that's going to be the last time he hears Miguel's voice. So Johnny ends up leaving the hospital, and when he gets in the elevator, right before the doors close, 
Daniel gets in the elevator. But this time, neither guy says a word. Neither guy is in the mood to fight. Johnny heads straight for the dojo, but when he gets there, to his surprise, it's unlocked. And he starts hearing these sounds coming from the back. And that's because all the way in the back of the dojo, Kreese is running Miyagi-Do. Hawk is there along with a bunch of his cronies, and Johnny demands to know what Kreese is doing there, but Kreese says, I'm teaching my students. You let them down when they needed you the most, and somebody needed to remind them what it takes to win. Johnny tries to step towards Kreese, but all of the kids in Cobra Kai get in his way. They're putting all of the blame on what happened to Miguel on the fact that Johnny was teaching Mercy. Johnny can't believe it and tells Kreese to get out, but Kreese tells him, no, this is my dojo. Oh, yeah, I totally forgot to tell you. When you were out of town, I had to talk with the landlord, and it turns out he doesn't really like you either. And then there's a funny thing about handshake deals. They can be broken. I mean, after all, I founded Cobra Kai. It belongs to me. It always has and it always will. I'll never let my students lose, even if it means that they have to find out the hard way. Johnny is fighting back tears after everything that happened that day, but also just finding out that the dojo was stolen from him. And he tells Kreese, if you wanted Cobra Kai back so badly, you know what? It's yours. And then he leaves. He goes to the beach and is thinking about everything he went through with Miguel and ends up chucking his cell phone. But when he does, his cell phone pings because he got a friend request from Allie. Episode 1 of Season 3 kicks off two weeks after the brawl at the school. And the brawl at the school has made big news. Parents in the area are outraged that karate has become basically gang warfare. Miguel is still very much in a coma, and the cops are looking for Robbie, who is on the run. And all the kids in the fight? Well, they were suspended from school for two weeks. And since the brawl, Johnny has been on a bender for the last two weeks, completely drunk, sitting at a bar, as the waitstaff tries to figure out how to get rid of him. But as he's watching the local news story about Robbie, a guy gets up and changes the TV to the Dodgers game. And Johnny, who is pretty shit-faced, confronts him about changing the TV, but the guy tells him to get lost. He also makes fun of Miguel, not realizing that Johnny is really close to Miguel. And when the guy leaves and gets in his car, Johnny follows him, breaking the guy's window and trying to pull his karate stunt, but he's really drunk. And it just results in Johnny getting his ass kicked, arrested, and thrown in county. And at jail, one of the police officers recognizes Johnny from the Applebee's stunt that we've heard about previously. He brings up to Johnny the fact that they're still looking for Robbie and the apple must not fall far from the tree. But Johnny tells him that he's a good kid and he just made a mistake. The police officer, though, keeps insulting Johnny and brings up the fact that it's not going to look good for Johnny's son when they catch him because of the fact he killed a kid. And Johnny, who has been locked up for a little bit, is worried that there's been a new update on Miguel. But the cop says, no, I don't know anything, but he's been in a coma for two weeks. Usually, when you're in a coma that long, the coma wins. Johnny ends up getting bailed out by a bail bondsman who tells him, you better be at the court date, and the bail bondsman drops him off at the local hospital. He goes to see Miguel, but finds out that it's family and doctors allowed. That's it. He tries to sweet-talk the girl at the front desk, but she's not having it. So he thinks, maybe I can sneak in as a doctor. But his face is pretty beat up from that brawl, and there's no way he's going to pass as a doctor. So, without any options, he decides to get admitted as a patient, bashing his head against a paper towel dispenser. And he gets patched up, but the nurses there are concerned because there's blood in his urine. Johnny doesn't think this is a big deal, but his back is really bruised up. And you can tell that the nurses are legitimately concerned that there's internal bleeding. But they go to get a doctor, and that leaves Johnny able to sneak away and see Miguel for the first time. And the good news for Johnny is the fact that Carmen and Carmen's mom aren't there because they probably would have kicked him out. Johnny starts apologizing to Miguel, who maybe can hear him, we don't really know, but also pleading with him to get better and come out of this coma. Eventually, though, Johnny is caught by a nurse and kicked out. Now, over with Daniel and Amanda, they're headed to a PTA meeting, and Amanda is heated. And a lot of it has to do with the stress of the dealership. The dealership has not been doing well since the fight. It's not a good look with the fact that they have a whole karate gimmick, and Daniel's student is the one who ended up putting a kid in a coma. It's led to not many customers, and it's stressing Amanda out to no end. Although, Daniel doesn't realize that it's that big of a deal. That is, until he actually goes to the PTA meeting. And when the school announces that karate is going to be treated like dancing in the movie Footloose, Daniel tries to stick up for karate, saying that when he arrived, he was being bullied, and karate really helped him in his life. But the negative backlash is very real. One guy screams out, I heard you were the bully. With another parent pointing out that it was LaRusso's student who put Miguel in a coma and popped this whole thing off to begin with. But the next day, the kids are allowed back in school. Eli, Mitch, and Bert link up, and Eli says, Okay, first day, take two, 
this is our year. He tries to hit on some freshman girls that walk by saying, hey, ladies, I'm the guy who, and they just cut him off saying, yeah, you're the guy who wet the bed at a late age and then got thrown into a trophy case. It completely embarrasses Eli because the narrative has shifted from Eli being cool to Dimitri being cool. In fact, when the girls pass Dimitri, they say hi to him, which completely takes him off guard. But this leads to a confrontation between Dimitri, Chris, and Nate, and then Mitch, Eli, and Bert. They look like that they're about to settle the score again because all three of the Cobra Kai kids got their ass kicked, and Miyagi-Do has no problem reminding them of that. But the school counselor breaks it up. We also find out that Yasmin is back in school after spending the summer in France. But even after spending a summer away, she hasn't been able to shake the front wedgie nickname. The good news for her, though, is that Aisha has transferred out. After the fight, her parents put her in a private school, sold her home, and moved. That's good news for her, but it's not good news for Sam because they've been friends for so long. And Sam enters the school, and she's kind of shook. Kids there are staring at her, and she has a little PTSD when she gets near the staircase where Miguel ended up cracking his back. It causes Sam to end up leaving school, ditching it for the day. Now, over at the LaRusso Auto Group, Daniel's trying to figure out how to get to Robbie. He's talking to Amanda about it when Louie, who has been rehired, interrupts the conversation saying, hey, I think I found somebody on our computer. There's one of the trade-ins that's missing, and it's a conversion van that no one would really want. They figure Robbie had to take it because nobody would have noticed it. The good news is they put tracking devices in all of their trade-ins, so it shouldn't be too hard to find Robbie, and Daniel takes off when he locates the tracking chip, Robbie ditched it because I guess he remembered that they put tracking chips in there. So Daniel is back to square one. He's thinking of places that Robbie might have gone and he figures maybe he went to Miyagi-Do. Miyagi-Do has been closed since the fight. It'd be the perfect hiding place. But when Daniel shows up, Robbie isn't there. To his surprise, Sam is. He wants to know what she's doing there and she admits that she thought she was ready to go back to school but she wasn't. All the kids were staring at her like she was a freak because when you win a fight as a girl, it's not the same reaction to winning a fight as a boy. She's also blaming herself for what happened. Daniel consoles her, but also tells her you can't run away from your problems and realizes that he can't run away from his. That night, in his quest for Robbie, he goes searching at Cobra Kai, looking for Johnny. But he doesn't find Johnny, he finds Kreese. He asks where Johnny is, but Kreese plays it off like he didn't kick Johnny out of his own dojo. He acts like the two are still working together. And Kreese starts insulting Daniel as a teacher because of what happened with Robbie, but also laying into Mr. Miyagi. And it really upsets Daniel, but he composes himself and reminds Kreese that Mr. Miyagi kicked his ass a few times. And Kreese is lucky that Mr. Miyagi taught Daniel real karate because of that, he's not going to fight him. But Kreese says, oh, you're going to fight me. But this time, me and Johnny, will finish it. Once and for all. But Daniel shakes his head and says, you're not going to do crap while I'm here, and walks out. The next day, Daniel finally ends up running into Johnny outside of his apartment. And when he sees Johnny, he knows that Johnny is in rough shape. You just look at his face and you can tell. He tries to get the details about what's going on with Cobra Kai, but Johnny's reluctant to give him any information, saying, I really don't want to talk about that at the moment. But Daniel has shown up because he feels like the two need to work together to find Robbie. They might be enemies, but they both care for the kid. He also feels like a lot of what's happened is their fault. Their rivalry has bled into these innocent kids. And Daniel knows that the two need to fix it. Oh, and finally, Miguel woke up from his coma. In episode two, you get a backstory on John Kreese. Back in the 60s, he was working at a restaurant looked at as a freak by his schoolmates because his mom committed suicide and people just didn't understand it at the time. A couple of jocks come in, start making fun of him, even bullying him. And Kreese puts up with it until he goes outside and sees that that same jock is putting his hands on his girlfriend. So Kreese sticks up for the girl, using karate to fight these dudes off. And in the process, stealing his girl. But Kreese ended up leaving the girl to go join the army. Present day John Kreese is teaching the class of Cobra Kai and he brings out a mouse. He has the class start giving names to the mouse, and Bert loves the mouse. But then John Kreese reveals his real motive. He wants Bert to feed the mouse to a snake he's brought, and Bert can't bring himself to do it. Kreese says, that's okay, you don't have to. Who else here agrees with Bert? And a few hands go up. And then he proceeds to kick all of them off the team, claiming that they're weak links. It's a bold move, and one that Hawk can't shake. He walks in after class and talks to Kreese about it. He doesn't have a problem with the fact that he kicked Bert off the team. He has a problem with the fact that they've been bleeding students since the brawl. Is this the best time to start kicking people off? But Kreese makes the case that it's addition by subtraction, although he does admit with Miguel out, they need a champion. They need to find that person who can bring a title home. And Kreese thinks he has a good idea of who that could be. It's Tori. Tori was expelled from school and is currently working on her GED, but also... She's currently working on working. She's working doubles because she's the main breadwinner in the house with her mom being sick. She's taking care of her brother, trying to get a degree, and also trying to pay rent, which is a big issue. 
because her landlord is creepy as hell, willing to let the rent slide if he, you know, gets some favors. Shouldn't really have to spell it out for you. So she needs to figure out how to make rent payment this month. And that's when she gets a knock on the door from Crease, who wants to know if she's interested in coming back, but she's not really interested. She, just like Sam, blames herself for what happened, saying that karate is the reason for her current situation being what it is. She just has a lot on her plate at the moment, and she needs to make rent. All of her extra money is going to that. So Crease said, all right, well, what if I waive the fee? And while she would definitely come back to the dojo, she says, I gotta make rent payment or else. Although she catches herself. And it becomes obvious to Kreese that the or else has to do with the landlord. So once Tori goes back inside, Kreese pays him a visit. And has a, quote, conversation John Kreese style with the guy. And squares it all out. And the next day at the lesson, while Kreese is giving an enthralling speech on losing weak links, Tori returns to the dojo. Now, over with Johnny and Daniel. Daniel thinks he has a lead on where Robbie might be. And that lead is Shannon. They go to visit Shannon in her rehab facility, which, by the way, is a gorgeous rehab facility. And she's a little shocked to see Johnny there. And it doesn't take long for Johnny and her to start squabbling. And Daniel has to remind the two of why they're there. Shannon does say anytime Robbie was in trouble, his two friends, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, weren't far behind. So go find them. So Daniel and Johnny head to the jail that they're located in. And Johnny's forced to rough these guys up a bit to get some information. But eventually they do reveal that they would go scam people at a local tech store and Robbie knew his way around that place pretty well, so go check out there. While they're driving over there, though, they stop to get gas, and Daniel gets word from Amanda that Miguel is out of his coma, which is great news. But then while they're filling up, they see the conversion van that's missing. Only Robbie isn't behind the wheel, it's some other guy. And when they go chasing after this guy, he gets in his car and speeds off, which leads to a high-speed chase. Eventually, the guy ends up pulling up into a garage and fleeing into that. And Johnny isn't about to let this guy just get away, so he follows him into the garage. And Daniel reluctantly follows Johnny. Once they get in, Daniel says, look, we don't have to do this. I don't like the look of this place. Let's just call the cops. But when he goes to leave... The mechanics in this chop shop have overheard that comment, and they're not ready to let Daniel just walk out of there. Now, Daniel's trying to talk his way out of it, but Johnny can see the writing on the wall, so he decides to strike first and throw the first punch. And him and Daniel end up forming a pretty formidable team to take all of these guys out, leaving the guy who was driving the conversion van to answer Johnny's questions, although Johnny doesn't like the answers he's getting. The problem is Johnny is so emotional at the moment that he can't accept this guy's answers for being real, demanding to know where Robbie is, but the guy tells him, I don't know where he is, I stole it from him this morning. It takes Daniel to actually pull Johnny off of him because Daniel's worried that Johnny's going to kill this guy. And emotions, once again, are running super high, and Daniel and Johnny get into it a little bit. With finally Daniel saying, you know what, I knew this was a bad idea, I'm out of here. And as he's leaving, Johnny reminds Daniel, hey man, you're the one who asked me to come. So Daniel gets in his fancy car, Johnny gets in his conversion van, and the two go their separate ways. And Johnny heads to the hospital to see Miguel. It's the first time the two have talked, and there's a lot of emotions going on. Miguel tells Johnny that the doctors fear that Miguel is never going to walk again. But then he addresses the elephant in the room. Telling Johnny, I did everything you said. I showed mercy and look where it got me. He yells at Johnny to get out, kicking him out of the hospital. And while Johnny was getting kicked out, Daniel got a call from Shannon because Robbie showed up at the rehab facility. And Shannon's worried for Robbie because he's sounding like he's going to skip town. So Daniel sits down with him and apologizes for the way that he left things the last time they talked back in Johnny's apartment. He tells him, people make mistakes and I can help you. Everyone deserves a second chance. But as he's about to ask Robbie to turn himself in, The cops that Daniel called end up showing up maybe three minutes too early. And Robbie feels like he's blindsided by this. The cops end up arresting Robbie as Daniel is pleading with him to turn himself in because he'll get a lighter sentence. Promising that he'll visit Robbie, but Robbie, feeling betrayed, looks at him and says, don't even bother. In episode three, over at the dealership, business is not going well at all. Amanda had their marketing company scrap the whole karate gimmick for the time being because they need business to tick up. They're going to have trouble making quota, and they know the car manufacturers aren't going to be happy with them. And as they're having the conversation about how business is not exactly booming, Tom Cole and Anish walk through the door. Because Tom Cole wants to buy La Russa Auto Group. He has an offer for Daniel, but it's not a great one. And Daniel tries to play it off like business is fine, but it's obviously not. But this offer could help Daniel get out of debt. And as they're discussing this with Tom Cole, Anish and Louie are outside of the office and Anish reveals to Louie that Tom Cole reached an exclusive deal with Doyona and this possible deal could put LaRusso Auto Group under. So as soon as Tom Cole leaves, 
Louis tells Amanda and Daniel about it, and Daniel goes to meet with Anish. Now, the good news is Anish is talking to him again, but the bad news is what Anish was telling him was correct. So Daniel formulates a plan, and that night they call in Tom Cole to tell him, we're not taking your offer. Tom Cole tries to do a big reveal with the Doyona deal, but Daniel cuts him off saying, yeah, we know about it, and gives a wink to Anish. And Tom Cole turns around realizing he's been betrayed, and Anish says, well, forgot to tell you, Daniel offered me my job back, and I'm going to go with him because, one, he knows my name. Tom had been calling him a wrong name the entire time, but also because he's not a douchebag. So Tom Cole leaves, saying, if you want to sit here and play violin on the Titanic, be my guest. But Daniel's plan isn't concrete. He's going to fly to Japan and try to talk Doyona out of the deal because the deal doesn't kick in until the end of the month. Now over with Johnny, after he got kicked out of the hospital by Miguel, he goes on yet another bender, interrupting one of Tommy's sermons. Tommy has to use karate to shut him up, but after the sermon, the two sit down and have a talk about what the hell's going on with Johnny. Johnny tells Bobby that he's not allowed to see Robbie and Juvie because Johnny's currently on probation. You find out that the reason why Johnny's on probation and not actually in jail is because Bobby put in a good word for the judge. Johnny's just so frustrated because he was trying to be a better person, do the right thing, instill that in his students, and look where it got everybody. But Bobby reminds him, you do the right thing, not because it works out all the time. You do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. He also lets Johnny know that the detention center will let him in if he's accompanied by a member of the clergy, which Bobby is. So they agree to meet the next day to go visit Robbie. He also tells them that the church can help with Miguel's medical bills. The family's flying in an expensive surgeon, and it's going to put the Diaz's in debt. But the church's donation is going to be very small because they're still fixing up their roof. Johnny says thank you, but says, no, I'll figure it out myself. He tries to get a part-time job, but his record is getting in the way of that. And he's forced to go to the last person he wants to go to for money, Sid. And he walks in hat in hand, but Sid does what he always does. Starts bullying him, insulting him. And Johnny tells Sid, this isn't even for me, it's for Miguel. But Sid's insults continue, and he doesn't give him the money. But as Johnny is leaving Sid's place, he grabs a piece of art and uses that, selling it and getting the money. He heads to the hospital to pay off Miguel's debt anonymously, but the family sees him doing it. They thank Johnny for doing so, and he goes to leave. But Miguel's grandmother says, no, Miguel really needs you right now. Come pray with us. And the reason that Johnny had to leave was because he has to go meet with Robbie and Bobby. But instead of doing that, he decides to stay at the hospital and pray for Miguel. And this is yet another kick in the teeth for Robbie. Juvie has not been easy for him. Robbie can defend himself, obviously, but there are these three guys who basically run shit there, and they've been ganging up on him. So this visit from his dad was supposed to be a bright spot, but it turns out that his dad just blew him off yet again. But Johnny wasn't the only person that was trying to help Miguel with his debt, because Sam went to visit Miguel and found out about it. As she was leaving the hospital room, though, she ends up running into Eli, and Eli yells at her for having the audacity to stop by. But she tells Eli, I'm just here to help. And he says, I think you've done enough, princess. But that doesn't deter her. She gets Miyagi-Do and the school cheerleading group, and they organize a car wash. And the car wash is a big success. It's even covered by the news, which Robbie sees in Juvie. But when Cobra Kai finds out that they're doing this for Miguel, instead of being happy that they're helping out Miguel, they're pissed off. Having the mindset that how dare they help out our guy will help out our guy. So they wait until after the car wash is over. And they end up surrounding little Nate, taking the money, telling Nate, we'll let Miguel know this is from Cobra Kai, and then roughing him up big time. When the rest of Miyagi-Do finds out about what happened to Nate, they head over to the LaRusso's house to see if Daniel's there, but he's not. He's in Japan. But when Sam sees what happened to Nate, she knows that she has to reopen up Miyagi-Do. She tells them, Cobra Kai never stopped training, so we need to start to catch up. Some of the members are worried that they're going to get caught by Daniel, but Sam says, don't worry about my dad, he's out of town. And in episode four, despite Daniel's best efforts, Doyona says, thanks, but no thanks. It has more to do with the negative PR that they would get than the lack of sales. Daniel leaves the meeting pretty dejected, but he doesn't let Amanda see it telling her that he's going to continue to work on it. He goes to a bar to kind of drown his sorrows where the bartender can tell that Daniel's going through something. Seeing him flip through photos of Mr. Miyagi and asking if that's a friend, he says, yeah, it is. I wish he was here now. Fortunately, he's not. And the bartender tells him that's a really American way to look at it. In Japan, you can always visit somebody. They're always with you. So Daniel heeds this advice, heading to Tomi Village for the first time in about 30 years, the home of Mr. Miyagi. He remembers it being a land stuck in an ancient time. So he's pretty surprised to see that it's been modernized. A lot. And not to his liking. He finds out, though, that the crops started drying up, so they started selling off the land to malls, and it really revitalized the area. This mission, though, isn't for nothing because he ends up running into Kamiko. They end up they end up going out to grab a bite to eat and catching up. You find out that Kamiko never got married. A couple guys tried, but didn't work out. 
She wants to know, though, why Daniel really came back. She's not buying the story about his business. And he tells her it's because everybody looks to him for answers, but currently he's lost. He used to go to Mr. Miyagi for help, but Mr. Miyagi's not there anymore. And it's dawning on him that he is the same age that Mr. Miyagi was when he met Mr. Miyagi. And he had it all figured out. He wishes that Mr. Miyagi was still there to help guide him. The two end up continuing to catch up with Kimiko, letting him know that Mr. Miyagi was a romantic at heart, sending Yuki love letters. And one of the love letters was sent a week before Mr. Miyagi died. And it's from Mr. Miyagi telling Yuki just how much Daniel means to him. Not just Daniel, but Daniel's entire family, allowing Mr. Miyagi to be a part of it. And this kind of message is just what Daniel needed. They go out to have a drink that night, and Kimiko is telling him, don't worry about your business, it'll work out. But their conversation is interrupted by Chosen. And he doesn't look thrilled to see Daniel. Back in the States, though, Miguel has gone through surgery, and it's only a matter of time before they find out if it was successful or not. Johnny, though, after getting an update, knows he needs to make up with Robbie. And he does that by heading to a soup kitchen for the homeless, where Robbie is going to be volunteering to lower his sentence. Robbie isn't too thrilled about seeing Johnny, having felt like he bailed on him once again. Telling Johnny, if you're going to sit here and tell me you're in my corner, you can save that. Mr. LaRusso said the same thing, and look where I am now. Robbie tries to get him out of there, telling him that he's busy, but Johnny's not leaving until the two can have a conversation. He sees Robbie carrying a bunch of soup and decides to go give him a hand. And he tells Robbie, you know, before the fight, we were headed in the right direction, but Robbie reminds him, Dad, it was one day. And their conversation seems to be headed in the right direction until Johnny reveals to Robbie that he blew him off because of Miguel in the hospital. Robbie gets his back up, saying, you know, I'm sure Miguel really appreciated that, but Johnny also gets his back up, saying, hey, I'm not the one who put him in the hospital. And Robbie can't believe that comment, telling Johnny, I don't need you anymore, and getting him kicked out of the soup kitchen. Johnny starts to go through one of his benders, sponsored by Coors Banquet, when in walks John Kreese. Kreese feels like they can finally talk as adults now that Johnny's done with his temper tantrum. Johnny gives him three minutes, and Kreese gives him credit for reviving Cobra Kai, but tells him that what he did was necessary, and it's time for Johnny to come home. He's a broken man at the moment. He tells Johnny he was the best, and he can teach that to these kids, including Miguel when he comes back. But Johnny tells him, if you ever go near Miguel or his family, I'll kill you. And time's up. After this meeting, Johnny puts down the Coors Banquet and heads to the hospital, deciding not to take Miguel's crap. Miguel is trying to get his phone, and he can't reach it. And Johnny turns back into Sensei Lawrence, telling him that can't, won't, those are negatives. He's an adult now. He needs to get up and get that phone. Don't accept his position. And Miguel does that. It's a really inspiring moment. Until Miguel falls flat on his face. But it's a good sign that Miguel called Johnny Sensei. Now, after the meeting, Kreese did not just go home. He went to go do something that he's been trying to do for a long time. Recruit Robbie into Cobra Kai. Visiting him in juvie. Now, back with the rest of the kids, tensions are still high in school. Dimitri has done an earth science project. He's in a group with Yasmin and Moon. Yasmin isn't thrilled about it, but Dimitri reminds her, my popularity is on the rise, yours is way down, so maybe we can meet in the middle for some sexual harmony. It's something that old Dimitri never would have said. Now, Yasmin is grossed out, but she is impressed by Dimitri's earth science project. One person who's not impressed is Eli, who notices it and notices that he's making Moon laugh and decides to destroy it by hitting a soccer ball on top of it. Dimitri gets incensed, going up to Eli and saying, dude, that took me three weeks to create. And Eli says, yeah, well, it took my soccer ball three seconds to destroy it. Dimitri shoots back, yeah, you in this pissing contest, but it's not a surprise. You enjoy pissing so much. And they start getting into a verbal argument where Sam ends up sticking up for Dimitri. And in the middle of it, Eli notices that the school guidance counselor is looking in their direction, so he provokes Sam to push him. And when the guidance counselor comes over to find out what's going on, Eli plays innocent saying that Sam entered his safe space and he feels triggered. It ends up getting Sam and Dimitri in trouble. Tensions, though, come to a head on the soccer field. It's not a good idea to put a bunch of kids who know karate, a.k.a. kicking really well, into a sport where the only thing they can do is kick. Sam feels like this is the perfect time to get back at Cobra Kai because they're just being aggressive on the field. Eli scores a goal and looks over to see Moon talking to another guy, and you can tell he's upset. Dimitri uses this to his advantage. Telling him, you know, she was in love with you. You screwed up a really good thing. And then he pushes him down on the ground. It gets to a point where the gym teacher needs to stop class and send everybody to the principal's office because they've stopped trying to aim for the goal and are instead aiming for their opponent's heads. But in the principal's office, Eli is the first one in there. And whatever Eli tells the principal, it works. Because Cobra Kai is dismissed with no punishment, while Miyagi-Do is given two weeks of detention on the weekend. And Sam is enraged, yelling that this school sucks. 
In episode 5, over in Japan, Daniel is ready to throw down with Chosen when he walks in, but Chosen just bows. He does sit down with Daniel and Kamiko, and it does lead to a super awkward conversation, or maybe lack thereof. Eventually, Chosen does go up to get a drink, and Daniel turns to Kamiko saying, how did this guy find us? But it turns out that Kamiko ended up calling Chosen. She felt like enough time had passed that the two need to patch up their differences. When Chosen comes back, she tells both of them, yeah, I have somewhere to be, and asks Chosen to take Daniel around Okinawa. So Chosen takes Daniel up into a mountain, and they start talking about Miyagi-Do karate. Daniel knows a lot because of the fact that Mr. Miyagi taught him, and he mentions the fact that Mr. Miyagi taught me everything I know, but Chosen says, I don't think he taught you everything he knew. He takes Daniel to a dojo that is full of Miyagi-Do artifacts, including scrolls, and Daniel gets geeked out. He goes to take one of them, but Chosen says, whoa, whoa. You can't take that. You're an outsider. But it turns out that Mr. Miyagi taught Chosen's uncle karate, and Chosen's uncle taught him. So in a way, Daniel and Chosen come from the same lineage, and they're kind of cousins in the karate game. But that argument isn't really holding water with Chosen, so Daniel tries another approach, saying, Mr. Miyagi treated me like a son. There's nothing he wouldn't have kept from me, implying that some of those scrolls should be Daniel's. But once again, Chosen says, I don't think he taught you everything that he knew. They square off in the dojo, and Chosen goes after Daniel's leg. And Daniel says, what kind of defense tactic is that? But Chosen says, there's many different kinds of defense. He tells Daniel that the Miyagi-Do ancestors had to fight off invaders. The only way to survive was to kill. And this is all news to Daniel, who can't figure out why Mr. Miyagi didn't tell him any of this. And Chosen says, maybe he thought you weren't ready or you just weren't capable. But the biggest thing that Chosen shows Daniel is the power of pressure points. Chosen ends up hitting Daniel in the right spot in the arm that leaves his arm virtually immobilized. He does the same thing with the leg, and Daniel can't really move. So Chosen grabs his hair, pulls his head back, and it's like the roles are reversed from 30 years ago. Chosen even says, I've been waiting a long time to do this, and Daniel has prepared to get his face caved in. But when Chosen comes down with his hand, he just honks his nose. Turns out the guy actually has a really good personality. He also agrees to teach Daniel about the pressure points. After the lesson, though, they're coming down from the mountain, and Chosen tells Daniel that it was really tough on him after he lost to him. But his uncle saved him and gave him a chance to prove himself. But the regret of what he did back in the day is still hard to overcome. And Daniel tells him, Look, man, if it means anything to you, I forgive you. And it does, in fact, mean a lot to Chosen. They bow and are about to go their separate ways, but before Daniel does, Chosen stops him and gives him one of the scrolls to take back with him to the States. Daniel then goes and meets up with Kamiko, but Kamiko isn't alone. There's another female with her, and Daniel actually knows this girl, because this girl is the little girl that Daniel saved from the typhoon years ago. And when Daniel finds out that this is the girl, he gives her a big hug, has a huge smile on her face, and starts to get caught up with her. And it turns out that she is the vice president of sales for Dayona, literally the savior that Daniel needs. But just because he saved her from a typhoon 30 years ago doesn't mean she's about to do a bad business deal. No, I'm kidding. I mean, she she saves his business. Now, back in the States, Johnny walks into the Diaz household to help Miguel with the day, but Miguel is just wrapping up physical therapy. And the techniques that the physical therapists are using, well, let's just say Johnny isn't the biggest fan of them, and he's having trouble keeping that opinion to himself. It gets to the point where Carmen has to pull him aside and says, Miguel wants you a part of his rehab, and I'm not going to deprive him of that. But I'm also not going to deprive him of somebody who's trained in medicine. So you need to keep your opinions to yourself. And Johnny agrees to do so, but Johnny also has his own methods on how to get Miguel to walk. And the first is to dangle a swimsuit issue from 1988 in front of him. And even though Miguel can find way better stuff on his phone, he does try to get the magazine, but ends up falling out of his chair. And he's frustrated and tells Johnny, you could have dangled a PS5 in front of me, I still would have fallen. His next idea is to distract him with conversation, but light his shoelace on fire. Figures... If there's any motivation, it's going to be to get up and put out the fire, but it doesn't work. And the fire continues to spread and spread until finally it reaches his pants and Johnny actually has to use a fire extinguisher to put it out. And that one really, really hurts Miguel because he was just powerless to get up from it. So that night, Johnny continues to do some research, hopping on the internet and going to WebMD or WebMD for us normal people. But he hears Carmen crying outside and goes to see what's wrong, thinking that something happened to Miguel. But she says, no, just the emotions a lot of times. I need to let it out, and I don't want him to see me like this. She's really concerned that he's 17. He should have his whole life in front of him. He should be out partying and having fun with his friends. Instead, he's confined to a wheelchair. And the most frustrating part is nobody truly knows if this kid is going to walk again. So Johnny says, hey, can I borrow him for a couple hours? And takes him to a D. Snyder concert, sneaking him in, telling the doorman that he's a Make-A-Wish kid. Somehow this word gets to D. Snyder, and he even shouts out Miguel from the stage. 
but Miguel is having an absolute blast. He takes a selfie with Johnny, and Johnny says, hey, man, can I get a copy of that? And Miguel says, yeah, sure, I'll tag you. But Johnny tells him, I don't have my phone. I got rid of it. And Miguel lets him know, you are aware that Facebook is on the internet, right? And Johnny plays it off like he did, but of course, he didn't. Concert continues, though. They're having a great time. And then Johnny looks down and notices that Miguel is tapping his foot. Miguel doesn't even notice this, but when Johnny points it out, they celebrate because this is the first sign of progress. And when they get back to the Diaz household, Carmen wants Miguel to do it over and over and over again, and is so happy. Johnny heads back over to his apartment, hops on Facebook to see the photo that Miguel tagged him in, but notices that he has a friend request from Allie. Now, over with Miguel's classmates, Sam is continuing to teach the Miyagi-Do kids, but she ends up getting caught by her mom and Anthony. By the way, shout out to Anthony because in the, quote, two months that have taken place since season two and season three, kid has slimmed down, looks phenomenal. Still annoying, though. But Amanda is livid that Sam is teaching these kids karate. This is on top of the fact that the school is calling and telling her that Sam is becoming an issue. And Sam tells Amanda, if you really think karate is the issue, then you don't have a clue. And Sam's kind of right. Eli and a bunch of Cobra Kai goons go to golf and stuff and end up giving Chris, who works there, a hard time. Dealing some tickets from an innocent kid and trying to cash them in for a bobblehead. But when Chris goes to get it, they end up stealing a bunch of stuff and running out. And Chris texts Sam that night saying, great, now I got Cobra Kai bothering me at work. So Sam rounds up some Miyagi-Do kids. And through the information that Chris gives her, they know that they're going to have Cobra Kai outnumbered. And Cobra Kai is literally next door in an abandoned laser tag place, about to drink some warm beer and be cool. So Miyagi-Do catches them off guard. And at first, Miyagi-Do is winning this fight. But then the rest of Cobra Kai shows up, including Tori. And when Tori shows up, Sam starts having a panic attack, hiding. Even though Tori is calling out for her, Sam is just immobilized. And one by one, the Miyagi-Do kids start getting their ass kicked. It gets to the point where Eli has Dimitri's arm in a very compromising position, and Dimitri is begging him to let him go. Although, the rest of the Cobra Kai kids are telling Eli to finish him. And Eli gives into the peer pressure and breaks Dimitri's arm. You can just see in the look in his face that he isn't proud of what he did. He feels really bad. But he plays it off to his Cobra Kai buddies like, yeah, I'm the man. And Sam is so disappointed in the fact that she couldn't help her friends. Sam goes to the hospital with Dimitri and Amanda meets her there. And Amanda starts ripping into her for not listening. But once she sees Sam's face, she realizes this isn't the time to rip into your daughter. Because Sam is really, really upset. She tells her mom, we just wanted to show them that we couldn't be bullied anymore. And it turns out they end up breaking Dimitri's arm. Now over with the leader of Cobra Kai, Kreese goes to meet with Robbie. And kind of giving him the backstory about him, his dad... Cobra Kai, and really just how dominant of a fighter Johnny was, and how Kreese can help Robbie become that. But Robbie's not interested, telling the guy to kick rocks. Before he leaves, though, Kreese says, that's fine, but one piece of advice. All that Miyagi-Do stuff about defense, yeah, that might work at tournaments, but this is the real world, you might want to strike first. And then he takes off. Later that day, though, Robbie does a Google search on Kreese, and finds articles about how he won four straight All-Valley titles. But then, he finds another article about a mysterious dojo with one student that ended up defeating Cobra Kai, and that obviously is Miyagi-Do. He also checks his email and sees that the LaRussos have been blowing up his emails, but he hasn't been getting them. Or at least, he hasn't seen them up until this point. He starts writing Sam back when the bully in Juvie pulls the cord on the computer. And later that day, when the bully kind of tries to egg him on, Robbie takes Kreese's advice, blindsiding the bully and his buddies, getting into a fight with the kid. The kid holds his own, as does Robbie, and eventually it gets broken up by the juvenile detention guards. But once they're released, they both realize that neither of them snitched on each other, and they kind of gain a mutual respect. And Robbie, in this current situation, realizes that maybe striking first and Kreese's methods were right. But after meeting with Robbie, Kreese just headed back to the dojo. And that night, his door opens up, and he thinks it's just a mom trying to sign her kid up for karate, but it's not. It's Amanda. And she is pissed. She yells at him, saying, Hey, Rambo, your little gang of misfits is running around breaking kids' arms. Kids are getting hurt. And he's able to discern that she must be Daniel LaRusso's wife. And he makes a snide remark about how Daniel now needs his wife to fight his own battles. But Amanda slaps him in the face and says, I'm going to the cops. And I'm getting you shut down if it's the last thing I do. And then she walks out. In episode 6, Johnny ends up seeing the message from Allie, and it's really nothing more than a catching up. But Johnny ends up going through every single picture of Allie and liking it, because Elizabeth's shoe is still a dime. Later in the day, though, Miguel comes over because he's still trying to help Miguel learn how to walk, and he's hooked up a harness system, which Miguel hates because Miguel feels like he looks like an idiot in it. It also doesn't work, and Miguel ends up falling down. Miguel does mention how Carmen's been mentioning Johnny a lot because of the fact that she's so appreciative of all he's done, but then he notices that Johnny has written a book on his computer. And Johnny says, oh yeah, it's a Facebook message. And Miguel says, dude, you can't send that. That's psycho stuff. 
But Johnny has 30 years to catch up on, so there's a lot. Miguel tells him, though, dude, the shorter the better. You look crazy right now. I mean, this is as nuts as liking every one of her photos. And then by Johnny's expression on his face, he realizes, holy crap, Johnny actually did do that. But Miguel starts to read Allie's message, and but one of the things that Allie mentioned was the fact that there's not a lot on Johnny's profile. So Miguel asks, do you have any pictures of yourself? But all of the pictures that Johnny has are from high school. They're all with his shirt off. They're all extremely vapid. There's not a lot of current photos. And Miguel realizes, we're going to have to go through a photo shoot and make you look a little more interesting than you actually are. They have Johnny reading a book at an art museum and even eating sushi. But Johnny hates sushi, so he goes to spit it out when Tori walks by. Because Tori happens to work at that sushi place. It's one of her two jobs. And this is the first time that Tori is seeing Miguel. She apologizes for the fact that she didn't visit. She said she wanted to, but she didn't know what to do. So Miguel says, so you did nothing. She does mention the fact that they are getting back with the miyagi Dos for what they did to him. Because as Sensei Kree says, once you hurt one of us, you hurt us all. But Miguel looks at her like, are you stupid? I'm the one in a wheelchair right now. And I never cared about Miyagi-Do or Crease. I cared about us and our relationship. I know you're taking care of your mom, but I think you're the one that actually needs some help. And Tori flies off the handle at that comment, yelling at him, saying, you think I'm crazy? Well, everybody else does too. All that matters is who wins at the end. And then she leaves. It's got Miguel pretty pissed off. And when he heads back to Johnny's to continue to work on the harness, Johnny can tell that he's upset. He tries to motivate him by saying, so what? You saw your ex-girlfriend. Get over it. But Miguel takes umbrage with that comment, saying, hold the phone. We just spent all day taking pictures of you to make you out to be someone you're not for your ex-girlfriend. He then yells at Johnny for giving up, saying, you let Chris take your dojo. You let Eli and Tori think you were soft. But Johnny shoots back that bringing Cobra Kai back was a mistake. He never should have done it. But Miguel doesn't agree with that at all, saying, look what happened. You helped a bunch of people, but then you walked away from us, just like a pussy. You're a sensei, and if you can't see that, then you're blind. Blind. But then Johnny notices that Miguel is standing on his own two feet, not using the harness. And all of the bad blood and anger that's in the room goes away, and he gets replaced with pure joy. And later that day, Johnny starts to write Allie back this really nice message about who he is, how he's helping kids, how he's become a sensei. But then he does the typical guy move, deletes the whole thing, and just hits her with a, not much, how about you? Now, also in this episode, you get more of the backstory on John Kreese. Over in Vietnam, he got brought into the secret division of Green Berets that were led by a total hard ass of a captain. The captain started teaching him hand-to-hand combat and really taught him the art of no mercy. John Kreese wasn't always this kind of guy. He was willing to show mercy at one point, but the captain instilled in him that if you do that, you're going to die. During the training, though, the captain gets word that something happened with Kreese back home, but he tells the messenger, never speak a word of this to Kreese. He doesn't need to know. It's just going to distract him. And then they continue on training. They get their first mission, and it involves blowing up a local village. And Kreese is tasked with pushing the detonator. Problem is, one of his fellow soldiers is in proximity of the detonation. And he's waiting and waiting and waiting for this guy to get out of the way, but he won't. The captain is yelling at him to just push the button, but Kreese can't bring himself to do so. And it gets the entire group caught by the Viet Cong. And Kreese is forced to watch his fellow soldier get shot in the head as his captain is blaming him the entire time. So this event in Korea really messed with Kreese's head. The current day Kreese, though, is recruiting like he's in the army, going out there and realizing that Cobra Kai needs some athletes. He gets Kyler, who turns out is a really good wrestler, and Kyler's buddy, the male version of the comedian Fortune Feimster, who is extremely strong. They, along with a couple others, have agreed to join Cobra Kai. But the rest of the members of Cobra Kai are kind of celebrating their Miyagi-Do victory, especially the fact that Eli broke Dimitri's arm. But then all of a sudden, in walks the new group. And Eli is getting flashbacks like PTSD from before he became Hawk and Kyler and his buddy bullying the shit out of him. He immediately walks up to Kreese and says, Sensei, I don't think these guys are Cobra Kai material. But Kreese shoots back, they're natural born athletes and you're the one who said we need more people. So I got more people. We need people like this. So they all get in position, and then all of a sudden, Kyler and Fortune Feimster recognize Eli. And they once again start making fun of him, but Eli doesn't stick up for himself. Not saying a word, reverting from Hawk back to Eli. The lesson, though, for the day is to find out where these new recruits are, and Kree starts matching them up. The first matchup is Kyler and Assface, a.k.a. Mitch. I feel like Assface is kind of derogatory, so I'm just going to call him by his birth name, Mitch. And Mitch gets the first point, kneeing Kyler in the face, but Kyler's a really good wrestler. And he's up taking Mitch down with ease and submitting him. And then he gets directed to finish him, which he does. Mitch tries to get back in line, but Kree says, where are you going? You just lost to an untrained fighter. 
You're cut from the team. He just replaced you. Eli tries to stick up for Mitch, saying how he's been a good soldier and he deserves a second chance, but Kreese tells him he's just not Cobra Kai material. The next matchup is Tori and a new girl, and Tori runs through her. And the final matchup is Fortune Feimster, whose actual name is Brooks, but Fortune Feimster's a better name than that, so I'm going to continue to call him Fortune Feimster. And Eli volunteers to fight him, refusing to take any more shit from these guys and showing them who's actually boss in the dojo. Fortune thinks that he's going to have his way with Eli. But Eli murks this dude, beating the shit out of him, taking him down, and finishing him is an understatement. I mean, it's like a scene out of Fight Club. He just keeps punching and punching and punching. It actually gets pretty uncomfortable for a lot of people in the dojo. Everybody, that is, except John Kreese. When Eli finally gets up with his fists covered in blood, he mean mugs the shit out of Kyler, letting him know what's up. But that definitely felt good for Eli because he just took out all that rage that he's felt for these guys for years. Now, over with the LaRussos, Daniel has arrived back from Japan, and Amanda lets him know what Kreese did. She tells Daniel, okay, now it's time to do it my way, which involves the police. But when they head over to file a report against John Kreese, it turns out he already filed a report against her, a restraining order, because Amanda did in fact come to his place of business after hours, enter, assault him, and then leave. So, in either way, she can't be within 500 feet of him, but they can't believe that John Kreese manipulated the situation once again. She tells Daniel, okay, I have one more plan, but this one's desperate. And that plan involves inviting over Armand, the landlord. They offer Armand double Kreese's rent, and even tell him, we're never going to use that space. You can rent it out to somebody else. And that's too good of an offer for Armand to pass up. So he walks into the dojo the next day and tries to evict Kreese, bringing with him two goons that are going to, quote, help Kreese move out, but it doesn't work. Kreese ends up beating both of these guys up and has Armand call up the LaRussos, who are at the dealership and kind of celebrating their mini victory a little too early over Cobra Kai. So when Daniel answers the phone, Armand tells him the deal is off, but then Kreese grabs the phone and tells him, nice try, but you can't end this war with diplomacy. So I suggest you prepare your students for battle because now it's open season on them and you. And then all of a sudden people in the dealership start freaking out because somebody snuck in a snake to the dealership. In episode 7, Sam has arrived back in the LaRusso's house. She went away to visit her grandmother for a little bit, but she's back. And both Daniel and Amanda apologize, telling Sam that she was right about Cobra Kai the whole time. Daniel has agreed to reopen the dojo, realizing that these kids do need to defend themselves. The only issue is, Sam has zero interest in ever doing karate again. She storms off, and Amanda lets Daniel know that she's pretty sure Sam hasn't been sleeping that well. So Daniel takes the day off from work, and him and Sam go fishing. They've been fishing in years. Actually, the last time they did go fishing was with Mr. Miyagi. That's how long it's been. Daniel tries to get out of her what exactly is going on and why she doesn't want to do karate, and she tells him, I froze. She watched her friends get hurt. She watched Dimitri get his arm broken, and she couldn't do anything. On top of it, she's having these panic attacks, and she's worried that she's never going to be able to defend herself again. Daniel lets the conversation go until they get back to the car, but has Sam walk him through what went down in the fight. She tells him that when the fight started, she couldn't really move or breathe. And it really came about when she saw Tori for the first time since the brawl at the school. Doesn't help matters that she's been replaying Robbie running away and Miguel falling over and over in her head. Daniel tells her that what happened to Dimitri is not her fault and decides to take her to the All Valley Sports Arena. Sure, he knows that this is where her dad defeated Johnny Lawrence, but he says no. This is also the place where I almost lost to fear. He explains that in his second All Valley... He was going up against a kid from Cobra Kai who was beating the ever-loving piss out of him, and he wanted to quit. He wanted to give in to fear. But it was Mr. Miyagi who reminded him, you can lose to your opponent, but you can't lose to fear. That is unacceptable. So Daniel got up, defeated him, and won, becoming the two-time champ. And yeah, what Mr. Miyagi said, Daniel needed to hear in that moment. But ultimately, it came down, ah, but ultimately, it came down to Daniel. Daniel needed the, ah, it came down to Daniel. Daniel needed to be the one to get up. Daniel needed to be the one to win the All-Valley. He tells Sam, you're going to have to be the one to get up and not give in to fear. Fear lives in all of us. You just can't let it control you. And when they get home, his little pep talk worked because him and Sam go back in the dojo and start training, and she's starting to have fun again doing it. Over with Johnny, he continues to help Miguel on his rehabilitation. And Miguel does so well that they end up tossing both the crutches and the wheelchair. They head back to Johnny's place where Johnny is just refreshing the Facebook message wondering why Allie hasn't responded yet, while Miguel is focusing on the important things, starting up a new dojo, and more importantly, getting a name for it. Johnny knows they need a badass name. Unfortunately, Cobra Kai is already taken. They also need students, and luckily, Miguel's first day back at school is the next day. So he's going to try to round up some recruits. And Miguel enters the school to an ovation. Everybody's happy to see Miguel back, 
including Eli, who daps him up and tells him how Cobra Kai has been killing it lately. But Miguel says, yeah, I need to talk to you about that when they're interrupted by the school bell, so they agree to catch up later. Miguel has been able to stay friends, though, with Eli and Dimitri. And this is the first time that Miguel is seeing Dimitri since he broke his arm. So he asks him, hey man, what happened to your arm? And Dimitri says, uh, we got a lot to catch up on and fills him in on the fight at the laser tag place and what happened. And that really pisses off Miguel. At lunch, he walks up to Eli and says, dude, I heard what you did to Dimitri. But Eli continues with this bullshit rhetoric that they're the enemy. They started it. And Miguel says, that's not what our sensei taught us. But Eli tells him, Johnny Lawrence is not my sensei. And Miguel can't believe that after everything Johnny did for this kid, He's ready to walk out on him. But Eli tells him, Johnny Lawrence betrayed us. And Miguel just starts shaking his head, saying, I know this isn't you talking. I know it's Crease. He's gotten into your head. You know, you can change this if you leave Cobra Kai. Sensei Lawrence is starting a new dojo. And word of this ends up piquing Eli's interest. But the two are interrupted when Kyler gets the attention of the entire cafeteria. Because Kyler, sporting a sweet new Cobra Kai shirt, is bullying Dimitri. And has signed his cast with a giant dick on it. All the kids in the cafeteria start laughing at Dimitri, and he's forced to just run away. Although there is one person who's not laughing, and ironically, it's Yasmin. But this outburst kind of proves Miguel's point, who looks at Eli and says, These are your new friends now? The guys who used to pick on you? Real cool. And walks off. Unfortunately for Dimitri, the bullying doesn't stop, though. It continues, with Kyler smacking him in the head when he's down picking up his books. And Yasmin sees it and feels bad for him, so she signs his cast, writing, I love your big dick. And Dimitri can't believe that she did that for him. She's never really been nice to him. But she tells Dimitri after the whole front wedgie thing, she knows what it's like to be laughed at by everybody and it's not a good feeling. The two are even kind of sharing a moment, but Yasmin walks away before it can escalate to anything but that. Just a moment. Johnny, though, has snuck into the school to tell Miguel that he's found a sweet spot for their new dojo. Johnny just learned about the magic of public parks. More importantly, the fact that they're free. He also wants an update on the recruiting aspect and... Miguel tells him, unfortunately, all these kids have drank the Kool-Aid, Sensei. None of them want to leave Cobra Kai. But over his shoulder, Johnny sees most of the kids from Cobra Kai, including Eli. And he walks up, trying to pitch them. Apologizing, saying, what I did was selfish. I let you guys down. I shouldn't have done that. And what happened at this school and the brawl, it hurt me to my core. But Eli says, you gave up on us long before that fight. And to his credit, Johnny doesn't back down, walking up to Eli and saying, you were baby shit soft when you came into that dojo. I made you who you are, not John Kreese. I did that. So if you guys want to throw your life down the drain, go ahead. Stick with Cobra Kai, stick with John Kreese. Or you can join my dojo, learn karate the right way. He gives them an address and a time and hopes that they show up. But the next day when it's the first training session of Johnny's new dojo, the only kids that show up are Miguel and the kids who were kicked out of Cobra Kai for, quote, not being Cobra Kai material. He tells all the new kids that the dojo's name is going to be Eagle Fang Karate. And as he starts handing out t-shirts and the kids are putting them on, Eli, along with a couple others, pop out from behind a bush, walking towards them. And Johnny's pumped, as is Miguel, thinking that Eli's about to join their dojo. But behind them is Tori and Kyler. And behind them is John Kreese along with the rest of Cobra Kai. Eli tells the group, I told you guys, I'm Cobra Kai for life. And John Kreese tells Johnny, I'm not here to fight. I want you back. You belong in Cobra Kai. But Johnny says, you're crazy if you think I'll ever work with you again. What you're filling these kids' heads with, what they're doing, it's bullshit. And you're to blame for that. But Kreese says, I disagree with that. I care about my students. And my students are strong. They would never show mercy and end up in a coma. And when Miguel hears that, he steps towards John Kreese. But Eli steps towards Miguel. Although both of the senseis push their students back. Kreese tells Johnny, though, this is it. This is your one chance to come back. There's not going to be another. Johnny tells Kreese, kick rocks, get out. So in episode eight, the Valley now has three dojos with Cobra Kai, Miyagi-Do, and Eagle Fang Karate. Although two of the senseis go to pick up Robbie Keane, who's getting out of juvie that day. And obviously those two senseis are Daniel and Johnny. Although, they're still pissed at each other from their little squabble at the chop shop. Daniel brings up John Kreese and how he's everybody's problem, but says to Johnny, don't worry, I'll clean up your mess as always. But Johnny takes exception to that, saying, I'm dealing with it, you don't have to clean up my mess. And as the two are bickering, Robbie walks out and says, you've got to be kidding me. He tells his dad, I told you, I don't want you here, and tells Daniel, you're the reason I was in there, and walks away. So the plan to pick up Robbie backfires on both of them. He heads to go meet with his new parole officer when, while he's waiting, out walks Tori. And he stands up like he's going to do something in a parole office, but she says, go ahead. They're just going to throw you back in juvie. They start conversing about Sam with Tori insulting her and Robbie sticking up for her. But Tori warns him, 
Sam's going to do to you what Miguel did to me. She's not to be trusted. You'll see. She also tells Robbie, it's not right what happened to us. Everybody was fighting, but we're the ones who end up getting punished. And then she gives Robbie a tip on what to say to the parole officer. And while they were talking about Sam, Sam was running into Miguel at school. They start catching up, talking about how Miguel is no longer friends with the Cobra Kai people after what they did to the Miyagi-Do kids. But then they catch Dimitri and Yaz making out, although Yaz isn't admitting it, acting like she would never hook up with Dimitri, but she totally did, and Dimitri is totally in love. After school, though, word starts to spread to all the dojos that the All-Valley Tournament has been canceled. One of the reps for the All-Valley Tournament even goes to Daniel, telling him that after all of the bad publicity, the local government just doesn't think it's a good idea. But they are having a hearing, and if anybody can convince them to put the All-Valley back on, it would be the two-time champ. After he leaves, Sam runs in and says, Dad, you're going to save the All-Valley, right? But Daniel isn't so sure. He thinks maybe it's not the worst idea that they don't have it because it won't give Cobra Kai a platform to spew their hate and violence. But Sam says, if they cancel the All-Valley, Miyagi-Do is the bad guy because everybody right now is blaming Miyagi-Do for the brawl at the school. So you have to go and fight for this tournament. And as Sam was pitching her dad on saving the tournament, Miguel was pitching Johnny on saving it. Although Johnny can't figure out why Miguel cares so much, he's not going to compete. And Miguel tells him, I'm competing. But Miguel is nowhere near ready to compete. He's just getting back in the swing of things for karate, and he can't do nearly the stuff he used to be able to. He would get his ass kicked. And Johnny tells him as much, saying, I can't let you compete. It's a safety thing. But Miguel, being a teenager, does not take that well thinking that Johnny just doesn't believe in him. And reminding Johnny, you said you'd always be in my corner, but here you are telling me that I can't defend my title. Later that night, Johnny gets a visit from Carmen, who does something that she never thought she would be doing a couple months ago, begging Johnny to go and save the tournament. She realized that Johnny felt almost as bad as she did for what happened at that school to her son. But she also knows that there are a bunch of kids, just like Miguel, who really need Johnny, because Johnny is a sensei. So she tells him, do what you do best, go fight for this tournament. And at the committee hearing, you've got Johnny and Daniel ready to plead their case to the committee. But the first guy to speak about it is actually John Kreese. And John Kreese is sweet-talking every single member of this committee, making Miyagi-Do out to be the bad guy. And Daniel is trying to plead his case, sticking up, saying how John Kreese isn't a good guy. Johnny's doing virtually the same thing. And it results in all three of them giving the All-Valley Tournament a really bad look. And definitely not changing any committee members' minds. Looks like the committee is about to rule that the All-Valley is still off when Miguel walks in. Addressing the committee that they need to keep the All-Valley Tournament. Sam ends up joining next to him. And the two of them tell the committee that karate is a great thing. And they need a safe place to do it. Karate teaches you about discipline and you know, discipline and more discipline. All the things that parents would want to hear, apparently that's what karate does. But Miguel also mentions that when he moved there, he was bullied. And karate not only gave him confidence, but it gave him self-defense. And to take that away is taking their expression away. This impassioned speech to the committee ends up working. And the old valley is back on. And that night, Miguel and Sam end up heading over to Miyagi-Do to celebrate a little bit. They start joking around about how he's the champ and start working on some moves when Miguel gets her in a hold. And the two are definitely pretty close to kissing when Robbie Keane shows up. And he can't believe what he's looking at. He asks them, did you guys hook up after I left or did you at least wait a week to make it look good? Although they tell Robbie it's not what it looks like. He doesn't buy it. Miguel tries to defend Sam, and Robbie does something that he never would have done under Daniel. He goes to strike first, with Sam actually getting in the way and defending him. And Robbie storms off, saying, you know what? You two deserve each other. And he then walks into Cobra Kai Karate. Oh, and Johnny and Carmen hooked up. But in episode 9, you find out that Robbie only really wanted a place to crash, and he thanks Kreese, but Kreese ends up showing him some moves. And that's when Eli and the rest of Cobra Kai walk in. And Eli is enraged that Robbie Keane is there. He's ready to attack him, but Kreese interrupts him, saying, Robbie's our guest, and you will treat him as such. But Eli storms into Kreese's office, saying, That kid doesn't belong here. He put Miguel in a coma. But Kreese reminds him, With the All-Valley coming up, we need talent, and that kid has it. And if there's one thing I learned over in Vietnam, is that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But Robbie's in the next room packing up. He's about to leave. When Tori walks in and starts telling him how much Sensei Kreese has helped her, helped her harness her anger into something positive, karate. She also tells him that a bunch of them are getting together after class and invites him along. And when he shows up, you've got Tori, Eli, Kyler. They're drinking in the middle of the woods, and Eli is not too thrilled to see Robbie show up. But Tori says, I invited him. What are you going to do about it? And Eli doesn't do anything. But they sneak into the zoo because they're planning on getting an actual cobra as a gift for Sensei Kreese. And they've got this whole plan worked out. 
the guards, the security cameras, everything. But when they get in the reptile exhibit, Kyler forgot to bring the snake pole. And that's a pretty big deal. And also, they hear a guard coming. So most of them flee. And when they get outside, Eli starts giving Kyler shit for the fact that he just screwed this whole thing up. But Robbie is not too far behind him. And Robbie picked up the snake bag, picked up the cobra, put it in it, and escaped with it. And when the group finds out that Robbie ended up getting the cobra, they start acting like he is the man. And it makes Eli pretty self-conscious. When they get back to Cobra Kai, Kreese compliments all of them for working together to complete a successful mission. They were able to form an alliance, which is important because he tells them their enemies are doing the same. And none of them really know what he's talking about, but he tells them that Miguel and Sam worked together to get the All Valley back up. And adding insult to injury, he also says they make a pretty good team. And this is news to both Robbie and Tori, and it causes Tori to actually storm out of the dojo. This is yet another example of the master manipulator that is John Kreese. But, in fairness to Kreese, he's not wrong. Miguel and Sam continue to hang out, and they're actually caught making out in Miyagi-Do by Daniel. And this is the first time that Daniel is actually meeting Miguel formally for the first time. It's embarrassing as hell for Sam, but Daniel and Miguel go outside and start talking about cars, but they also start talking about their upbringing. Miguel had no idea that Daniel came from Reseda. He also had no idea that Johnny came from the hills. He tells Daniel what he's heard about him from Johnny, but Daniel gives his side of the story. Also saying that this really all has to do with Allie. Daniel realizes though, oh shit, I gotta go, shakes his hand and leaves. And Miguel thinks it's a great sign that Daniel shook his hand before he left. And Sam says, yeah, all we need to do now is get my dad and your sensei to sit down and hash things out like you guys just did. But Miguel knows that there's no chance of that happening, there's too much bad blood. Although, Sam gets an idea. She tells the Miyagi-Do kids that they're hosting a Christmas party at the house. And Miguel tells the Eagle Fang kids that there's a party at the house, and they basically parent trap the group. Although, neither group is really thrilled to see each other, but Sam tells them, our big goal right now is to defeat Cobra Kai. We're stronger together than we are apart. But these two definitely have their work cut out for them. Now, Johnny wakes up with Carmen in his bed, and this is the first time that he's gotten laid in a long time. But he really likes Carmen, and Carmen seems to really like him. Although, she needs to get to work. And when Johnny goes out and starts making himself breakfast, he checks Facebook, and Allie has written him back. It turns out, Allie's in town for the holidays, and she wants to have lunch. This is so typical, by the way. You go, like, five years without getting laid, you finally get laid, and then all of a sudden, women come out of the woodwork after you. At least, that's what I hear. Never actually experienced that for myself. Anyway, you're not going to turn down food with your hot ex that you've always been in love with, and he meets up with her. And they start reminiscing about the old days, catching up on what both of them have been up to, but Johnny also apologizes for how he treated Allie, saying, I took you for granted back in the day, and I shouldn't have done that. He tells her that his life hasn't been great. He partied way too much in his 20s and his 30s, and then he got somebody pregnant, and he hasn't been a great dad. It really hasn't been until recently that he's gotten his life together and become a sensei. And to make him feel better, she tells him, well, my life isn't perfect either. I mean, yeah, on the surface, I have this great family, and I'm a doctor, successful career. But in reality, it's not that way at all. And she tells Johnny that she's separated from her husband. He's a great guy, but it just didn't work out. They then start talking about the first date, and their first date was at golf and stuff. So they decide to go relive that a little bit, and they have a blast. They're sitting outside, and they're telling each other about their kids. And they get pretty close to kissing when her phone goes off because she promised her mom she was going to go to this party at a country club. And she doesn't want to go. She'd rather hang out with Johnny. So she decides to invite Johnny along. And Johnny decides, yeah, all right, I've got nothing to do. But when he shows up at the country club, it's the same country club that Daniel LaRusso is a member of. And in the season finale, Sam and Miguel continue to try to get their groups to realize they need to work together. But there's so much bad blood in the room that a couple of the Eagle Fan kids get up to leave. And Dimitri actually is the one to stand up and say, we look like assholes right now. I mean, Cobra Kai literally became a group of assholes. But if we don't work together to fight them, we're bigger assholes than they are. And that speech actually worked. The group sits down and starts hashing out some plans to merge dojos. Really only agreeing that they're going to train at Miyagi-Do because the public park isn't really cutting it. But then Bert hears a cat outside. And as we learned earlier, Bert is an animal lover, so he goes to investigate. The only problem is Sam doesn't own a cat. And out of nowhere, Bert ends up flying through the window. Because somehow the Cobra Kai kids learned about this gathering. And they end up coming in and trying to finish this thing once and for all. This includes Tori, Eli, Kyler, the whole gang. And I just want to point out, this is literally a home invasion. Like, where are these kids' parents? What are they teaching them? Anyway, you've got Kyler matched up against Miguel. Tori is hunting down Sam, and Eli is fighting off anyone. Although, when he sees Kyler beating up Miguel, he starts to have second thoughts. And it comes full circle for him when he sees a couple of members of Cobra Kai who have Dimitri in a compromising position, 
And they tell him, hey, Eli, free shot. And he starts remembering everything that's gone down. And really the person who he's become. And he doesn't like it. So he ends up fighting them off and saving Dimitri. Walking up to him and apologizing for everything that's happened and saying, hey, you want to help me fight these guys? And Dimitri says, yeah. The two team up and they're fighting off a bunch of Cobra Kai people. And finally, the tide is shifting. And that includes Miguel who is getting the shit beat out of him by Kyler, but then he remembers everything he's gone through. And all the things that he's learned in karate finally click again. And he ends up beating up Kyler pretty good. Sam, though, is going through a panic attack. She's running away from Tori and flees into the dojo, but Tori is right behind her. And Tori ends up kicking her in the face, saying to Sam, you know, I really thought you'd put up a harder fight than this. But Sam is just frozen still. And Tori, being the little psychopath that she is, grabs nunchucks, and is ready to bash in Sam's face. But she misses her face, and it's a picture of Mr. Miyagi that falls to the ground, and when Sam sees it, she remembers what her dad said about fear and about standing up to it. So Sam ends up dodging Tori, fighting her off, and having a kendo stick really close to her head. She shows restraint, but tells her, I'm not scared of you. You know where to find me. I'm right here. And that's when Eli, Miguel, Dimitri, they walk in and tell Tori, the fight's over. You can leave now. But Tori can't believe that Eli switched allegiances, calling him a traitor and telling him, you better watch your back. Although Dimitri tells her he doesn't need to, Because he's got friends to do that for him. Now, while all of that is going on in the La Russa house, Johnny, Allie, Daniel, and Amanda are getting caught up at this country club party. They're reminiscing about Daniel and Allie's relationship, Johnny and Allie's relationship, and Allie helps them realize that while they sit here and act like they hate each other, they're a lot alike. And the things that they don't like in one another is actually a trait of themselves. But the LaRussos take off, and that leaves just Allie and Johnny. Although, Allie nips that in the bud, because Allie snuck off with Amanda and found out about Carmen. And Johnny admitted to Allie earlier in the day that he screwed up every meaningful relationship he's ever had, including the one with Allie. And it seems like Allie's not ready to let him screw up the one with Carmen, telling him, you can't live in the past, you've got a future ahead of you. And the two seem to have a lot of fun that day, but they're going to leave it at that, leave it as friends. And Johnny heads home, realizing that, yeah, Carmen's the one for me. Knocks on her door, but when she answers it, something is clearly wrong. And that's when the door opens further, and you see Miguel's bashed up face. Miguel tells Johnny what happened, and Johnny heads on over to Cobra Kai to confront Kreese. But when he gets there, he is shocked, because Robbie is training with Kreese in a Cobra Kai gi. Now, Kreese is pumped. He's like, all right, Johnny, here we go. You're back. Three generations of Cobra Kai. We're gonna run shit. And even Robbie says, you know, Dad, he just wants the best for you. But Johnny ain't here to hear that. And he starts throwing haymakers at John Kreese. He gets the best of him, and he's bashing Kreese's face in. And Robbie actually has to pull him off. And when he does, Johnny yells at him, saying, you don't get it, man. You can't trust this guy. And Robbie laughs at him, saying, what, and I can trust you? You know, all those years that you weren't there, I blame myself. But Sensei Kreese is right. I can't be my own worst enemy but you can. And then Robbie starts fighting his dad. Johnny tells him, kid, I'm not going to fight you. But Robbie persists. And Johnny uses self-defense, but he ends up spinning Robbie into a bunch of lockers and Robbie gets knocked out. Johnny's checking on him, trying to revive him because Robbie is unresponsive when John Kreese grabs one of the daggers off the walls and hits Johnny in the head with it. Looks like he's about to stab Johnny when Daniel shows up because Daniel showed up with the same intentions that Johnny did. And Daniel ends up saving Johnny. Although, Kreese does end up tackling him through a window. And when that happens, Kreese grabs one of the shards of glass and tells Daniel, it's time for you and Mr. Miyagi to be reunited. But that's when Daniel implements the pressure point technique, leaving Kreese completely immobilized. Although, all of this shit seems to be the last straw, and Daniel's ready to do the same thing he did with Chosen. Live or die, man! But that's when he's interrupted by Miguel and Sam. Both Johnny and Daniel tell Kreese, stay away from our kids. But Kreese says, eh, it's a free country. And Johnny says, not for you. Cobra Kai's done. But Kreese is able to get them to agree to a deal. Settle this thing at the All Valley. If Kreese's team loses, he'll leave. And both Daniel and Johnny agree to that, saying, we're not going to lose. But Robbie has since woken up, walks out, and tells both Johnny and Daniel to get out of there. And then him and Kreese walk back into Cobra Kai and continue their training. The next day, both Miyagi-Do and Eagle Fang join forces for the first time, becoming Miyagi Eagle Fang Do. It's a working title. I might have just made that up. But they go through the first training session with both Daniel and Johnny leading the way. Now in this episode, you also get the rest of the backstory on what happened with Kreese in Vietnam. He got taken to a POW camp where they were squaring off the soldiers to fight to the death. They were on a plank, and if you fell into this pit, you were done. Their captain continued to rail against John Kreese, blaming him for everything that happened. But also telling him, look around, man. I'm not the captain anymore. It's every man for themselves in this situation. The guy really became a roaring asshole, pointing out who was going to live and who was going to die. 
when the Viet Cong come to square off two more people, the captain is the first one. But then they pick another guy to go against the captain who is just not mentally prepared for battle. And that's when Kree steps up, agreeing to fight him. As they're walking to the plank, the captain is laughing, saying, Hey, I'm not going to lose. I have something to live for. You don't. And he reveals to Kreese that they got word that Kreese's girlfriend had died in a car accident. They kept it from Kreese because they didn't want him distracted. But the captain says, huh, a lot of good that did. And Kreese can't believe that this is true. But he doesn't really have time to reflect on it because he's got a battle to the death. And it looks for a while that the captain is going to end up winning. But Kreese ends up stabbing him with bamboo, and he's got the captain dangling over this snake pit. When all of a sudden, the cavalry comes. U.S. Army has shown up, and they're bombing the area, and it looks like the POWs are going to get out of there. Even the captain looks up at Kreese and says, all right, man, this is over. Pull me up. But this is the first sign of Kreese's no mercy. He steps on the captain's hands and lets the captain fall into the pit in a scene that is eerily similar to Miguel falling in the end of season two. Kreese then walks over and lets all the soldiers out. But the soldier that Kreese volunteered to go for ends up giving him a huge hug and thanking him, saying, you saved my life. Anything you need, man, for the rest of your life, I got you. So after this brawl that took place at the Cobra Kai Dojo, Kreese ends up calling up that guy and telling him, it's been a long time. Real quick, before we get into the season four recap, if you need a season three recap, just hit the tab in the corner. If you need a complete seasons one through three recap, there'll be another tab shortly. Just wait for that one. Now, season four is going to kick off with the merger of Miyagi-Do and Eagle Fang Karate. Although, it's clear they didn't really discuss things. The problem is they have two different ideologies, with Miyagi-Do going defense and Eagle Fang going offense. But let's just say the relationship between Daniel and Johnny is rocky at first. It's a pretty rough first day. When Daniel gets home, he thinks maybe he can relax there? Wrong. Amanda has put in a new alarm system ever since the fight, but... It's actually put her more on edge. He tries to make her feel better by just saying, I know this is less than ideal. And she looks at him and says, A boy was thrown through our window. I mean, if you would have told me a year ago that our family's safety depended on winning a karate tournament, I would have thought you were joking. Yet, here we are. He tells her, If Johnny and I can just work together, it gives us a great shot of ending all this. But Daniel has to admit that it's early, but so far they haven't been really able to work together. Over with Johnny that night, dinner's a little bit less stressful. He has dinner with Carmen, her mom, and Miguel. Carmen mentions to Miguel how she's happy that he's going out with Sam again. And then Miguel, being a horrible wingman, says, Yeah, I'm not the only one getting back together with my ex. Johnny went on a date with his. It leads for a really uncomfortable conversation as they're doing dishes between Carmen and Johnny, where she says, I think it's better that we don't rush into anything. Now, one person noticeably absent from practice that day was Robbie. Robbie heads back to Cobra Kai to pick up his things, and he's caught by John Kreese, who tells him, you can still practice with us. But Robbie reminds him, I never actually joined the team. The master manipulator of John Kreese, though, goes to work, stroking Robbie's ego and telling him that he's actually more talented than his dad. He just needs the right training. Kreese leaves Robbie, and he starts working out when Tori shows up. She starts ripping him for not being involved in the fight, and he says, what were you thinking? You'd break into their house, hurt Sam, and everything would be sunshine and roses? You're lucky they didn't call the cops. Tori shoots back, well, at least I'm not straddling the fence, because girls like Sam LaRusso think the world revolves around them. I mean, makes sense. All she has to do is make a puppy dog face and say please, and she gets whatever she wants. I mean, even after she dropped you, you're still wrapped right around her finger. He tells her that's not true, but she doesn't believe it. She then tells him, if you're going to stay on defense, this is not the right dojo for you. The next day, Miyagi-Do, Eagle Fang, Combo meet again to start training for the All Valley. And this time they talked about things. They're basically going to split up. Eagle Fang outside, Miyagi-Do inside. Although, after a few minutes, it's obvious that doesn't work. As both Johnny and Daniel are outside trying to be cordial to each other, Hawk walks inside the dojo to get some water. Now, Hawk's supposed to be a part of Eagle Fang, but Hawk hasn't been accepted by anybody since he returned. He's getting his ass kicked in practice, and the Miyagi-Do people don't want anything to do with him because he kicked the crap out of him. He walks out of the dojo after getting chastised by some of the Miyagi-Do people, and he sees Daniel and says, Mr. LaRusso, I don't know where I fit in here. And he's catching Daniel right after arguing with Johnny. So Daniel snaps at him, what did you expect? You burned bridges with everybody here. And instead of arguing with him, Hawk just takes off. So day two actually went worse than day one. As they're walking home, Johnny tells Miguel, there's just too much history between us. It's not going to work. Miguel tries to tell Johnny about Rocky Three, 
Rocky and Apollo working together to defeat Clubber Lang. But in order for those two to work together, somebody had to reach out. Somebody had to be the bigger man. So he implores Johnny to be that bigger guy. Reach out to Daniel. Apologize. But he wasn't the only one pitching a sensei because Sam did the exact same thing with her dad. But her dad and Johnny isn't the only relationship she wants to mend. She finds Robbie skateboarding and she apologizes for everything that happened, telling him that she still cares about him. She asks him to come back to the dojo, telling him how it would bring everybody together. But Robbie looks at her and says, I know this is going to be difficult for you, but for the first time in your life, you're not going to get what you want. And then he skates off. So she's 0 for 1. But she's 1 for 1 when Daniel shows up at Johnny's house, and he's the first one to apologize. But even their apologies are painful. It's not long before the two are fighting, and they just realize this isn't working. We tried, but we got to end it. We'll tell the kids tomorrow. When they show up the next day, they're shocked to find Hawk taking a sledgehammer to the fence. They ask him what he's doing, and Hawk decided that he would bring some unity to the group and literally build a bridge. Or, in this case, an Okinawan sparring deck. He saw a picture in the dojo from Mr. Miyagi's grandfather, so he decided that he would build one outside. The dimensions work out, and this changes Johnny and Daniel's thoughts of ending things. Now, after talking with Sam, Robbie went back to the dojo. But he went back to Cobra Kai. And when the remaining students, basically it's Tori, Kyler, and a couple of other no-names, show up, they're not too happy. They get even more pissed off when Robbie says, I'm going to lead class today. They start criticizing him, but he says, okay, I'll tell you what, if you can land one punch on me, I'll leave. And Robbie takes every single one of them out, including Tori. He tries to lend a hand to Tori to pick her up, and that's when she kicks him in the face. And he says, okay, a deal's a deal. I'll leave. But she says, no, come back. He then gets everybody in line and starts telling them that their enemies have bonded together to take them out. The deck is stacked against them, but luckily they have the playbook. He is going to teach Cobra Kai Miyagi-Do Karate. John Kreese then walks in and he hands over the class. And John Kreese was busy that day. He made a call to his old pal Terry Silver. But when Terry picked up the phone, he immediately hung up. Just like everybody else, he wants nothing to do with John Kreese. He's moved on. So Chris went and tracked him down. And Terry Silver is now Terrence Silver, living a pretty lavish lifestyle. Very different. Terry tries to tell him to get lost. But when Terry's new girlfriend, Cheyenne, ends up seeing John, she invites him into the party she's having for her new app that's launching. After chit-chatting with Terry's new group of friends, it becomes obvious to John just how much Terry has changed. He finally is able to get Terry alone. And he starts pitching Terry on the whole new generation of Cobra Kai that needs his help. He tells him how Johnny and Daniel have teamed up and he needs a partner. But Terry says no. He tells Chris, back in the 80s, I thought I could conquer the world. In reality, I was so hopped up on coke and revenge that I tortured a teenager. I worked hard to build my life back up. I'm not going back. Right before he leaves, Chris tells Terry, going off into the sunset, I might work for you, but I still have some fight left in me. And that statement sits with Terry. To where when Cheyenne asks him to go grab a bottle of wine, he does. But he sees another bottle lying there, and he spin kicks it. So, yeah, he still got it. In episode two, when Daniel heads to the dojo that day, he finds Johnny already there. But the fight quickly starts. Daniel tells Johnny, it looks like our students want us to work together. So we got to find some level of respect here. Johnny says respect is a two-way street. So they agree to try and see the other side. Daniel is going to teach Johnny Miyagi-Do, and Johnny is going to teach Daniel Eagle Fang Karate. Miyagi-Do is going to go first. Johnny starts painting a wall, but he gets bored with it real easily. doesn't take long before he quits, and he tells Daniel, defense is boring. Offense is always going to be more badass. But Daniel points out, while Miyagi-Do might seem boring, it saved him a few times. And when Johnny thinks about it, he's right. Mr. Miyagi's boring karate did come up clutch more than once in his life. So he walks back over, picks up the paintbrush, and continues to go back and forth. Waxing on, waxing off, trying to find balance. Johnny gives it his best effort, but at the end of the day, he still doesn't really buy in. And he tells Daniel, tomorrow, you're going to learn Eagle Fang Karate. Now, while Daniel was teaching Johnny a lesson, Amanda was trying to teach Tori a lesson. She actually found out where Tori worked and went and visited her, telling her to stay away from Sam. Conversation gets pretty contentious. Tori's boss actually comes over, and when Tori snaps at one of the customers, she gets fired. It wasn't what Amanda was setting out to do, but she's not crying about it. After work, Tori ends up going to the dojo where Robbie is teaching them Miyagi-Do karate. But Tori has an edge about her, 
more so than usual. Kreese notices and pulls her in the office and says, what's going on with you? Is it something with your mom? And she tells him, I lost my job. He gets the full story from Tori, but does tell her, you can't sit here and feel sorry for yourself. But just because Kreese told Tori not to feel bad for herself doesn't mean he's not going to stick up for her. He tracks down Amanda in a Whole Foods, right between the cheese and the apples. She tells Kreese, I know about the deal you made with my husband and Johnny, but I'm telling you right now, I will make sure you lose that tournament. And he asks her, is that why you're sabotaging my students? You know, I respect you defending your daughter. I think that's what all mothers should do. But unfortunately, Tori doesn't have that luxury. Tori has to pay the bills and put food on the table. Amanda had no idea about this and immediately feels really bad about what happened. She tries to fix it by buying Tori groceries and dropping them off on her front step. But as she's at La Russa Auto, Tori busts in with the bag of groceries, throws them on the ground and says, you think this makes up for it? I don't need your sympathy. I feed my family. Amanda says, Tori, I just want all this to be over. And Tori says, don't worry, it will be. When I humiliate your daughter at the All Valley in front of everybody. Thanks for lighting a fire under me. I needed that. Then she storms out. And speaking of the All Valley, the former champ, Daniel LaRusso, well, it's his turn to learn a different style. This time it's the man's karate, Eagle Fang. They go to an abandoned warehouse and Johnny works Daniel to the bone. Later that night, Johnny takes him to a hockey game and he figures he's just hanging out, guys being dudes, but no. Johnny's showing him the physicality of the sport. He then picks a fight on Daniel's behalf with the hockey team. And when it comes time to actually throw down, Johnny's nowhere to be found. It forces Daniel to actually strike first. And he wipes the floor with these guys. But most of the episode has to do with a new kid in town. His name's Kenny. He's having to join the middle school during the year, which is never easy. And the first impression he gives the other kids isn't a great one. When the bus rolls up, he's dancing like a fool, and all the kids are laughing at him. He does shine, however, in gym class, but it's at the expense of Anthony LaRusso. And Anthony's kind of fallen in with the bullies a little bit. Anthony only stops with the threats when his crush, a girl named Leah, comes up, tells Anthony, give the new kid a break, and then compliments Kenny on his shirt. The shirt's for a video game. So Anthony backs off, but Kenny did not have the best first day. He gets a phone call from his dad, who is serving in the army in Saudi Arabia, asking about how the first day went. Kenny doesn't tell him how bad it went, but you can tell his mood is down. His dad says to him, your mom needs you now. She's had a tough time after everything that happened to your brother, and his brother is in juvenile detention. Before his dad hangs up, he reminds Kenny that he's the man of the house now, and then he tells him he loves him. That night, Kenny hops on his favorite game, Dungeon Lord, starts playing it, when he gets a friend request from Leah. He's pumped, because Leah's adorable, and they play all night. She starts asking him questions, he's answering them, it seems like he's forming a little bit of a crush but he's completely unaware that it's not Leah on the other side. It's Anthony and his little douche crew. When they ask Kenny what he likes to do for fun and he reveals that he does cosplay, they convince Kenny the next night to show up in the park dressed as this squirrel professor character. Which, by the way, it's worth mentioning, Anthony is completely aware of who all these characters are. He's as big of a nerd as any of them, although he doesn't want to show it. So that night, Kenny heads out to the park, thinking that he's going to meet with Leah when Anthony and his buddies pop out from behind a bush and start filming him, laughing at him at his expense. When he sees that Anthony's filming him, he knocks his phone out of his hand and it breaks. And that's when Anthony and his friends grab him. They want Anthony to punch him in the face, but Anthony doesn't want to do it. They all think that Anthony is this karate whiz because of his dad, but in reality, he doesn't know how to do karate. He never got into it. He's just never dispelled that myth. Before Anthony actually has to hit Kenny, Kenny is able to squirm his way out and run away. Kenny's first two days have been rough. He needs some guidance, so he goes and visits his brother. And his brother, it turns out, is Sean. Kid that Robbie was enemies with at first, but eventually became friends with. And Sean tells Kenny, go visit Robbie Keane. He'll help you out. And in episode three, Kenny seeks out Robbie. He finds him in Cobra Kai, interrupting a lesson, and introduces himself to Robbie. Robbie had no idea Sean had a brother, and asks if Sean's out, and Kenny says, no, that's actually why I'm here. These kids keep hassling me, and one of them knows karate, apparently, so I'm here to defend myself. Robbie vouches for Kenny just based on Sean, and Kreese says, you're going to have to prove you're worthy of Cobra Kai, and Kenny fails that test. He's matched up against Kyler, and every time Kyler runs at him, Kenny just runs away. Just like in grade school, everybody's laughing at Kenny. Kreese tells Kenny, we don't have time for losers or cowards. 
and Kenny just goes home. Kenny, though, forgets his book bag, and Robbie grabs it. Kenny's mom wrote his address on one of the book bag straps, so it's not hard for Robbie to find out where he lives. He goes to deliver the book bag, and then Robbie asks about the situation with Sean. Kenny, though, blames himself, because Kenny had caught one of Sean's friends stealing from their parents, and he was about to tell on them. The kids started hassling Kenny, and Sean beat the crap out of him. Went a little bit too far, though, and it got Sean in juvie. The fact that Sean was just sticking up for his brother is the whole reason why he's not at home. And Kenny lives with that. Kenny tells Robbie, with him gone, I've got no one. And Robbie explains that with the All-Valley coming up, he just doesn't have the time. But when Kenny's phone dings, he looks down and sees a video of kids making fun of him again. Robbie demands to see the phone, and it's a video of kids who put a bunch of milk in his locker. So Robbie knows this kid really needs him. He decides to go in the backyard and show him a few moves. Problem is, the kid is terrified. Anytime somebody goes at him, he just backs up. He says to Robbie, all I can do is run. So Robbie says, let's use that to your advantage. But instead of running away, run at your opponent. He then tells Kenny, swing by the dojo tomorrow. Let's see if you can try out again. Well, while Robbie was visiting Kenny, Kreese was getting a visitor from Terry Silver. Terry starts yelling at Kreese for bringing up the past. And Kreese starts yelling at Terry for trying to be something he's not. Terry says to Kreese, this isn't my fight. And Kreese says, if you actually believe that, you wouldn't be standing here. And while Terry says he doesn't, Kreese doesn't believe him. He says to Terry, you know, there's still time to finish what we started. And when Terry goes home that night, he thinks about the past, thinks about his relationship with Kreese, thinks about the good times. And that's when he puts his hair back in the ponytail. Terrence Silver is back to being Terry Silver. The next day, Kenny does, in fact, stop by the dojo. Robbie is able to convince Kreese to give him one more shot, and it's just like the last time. Kyler runs at him, he runs away, but he thinks about what Robbie said. He ends up sucker punching Kyler, and that aggression ends up getting him a spot on Cobra Kai. And then finally, over with Miyagi Do Eagle Fang Karate. Ever since seeing how the other half lives, Johnny and Daniel have been getting along really well. So much so that Johnny, Carmen, and Miguel head over to have dinner with Daniel, Amanda, and Sam. At first, they start talking about Sam's future going to college, and then it segues into Miguel. Miguel's grades are great, and he says how he wants to go to Stanford, but Carmen points out that Stanford is really expensive, and a place like Santa Monica College would be more affordable. And Miguel kind of gets a little bit embarrassed about the fact that his mom admitted money might keep him from Stanford, not the grades. The next day, the lesson is switched. Since it works so well for the senseis, they're going to try it with the students. Miyagi-Do kids are going to go with Johnny. Eagle Fang kids are going to go with Daniel. And Daniel has the Eagle Fang kids try to catch Koi with their bare hands. It's a lesson in patience, and they fail miserably. After practice, Miguel gets a phone call from his mom that he's not going to be able to get picked up because they're having car trouble. Daniel overhears the conversation and tells him, bring in the car to my place. I'll fix it for you. He takes a look at it and realizes it just needs a new serpentine belt. But he's going to make Miguel fix it. Miguel doesn't know anything about cars, but Daniel says, neither did I at your age, but I learned. And look at me now. I've got billboards. Maybe one day you'll have a billboard. Miguel tells him, I don't know if they make billboards for people that go to community college. And that's when Daniel reveals that he didn't even go to college. He explains how his mother had saved up money for him to go, but he blew it on a trip to Japan. He then took the rest of the money and bought a filled bonsai business. He says to Miguel, your path is still being written, and you have a good head on your shoulders, so... I know you can do it. Johnny, meanwhile, takes the kids to an abandoned warehouse and wants them to jump off a roof, which Sam is not willing to do. None of the kids will do it. Sam tells Johnny, we came here with an open mind, but this is crazy. And when Johnny says, I know what I'm doing, Sam asks, do you? Because your track record says otherwise. He brings up the fact that it was her and her friends who wrecked his firebird. And it was her who showed up at his door drunk, hiding from her dad. She gets super defensive and yells, yeah, well, I'm a stupid teenager making mistakes. You, you're a 50-something-year-old man who lives alone, drinks all day, and clearly hasn't figured out his own life. And Johnny says, I figured out one thing for sure. If I did everything my parents wanted me to do, I'd be wearing a suit and tie and just waiting for the clock to hit five. Now I get to do what I love every day. So if you want to sit in the back seat your entire life like you were in that car when you wrecked my Firebird, then go ahead. It gets time to go for the day. And Johnny just looks at Sam and says, well, I guess you got what you wanted, right? And that's when Sam decides to get out behind the back seat. She runs full speed off that rooftop and onto the building below. 
and everybody jumps up in excitement. This move by Sam inspires Johnny, and that night he decides that he himself will get from behind the back seat. He goes and knocks on Carmen's door. He says, I know you want to take things slow, and she cuts him off and says, maybe we should talk about this later, but Johnny's not waiting till later. He's doing it right then and there. And then he sees why she wanted to wait till later. In the apartment is her, her mother, and her mother's friends. Johnny, though, not deterred. He says to Carmen, I don't care. I'm not afraid to take the leap with you. There's a lot to figure out, but let's figure it out together. Carmen agrees, and now it looks like they're dating. The next day, the lessons between Miyagi-Do and Eagle Fang continue with the other sensei. Miguel is actually able to catch a koi with his bare hand. He's pumped. Because of this, Daniel gives him a headband. Look, there's probably a technical name for this that I'm screwing up and everybody will rip me for, but to just some Joe Schmo, it looks like a bandana. But Johnny shows up and sees this quasi-ceremony. He's not too happy. Episode 4 picks up right where episode 3 left off, and Johnny is getting a little bit jealous of the relationship between Daniel and Miguel. Even as he's teaching the Miyagi-Do kids, he keeps peeking over his shoulder to see what Miguel and Daniel are doing. As the classes end, Johnny asks Miguel, Hey, you want to come over and grab some food? But Miguel says, oh, I wish I could, man, but I'm going back with Mr. LaRusso. We're finishing up my mom's car. And while Miguel works on his mom's car, Johnny works on his mom's other car. Or at least he tries. Something I can commiserate to, he apologizes to a woman in bed for lack of performance. He just can't get the Miguel and Daniel relationship out of his head. Carmen, though, changes the conversation because she doesn't like the fact that they're sneaking around behind Miguel's back. Johnny's worried, though, that this could make things worse if Miguel found out. Carmen reminds him that Miguel loves him. As Johnny and Carmen discuss how they're going to tell Miguel or when they're going to tell Miguel, Miguel is at the shop with Daniel, realizing just how much he and Daniel have in common. When it comes time to leave, Daniel decides to be the one to give Miguel his first ever driving lesson. They're heading to a birthday party to meet up with Sam and Amanda. And that birthday party is the last place Sam wants to be. That is, until she sees who else is there. Tori got a new job, and it's working kids' birthday parties as a mermaid. And Sam is in her glory. She spends most of the birthday giving Tori crap at her job. Finally gets to the point where Tori convinces all the kids to throw a glitter bomb on Sam. When Miguel and Daniel finally do show up, Sam sticks the knife in a little bit more and makes out with Miguel right in front of Tori. That's the final straw. Tori grabs her stuff, she heads out the back, and she is out of there. But she's stopped by Amanda, who sees it. Amanda apologizes for Sam and says that she will talk to her about what she did, but also says, you can't fault Sam for having issues with you after what you did. When Amanda brings up the situation with Tori's mom, Tori gets super defensive. Amanda backs off, but before she goes back in the party, she tells Tori, no one can help you if you don't let them. Now back at the Cobra Kai dojo, Robbie stayed a little bit extra to help out Kenny. Kenny had an issue the previous day when the middle school toured the high school. Kenny was wearing his Cobra Kai stuff, having no idea that there's a legitimate turf war going on. So when he went to the bathroom, he was approached by Bert and Nate. Then Hawk came in and told Kenny, you should probably get out of Cobra Kai while you still can. Kenny explained all of this to Robbie, and Robbie knows immediately who it is. But when Terry Silver, who has returned in the sensei role, overhears Robbie teaching Kenny about Miyagi-Do, he steps in. In an effort to assert his dominance, he challenges Robbie to a fight, a fight that he wins. When Terry picks up Robbie, he tells him, you've learned to channel your anger, but you're afraid. Robbie shoots back, I'm not afraid of anything. And Terry asks him, are you lying to me or yourself? If you want to be a champion, you need to dig out that fear and face it, whatever it is. Because if you don't, it's going to hold you back forever. Robbie then gets dressed and heads over to his dad's place. Because he needs to talk to his dad about what Hawk did to Kenny. Robbie says if Hawk and them don't stop, they're going to have to face the consequences. And Johnny feels like Kreese has put Robbie up to something, but Robbie says no, he hasn't. I'm just trying to help this kid out, but if your kids don't knock it off, I'll do what I have to. Johnny then tells Robbie how Kreese is brainwashing him, and Robbie says, that's the difference between me and you. You put all of your trust in Kreese, and I don't trust anybody anymore. I'm just using Cobra Kai to get what I want. He then takes Terry's advice, facing his fear, and apparently his fear is that he ends up like his dad. So he looks Johnny in the eye and says, I'm not going to end up like you, because I'm better than you. It's a really nice father-son moment. 
Johnny heads back into his apartment and he starts making dinner. He planned on having dinner with Miguel. A little bit of a surprise. He waits at the table for Miguel to get home and catches him going back into his house. But when he brings up the food, Miguel tells Johnny that he had an early dinner with the LaRussos. So unfortunately, he's going to have to take a rain check. He also brings up the fact that Daniel gave him his first driving lesson. And you can tell that that really hurts Johnny. Miguel then heads into his house because he's got a date that night. But he's not the only one. All of the kids are going to a drive-in movie to watch Bloodsport. That includes the Cobra Kai kids. Kenny, however, is being hazed pretty good by Kyler. Robbie actually has to tell him, hey, hazing's a good thing. It means you're being accepted. But as Kenny is coming back with this large order of food, he gets caught once again by Eli, Nate, and Bert. This time, however, Robbie sees it. He walks up to defend his buddy. The Miyagi-Do Eagle Fan kids end up walking up to defend Hawk. You got a good old-fashioned stare down going on, and Miguel says to him, meet us in the park in the half an hour. And the Cobra Kai kids do. They head to the park, but the Eagle Fang Miyagi-Do kids don't. They're waiting in a car because Miguel was well aware when he made this invitation that the sprinkler system was going to go off, and it soaks the Cobra Kai kids. The next day, it is all Cobra Kai can talk about, how they're going to get revenge. But it's not just them. Kreese wants to strike back. Terry, however, says, I agreed to come back to do what we originally set out to do, turn kids into winners. If we're just going to rehash the past, then history is just going to repeat itself. But it's not like Terry is willing to just sit back and do nothing. So Terry and Kreese head on over to Miyagi-Do. They interrupt an argument between Johnny and Daniel, who have different ideologies about how the previous night went down. Johnny thinking it was cowardice, and Daniel thinking it was a smart play. But they both shut up when Kreese and Silver show up. Daniel especially is shocked to see Terry Silver back in the valley. In episode 5, Daniel is extremely confrontational with Terry. It's understandable. Terry gets it. He tells Daniel, I'm not that guy anymore. As all of the Miyagi-Do Eagle fan kids watch on from afar, Daniel kind of threatens him. Terry, being very rational, says, that's fine. Just know, we're going to still hold our students to a moratorium on fighting before the tournament. We hope you guys will do the same. And Kreese doesn't even let them answer. He just reminds them about the deal that if Cobra Kai wins the Valley, Johnny and Daniel are done teaching. Right before Kreese leaves, he goes back into manipulation mode, telling Johnny that he's playing second fiddle to Daniel. And when Johnny says that's not the case, Kreese points out, it's his name on the dojo. Kreese and Silver head back to Cobra Kai and let the kids know. They just got back from Miyagi-Do Eagle Fang, and they are not, and they are not to fight before the tournament. Tori especially is pissed off about this because she feels like that they get to be humiliated and can't even answer back. But Terry brings up, there is a time and a place for everything. So if your enemies do something like laugh at you or mess with you, store that anger because you're going to need it when the time comes. While Robbie hears what Silver said, he has an idea on how they can get some payback. Kreese also heard Terry loud and clear, and he doesn't like what he heard. He takes him out to dinner and says, I want to make sure we're on the same page here. Cobra Kai never backs down from a fight, tournament or no tournament, and we always strike first. Terry points out, though, that Chris already did strike first. He stole Robbie. Stealing a guy's kid? Uh, That's a pretty big strike. Silver warns Chris, you've got all of these kids wrapped up in your drama, and if you don't fix it, it's going to take down Cobra Kai. Chris, however, reassures Silver that He's got it under control, but Silver says, from where I'm sitting, it's not what it looks like. Let's just focus on taking down Johnny and Daniel. After the run-in, though, with Terry Silver, Daniel LaRusso needs a drink. Him and Johnny head to the bar, and he fills Johnny in on the backstory between him and Terry Silver. When Daniel brings up Miguel and what's best for him, unaware of just how sensitive Johnny is to this, Johnny says, you think you're better than me because 30 years ago, you won by one point of one lucky kick. Let's remember, I was Cobra Kai's number one student, and if anyone knows how to beat them, it's going to be me. It suddenly starts an argument between the two, where at the end of it, they agree to fight again to settle the score. Best of three. Whoever wins is going to take over the kid's training. The students find out about this because Johnny hopped on Twitter and tweeted about the fight. Most of the kids seem a little bit worried about it. Hawk, however, thinks it's a great idea. He thinks it's awesome. Sam, however, lets Amanda know, who ends up questioning Daniel on if he's really going to fight Johnny 30 years after their initial fight. Daniel says, no, of course not. 
We were drunk. I'm sure Johnny woke up today and is saying the same thing. But that's not the case at all. Johnny is in training mode. As much as you can train for a fight in 24 hours. Daniel, though, still doesn't think they're actually going to fight. He's in the middle of texting Johnny an apology when Sam walks through the door. Sam questions her dad on what he did to set Johnny off, and Daniel takes offense to it, saying, that's the thing, I didn't do anything. The littlest thing sets Johnny Lawrence off. I've tried to make this work, Sam. He's impossible. Sam disagrees, saying he's not impossible, he just has a different style. She then asks her dad if this has anything to do with the guy that showed up at the dojo with Kreese, and Daniel says, yes, he is the one who lured me into Cobra Kai. Daniel reassures her, though, that there won't be any fight, and Sam says, of course not. Miyagi does all about avoiding conflict. And the attitude catches Daniel's ear, and he questions Sam on when all of a sudden that became an issue. And she tells him, when a psycho attacked me. Suddenly, Sam is starting to side with Johnny's way of thinking. For whatever reason, Daniel thinks this is a good time to bring up how Sam acted at the birthday party with Tori, and he tells her, that's not how we act. But Sam lets him know, that might not be how you act but I can make my own decisions. Now, while he wasn't planning on fighting, Daniel and Johnny show up at the dojo ready to throw down, but they're not the only ones there. The students are all there, and they're all filming it. Johnny takes the first point. Daniel ends up taking the next two. He's got game point. Johnny, however, ties it up with the next point winning. Problem is, no one knows who won because they knocked each other out at the same time. As all of the kids are checking the replay, Hawk shows up, but Hawk is missing his mohawk. He went to the tattoo parlor where the tattoo artist didn't show up, but the Cobra Kai kids did. And they didn't get into a fight. They simply shaved his mohawk off. Hawk is back to Eli. Johnny says aloud that if Kreis did this, then both him and Silver need to pay. And Daniel throws his arms up saying, he almost killed you last time. What, you want to fight them both now? The two different ideologies just cannot seem to coexist. Sam actually comes to the defense of Johnny and Daniel can't believe it. He thinks Johnny's being a bad influence. And when he tells Johnny that, Johnny tells him, you don't have to worry about that anymore because we're done. And the marriage between Cobra Kai and Eagle Fang is over. In episode six, the All Valley is changing. They're going to introduce a skills competition and there's a separate girls category. This means there's going to be two All Valley champions with the dojo who has the most points awarded as the winner. But for a dojo like Eagle Fang, this is an issue because they don't have any girls. It means they're going to have to scout for some. So that day, Johnny and Miguel head to the high school looking to recruit, but just like when Johnny was trying to recruit for Cobra Kai, he fails and comes off as downright creepy. Miguel sees Moon and asks if she wants to join, and Moon says, you know what would be really good for this? My ex, Piper. She's an athletic freak. So Johnny gets some pointers on how to talk to Piper, and he pitches Eagle Fang. And it seems to work. She's in. So it looks like Eagle Fang has their female champ. Over with Miyagi-Do, because of these rule changes... Most of the kids' attitudes have taken a turn for the worse. Other than Sam, none of them have confidence that they can actually succeed. It's got kids in both dojos questioning if the split was actually a good idea or not. Cobra Kai, though, is thrilled with the decision because they know that with Johnny and Daniel split up, neither of them have enough to actually compete. Chris thinks they just won the tournament before it even began. Now, he has to make sure that they can't recruit. Now, the obvious choice for Cobra Kai being the girl champ is Tori. And as she's walking into the dojo, she gets approached by her aunt, who wants to know if her mom's disability check came in. Tori does not have a good relationship with this woman. She's pretty much a leech. And Tori's aunt Candace tries to hold it over her that after her mom does pass away, she's all she's got. Tori, though, reminds her that in a year, she's going to be 18. And she doesn't need her help. Not that she's really offering any. I mean, one look at this woman's parted bangs, and you can tell she's in rough shape. But she tells Tori that she knows how to play the game. And if they go to family court, One judge is going to look at Tori, and with the rap sheet that she has, her brother Brandon is going to be taken away. Brandon's a scumbag, but Tori knows that she's right. Tori needs to bump up her resume, and that means going back to school. She goes and talks to the principal, and the principal has one condition. The LaRussos have to agree to it. So she does something she didn't want to do. She goes and asks the LaRussos for help. Amanda says, I just need you to promise me one thing, and Tori promises that she'll stay away from Sam, but... That's not what Amanda was looking for. She tells Tori, I need you to talk to somebody. Get support. Tori agrees as she tells Amanda, I need this. But Sam walks through the door, and when Sam sees Tori sitting at her kitchen table, she is not happy. Tori leaves, and Sam rips into her mom, saying, you wanted this girl in jail. Now she's sitting at our kitchen table, and you're inviting her back to school? 
Sam thinks it's complete hypocrisy after what happened between her dad and Johnny being enemies. And that goes into how Sam actually does want to train with Johnny. She wants to learn both styles. Sam is beyond frustrated. She feels like no one is listening to her. When she leaves the room, Daniel asks Amanda, why are you trying to help this girl? And that's when Amanda tells Daniel about how she got arrested one time. He always thought it was a high school prank, when in reality, she took a baseball bat to her tutor's car with her tutor in it because she found out her tutor was sleeping with her dad. In a way, she sees a little bit of herself in Tori. She tells Daniel, sometimes you need a wake-up call to change course. And Daniel thinks about it. He knows somebody that needs a wake-up call. It's Robbie. He goes to visit Robbie in the convenience store right by Cobra Kai. And Robbie doesn't want to hear it. He feels like he's heard this spiel before about coming back, being his male champion. He doesn't want to be used anymore. But Daniel's here to give him another speech. And it's about Terry Silver. He tells Robbie how Silver wormed his way into his life. And he will think he becomes stronger than he ever thought possible. But Silver won't stop because he's sick and twisted. As Daniel is telling Robbie this, Terry Silver is standing right behind him. He interrupts the conversation telling Robbie he should go check out the new equipment in the dojo and calmly tells Daniel it's unethical to poach other people's students. Daniel shoots back, you're not a sensei. You just manipulate people to turn them into something they're not. But Silver disputes that, saying, I didn't turn you into anything that wasn't already inside you. You were a hothead. All I had to do was wind you up and get out of the way. And if you're being honest with yourself, you know you liked it. You just never wanted to admit there's always been a little Cobra Kai in you. As Daniel was talking to an old friend, kind of, I mean, I'll, I'll consider Terry an old friend, Sam was so frustrated she needed to go visit her oldest friend, Aisha. This is the first time they've seen each other in a while. They start getting caught up. Aisha moved because, well, one, her parents were pissed about the fight at school, but also because her dad got a new job. Sam then gets into why she really showed up. She needs somebody to talk to about this Tory situation. Aisha tells her about what's going on in her new school about how there was a girl that normally she feels like would have picked on her, but she struck first, just like Johnny taught her. She walked up to this girl and introduced herself, and now they're great friends. The lesson here is attack your problems head on. So Sam does that. When Tori returns to school, Tori walks up to her. She's about to actually thank Sam for letting her back in when Sam cuts her off. She tells Tori, I'm not scared of you. You're not in control here. I am. My parents might fall for your crap, but if you so much as look at me funny, I will kick your ass for a third time. I'm coming for you, bitch. So much hostility. But while Sam was doing what Johnny told her in the strike first, Johnny had an issue because Piper never showed up for practice. Miguel goes to DM her on Instagram to find out what's going on, only to see that Piper has joined Cobra Kai, thanks to Cobra Kai sending all the girls swag boxes. Now it's back to the drawing board. They need a female champ. But Bert actually has somebody in mind. There's a girl on the debate team, and she is feisty. And Johnny comes to one of her debates and agrees. She would be perfect. But over with Miyagi-Do, one person has been noticeably absent from practice, and that is Hawk. Hawk's no more. He's back to being Eli. Dimitri goes to check on his oldest friend, and Eli says he's done with karate. Dimitri spends all day trying to convince Eli to come back. He finally gets through to him by telling him, a mohawk did not define you, Eli. Call yourself whatever you want, but at the end of the day, you're still my best friend. And the next day, Eli returns to Miyagi-Do. In episode 7, Cobra Kai is warming up for the lesson that day, and Robbie and Kenny are warming up together. Kenny had quite a day. Anthony stole his clothes during gym class because Kenny took it to him on the basketball court, and Anthony's D-bag friends were giving him crap for it. So in order to get retribution, he stole his clothes and everybody made fun of him again. But Terry Silver walks in and starts telling the kids that at the tournament, they're going to have to identify their opponent's weaknesses. Tori says, Sensei Kreese doesn't have a weakness. But Terry says, of course he does. We all have a weakness. And Kreese takes a little bit of an exception to that. They break up the class and Kreese turns to Silver and says, let's make this interesting. You pick a fighter and I pick a fighter. Whoever has the most wins ends up getting a six pack. But Kreese is dominating this competition. In fact, he has shut Terry Silver out. So Silver says, let's do double or nothing. And Kreese agrees, and he picks Robbie. Silver ends up picking Kenny. Kenny's getting beat up a little bit, and Silver pulls him aside and says, you need to look for the weakness. But Kenny says, Robbie doesn't have one. And Silver reminds him, everybody has one. And that's when Kenny realizes Robbie does, in fact, have a weakness. Robbie's weakness is the fact that he's fighting Kenny. Anytime he hits Kenny a little bit hard, Robbie checks on him. So when Robbie hits Kenny... He kind of fakes a little bit of an injury, and then he sweeps him. He ends up winning. But here's the weird thing. They went double or nothing. And since Silver was losing, 
that should mean that he gets nothing. Yet somehow he ended up getting a six pack of beer in a weird turn of events. I don't think the show creators realize what double or nothing means. Anyway, Crease is going to have to buy Silver some alcoholic beverages. And he buys him a Vietnam six pack, one that they used to enjoy back in their war days. But Crease starts reminiscing about their days in Vietnam, in particular, a soldier who took it upon himself to lead one day, and then ended up costing him his life. When Silver tells Crease he doesn't want to talk about that, Crease yells, Quiet! I'm not done speaking, Lieutenant. The other day, when we were teaching, you told the students I have a weakness. So, what is it? What's my weakness? Terry tries to de-escalate the situation, saying it was just a lesson for the class, but Crease feels like Terry is scared to tell him. He then, for probably what's the billionth time, reminds Terry that he saved his life in Vietnam and he should be grateful. He tells him, I've always looked out for you, but you need to fall back in line. You need to follow my lead. After this conversation, Kreese has Terry completely shook. Now, Kreese's old student, Johnny, is planning on telling Miguel that night that him and his mom are dating. They end up sitting Miguel down and awkwardly explaining it, and he's fine with it. They then had to practice where the new girl, Devin Lee, shows up. They then start practicing, but Johnny doesn't let Miguel practice at all because tournament's coming up and he can't risk him getting injured. Miguel really wants to practice, and he has to sit back and watch his friends get beat up. And at the end of practice, his friends aren't happy with him because they feel like he's the teacher's pet. It probably didn't help matters that they overheard Johnny tell Miguel that Carmen wanted to have a family dinner that night. And it was a family dinner that Miguel was late for. Carmen starts to try to discipline Miguel. Johnny awkwardly steps in. And finally, Miguel cuts both of them off and says, you know, at first I was cool with this, but now it's just weird. I'm over this. And Johnny's just struggling with this role because he remembers what it was like to be a stepchild. He never got along with his stepdad. So the next day, he ends up convincing Miguel to skip his last class and come hang out with him. And he explains that he's struggling a little bit with this. He doesn't really know what to do. You ask him about karate or the 80s, he's an expert, but dating somebody's mom, he's clueless. He explains the situation with his own father, about how Johnny's dad left when he was in kindergarten. Miguel asks him, did you ever try and go and find him? Maybe you could ask why he left, hear his side of the story? But Johnny doesn't want to do that, and he doesn't even know where to begin looking for him. He admits to Miguel that he's still too afraid to find out the truth anyway. He looks at Miguel and says, I didn't have a male role model to grow up until I met Crease, and you know how that went. And I screwed up with Robbie. And I don't want to make that same mistake again. They agree, though, that some things need to stay the same, i.e. Johnny being Miguel's sensei. Johnny says, okay, we need to work on the flying tornado, one of the most badass kicks in all of karate. Before they start, Sam walks to the door because she's ready to learn both styles. But Sam's brother, Anthony, well, he doesn't know any karate, even though his friends think he does. And when Daniel ends up catching him with some Cobra Kai stuff, he asks, what the hell's this? Anthony lies to him, telling him that there's a kid in school who's bullying him, and he's a part of Cobra Kai. So Daniel now wants to teach Anthony some karate to defend himself. First lesson for Anthony? Cleaning the bird crap off of the cars. However, when Daniel returns a couple hours later, the cars are clean, but he finds out that Anthony had hired a guy to do it. Anthony just didn't really seem into it, so he took a shortcut. Daniel is pissed, and when he brings up Mr. Miyagi, Anthony cuts him off and says, I'm so sick of hearing about Mr. Miyagi. I didn't know the guy. Daniel shakes his head and says, I thought you were mature enough to appreciate all this, but I guess I was wrong. That night, though, Daniel ends up catching Anthony snooping around the dojo looking at some of the Miyagi stuff. And Anthony tells him that everybody has these awesome Mr. Miyagi stories, including Sam. He doesn't. So Daniel ends up telling him one. That when Anthony was a baby, he actually kicked Mr. Miyagi right in the face. It was the only kick that Daniel had ever seen anyone land on Mr. Miyagi. And at that moment, Mr. Miyagi said that Anthony was going to be a handful, but he was also going to lead the family one day. Daniel then brings up the bully, and Anthony kind of scoffs at it and says, don't worry, I'll handle it. The next day, Anthony heads to school, and he starts talking to Leah. They used to be friends back in the day, and Anthony has a huge crush on her, but lately, they haven't really hung out a lot. Leah brings up going to a local fair because there's a bunch of people invited, and Anthony seems thrilled till he finds out that Kenny's going, and Kenny was telling Leah about one of the rides there. His friends overhear this, they start giving him crap, so Anthony walks up to Kenny saying that maybe they should start over and become friends, but Kenny, feeling that Cobra Kai confidence, ends up telling him he's got nothing to say to him, and then insulting him. He continues to insult him until Anthony starts chasing him, and Kenny ends up running into the library. He divides and conquers, kicking the crap out of all of Anthony's friends until finally Anthony's the only one that's left, and Anthony's only saved when a teacher walks in and catches them. 
The principal then has to call parents. The LaRussos come in, and they think that Anthony is an innocent victim in all of this. And they are shocked to learn that it's actually Anthony who's the bully. So Anthony is in big trouble. In episode 8, the conversation with Kreese is still bothering Terry. Before practice, he tells Terry, I just want to let you know, I haven't forgotten what you did for me, and I'll do anything to prove my loyalty to you. But Kreese just looks at him, nods, and says, just go to work, sensei. The kids, however, are out on the mats warming up, and most of the conversation has to do with the upcoming junior prom. Robbie and Tori pair up, and they're talking about how to get their opponents off balance. One of the ways to do that would be to go to prom together. That would really throw them for a loop. Silver overhears this and says, I think it's a great idea. But if you guys go, you're going in style. The door then opens up and a familiar face is returned. It's Stingray. He's done with house arrest and he can't wait to rejoin the dojo. He says hello to a couple of the kids there, but one person who is not thrilled to see him is John Kreese. Kreese insults him, telling him he was never a part of the team, and then kicks him out. The kids then practice and get ready for junior prom, and that includes over at the LaRusso household, where Anthony is grounded. Daniel and Amanda don't even want him in the pictures with Sam and Miguel. And speaking of Miguel, he shows up along with Carmen and along with Johnny, which makes for a little bit of an awkward interaction between Johnny and Daniel. But Johnny gets in the photos, and then they have one big group photo. Johnny and Carmen then head home and let Miguel head off and have some fun. But when Johnny and Carmen get back to the apartment complex... Shannon walks up to Johnny. She's out, she's clean, she's doing well, but she tells him how Terry Silver came by her apartment and gave Robbie a car to take to prom. He also gives Shannon a wad of cash to make sure Robbie was, quote, taken care of and offered to hook up Shannon with a job. Normally, this would be nice, but because it's Terry Silver, it comes across as weird. She tells Johnny how she tried to talk to Robbie about it, but Terry Silver clearly has his hooks in him. So since this is a Cobra Kai matter, She wants Johnny to handle it, and he tells her, I will. So Johnny heads over to Cobra Kai. He has to break in, however, and no one's there. Just because nobody's there doesn't mean nobody's watching. Terry Silver has hooked up a bunch of security camera footage, and he knows that Johnny's there, so he gives the dojo a call, and Johnny picks up. Johnny tells Terry to stay away from Robbie. Terry tells Johnny that he's going to take care of him. But when Johnny threatens Terry, Terry gives him an address. He then calls John Kreese up and gives him the same address. And that address is to the original location of Cobra Kai. Terry and Kreese end up arriving first. And he first starts reminiscing about the good old days, but Terry tells him that this will be the new location for the head of Cobra Kai. They're going back to their roots. But this isn't the only one. Terry's got big plans. He's scouting other locations to franchise the Cobra Kai brand, which is something that John Kreese hadn't even discussed with him. Terry then tells Kreese, I have one more surprise for you. And when Johnny walks through the door, Terry ambushes him. With Johnny laying on the ground, Terry tells him, that's what you get for betraying your sensei. But his sensei, John Kreese, can't believe that he actually convinced Johnny to show up. Even Kreese thinks he went over the line. Terry, however, tells Kreese, I had to prove my loyalty to you. You wanted to get back at him? Well, here's your chance. I mean, think about it. The only way this loser has a chance of winning the tournament is with the Diaz kid. And what's he going to feel like when he sees his sensei got his ass beat? It's going to throw him off his game. Johnny, however, gets up and we have an old man fight. But during this old man fight, it becomes clear that Terry Silver is slowly going off the deep end. By the way, he ends up winning that old man fight. After he disposes of Johnny, Kreese tells him, we agree to settle this at the tournament. Terry questions him, saying, what happened to No Mercy? But Kreese says, I thought you knew better than to question me. They then leave and Johnny eventually heads home and gets drunk. Back at the LaRussos, Louie pitches both Daniel and Amanda on letting his sister Vanessa talk to him about what's going on with Anthony. She's in her second year of grad school for child psychology, but she comes across a little ditzy. Louie, however, is able to prove to them that she knows what she's talking about when she comes in and drops a little bit of a diagnosis but uses a lot of big words that I certainly don't know the meaning to. And that's when they decide, yeah, okay, she might be qualified. They give her the okay to talk to Anthony, but she doesn't want to talk to Anthony. She wants to talk to them. And when she sits them down, they don't like what they hear. She doesn't all out blame them, but she does point to a couple of things that make them realize they're implicit in this. Later in the night, when Daniel goes to check on Anthony and they're talking, it seems like everything's going okay. But then as Daniel's leaving his room, he hears a ping. And he realizes that even though they told Anthony no more devices, he clearly didn't listen. Daniel ends up finding what looks like an iPad and breaks it in half. And... Anthony can't believe it. But Daniel commands the room. It kind of forces Anthony to listen. 
So Anthony's not having the best night, and unfortunately, neither is Eli. He's going solo at the junior prom, feeling like a complete loser. He still really has a crush on Moon, but without the Mohawk, he's lost his confidence. He doesn't even talk to her. Miguel and Sam are having a nice enough time until they see Tori and Robbie enter the room together. And Tori and Robbie kind of steal the show. I mean, these two are living rent-free in the heads of Miguel and Sam. After the junior prom, all of the kids go and drink back at Stingray's place, which is bizarre. And trust me, Stingray's neighbor agrees. He actually tries to break up the party, but he throws one too many insults to Stingray, and Stingray has to show him his Stingray. He kicks him in the balls, then he roundhouse kicks him in the face, and then he sends him on his way. And the party continues. But while this party looks big, it's really not. And Tori and Sam couldn't avoid each other forever. Sam starts insulting Tori, and Tori tells her, I would kick your ass, but I promised your mom that I won it. The insults get traded back and forth, and then Sam does something that she's not supposed to under the Miyagi-Do flag. She strikes first. It forces an all-out brawl between Tori and Sam, and Miguel tries to step in, wondering what the hell she's doing, but he ends up getting mixed up in it. Then Robbie jumps in. At one point in the fight, Sam grabs Robbie and says, you think I broke your heart? Well, you broke mine too. And Miguel definitely heard that. It's awkward. But everybody eventually just ends up in the pool. Sam, though, demands to go home. After dropping off Sam, Miguel heads home, and he needs to talk to somebody about what went down, so he goes to Johnny's, but Johnny is completely drunk. Miguel ends up taking him to bed, and Johnny starts telling him how he tries to be there for him, but he just sucks at it. Miguel tells him, you're doing just fine. I I love you. And Johnny starts crying. He says, I love you too, Robbie. As if Miguel's night couldn't get any worse. And speaking of Robbie, he and Tori end up hooking up. And it looks like it goes further than first base. So I guess Terry Silver was right. They did go to junior prom in style. And they also ended it in style. The next morning, there has been a wake-up call in the LaRusso household. Anthony, for the first time in his life, actually takes out the trash, which is shocking to his parents. He tells his dad that he's heard him loud and clear and he wants to help out with the dealership and maybe go to the dojo once in a while. And Daniel's all for that. But over at the rival dojo, Terry Silver has fully gone off the deep end. He's drunk on those Vietnam beers when Stingray walks in. He thinks John Kreese made a mistake. There's no way that Cobra Kai could be Cobra Kai without Stingray. After all, he did defend the dojo in the school brawl. Stingray wants to plead his case to Terry Silver about why he should join the dojo. So Terry Silver says, okay, if you want to be Cobra Kai, I'll make you Cobra Kai. And he starts beating the ever-loving crap out of him. Terry Silver is back to torturing teenagers. Well, actually, Stingray is a grown adult. But still, it's bizarre behavior nonetheless. In episode 9, it is finally the day that we've all been waiting for. The All-Valley Tournament. Daniel gives the Miyagi-Do kids a pep talk. Johnny gives his kids a pep talk. And John Kreese seems to give Cobra Kai kids a pep talk. But Terry Silver corrects him and says, that's not a pep talk, that's an order. Before the tournament starts, Johnny pulls Miguel aside and says, hey man, I know what's going on with you. Things with your girlfriend are a little weird right now, but she's not on your team. So I need you to get your head in the game. You'll make up with her later, but right now, you need to be focused on winning. Miguel, however, seems a little turned off by the conversation. The tournament starts off with the skills competition, and after the first round, Miyagi-Do and Eagle Fang are 1-2. Cobra Kai is in 5th. However, after the second round of skills competition, it's a completely different ball game. Both Miyagi-Do and Eagle Fang kids came up a little bit short, while Cobra Kai kids came to play. Cobra Kai is now in first place, Miyagi-Do is in second, and Eagle Fang is in sixth. The Miyagi-Do kids especially are a little bit down. They really thought they had the skills competition in the bag, and Eli blames himself because he couldn't break a board on a kick. Daniel, though, has to remind them that this thing is far from over. Johnny, however, is not taking things as well. I mean, you can't blame him. He is in sixth place. He asks Devin what they need to be Cobra Kai, and she tells him they just need to get as deep in the tournament as possible. In between the skills competition and the actual fighting, you get an impromptu concert from country award-winning recording artist Carrie Underwood. Because it's not enough that she ruined Sunday Night Football. Now she needs to ruin this television show. If you can't tell, I'm not a country music fan. If you are, smash that thumbs down button. They then kick off the actual karate part of this, and Cobra Kai continues to dominate. Sam realizes the reason why. It's because they know the Miyagi-Do playbook. After the play-in, the only kids that are left are Miguel, Dimitri, Robbie, Eli, Kenny, Kyler, Devin, Sam, Tori, and Piper. So basically all of the main characters. I guess I could have said that. 
Miguel ends up winning his quarterfinal fight with ease. As does Tori. She defeats Devin, and now there's no hope for Eagle Fang to have a female champion. Devin does say, though, that she's only been doing this for about six weeks, so next year she's going to kick all of their asses. But with Devin out, they really do need Miguel at this point. They need him to win the whole thing for them to have a shot at winning the tournament. Before Robbie has his quarterfinal fight, Daniel walks up to him, questioning him on the sportsmanship of giving Cobra Kai kids the Miyagi-Do playbook. And Robbie reminds him, I'm here to win. He says to Daniel, everybody thinks that their way is the only way. You, my dad, Crease. Truth is, it doesn't matter which way you fight, as long as it works. And I'll use whatever it takes to win. Daniel then gives Robbie one last Miyagi-Do lesson. Never put passion in front of principle. Because even when you win, you end up losing. Robbie, though, doesn't end up losing. He ends up winning his quarterfinal fight. So does Dimitri. He advances as well. But Eli's quarterfinal fight is with his former bully, Kyler. And without the Mohawk, Kyler's back to calling Eli Lip. And Eli is back to being that quiet introvert. But Moon overhears the conversation, walks up to him and says, He's always been a bully. That's not who you are. You're not defined by your haircut. I liked you for your energy and your confidence. Eli, though, admits that lately he doesn't have any confidence. So Moon decides to give him some. She ends up kissing him right before he goes on the mat. And Hawk is back. And he takes all that pent-out frustration out on Kyler and whoops his ass. The next fight is between Sam and Piper. And Piper takes the first point. And after she does, she tells Sam, you know, Robbie says that Miyagi-Do is for defense only. Without your defense, you've got nothing. So Sam gives her a little Cobra Kai. She strikes first, catching Piper off guard and taking the next point. Then she takes the second and the third. And when she returns to her side, Daniel is not happy that she used Eagle Fang slash Cobra Kai's tactics. He tells her, you didn't win the right way. And she says, maybe my right way is different than yours. That's now the second person to tell Daniel that maybe his way isn't the only way or the right way. The semifinals then kick off, and it's Cobra Kai versus Cobra Kai. Robbie is matched up against his mentee, Kenny. Kenny, though, takes the first point to the shock of everybody. Chris then pulls Robbie aside and says, I thought you wanted to be a champion. Are you fighting your friend or your opponent? And he sends him back out. When Robbie heads back to the mat, he's got a different look about him. He takes the next point, and then the second point, and he takes the third point in epic style, kicking Kenny extremely hard in the face, possibly breaking the kid's nose. Even Robbie's shocked at his violence. Miguel's quarterfinal matchup is also going to be against a friend. He's fighting Eli. Before the match, Daniel walks over to him and starts telling him how well he's been doing and how he noticed that in his last match, he was circling his opponent, which is a Miyagi-Do tactic. Johnny, however, comes over, interrupts the conversation, and tells Miguel to go get ready. Daniel then confronts Johnny about training Sam. And Johnny tells Daniel, you should thank me. She got to the semifinals. Daniel, though, feels like Johnny turned her into somebody who can't control her anger. Johnny feels like Daniel is turning his kids into a bunch of wimps. Daniel tells Johnny to stay away from Sam. Johnny tells Daniel to stay away from Miguel. And after all that drama, it's actually time to fight. But Johnny is definitely feeling the pressure of only having one fighter left in the tournament. He says to Miguel, you take his ass out. And Miguel is a little appalled because Eli is his friend. But Johnny says he picked a side. He picked Miyagi-Do. Whose side are you on? Miguel says he's on Johnny's side, but, but he definitely doesn't agree with his coach. Hawk and Miguel start going at it, but when Miguel jumps up to kick Hawk in the face, he ends up re injuring his back, falling to the mat and screaming in agony. But in the season finale, you learn that it's just a muscle pull. And per tournament rules, Miguel has 30 minutes to get out in the mat and continue. While everybody's waiting to see if Miguel can continue, Robbie and Dimitri fight it out. And Dimitri loses. But all things considered, he actually performed pretty well. Robbie then heads into the bathroom where he sees Kenny beating the crap out of Anthony LaRusso. Anthony walked in just to apologize to Kenny for how he treated him. But Kenny went straight bully on him. Robbie has to pull Kenny off of him. And he asks him, what are you doing? Kenny tells him he's getting payback on his bully. And Robbie is shocked to learn that it was Anthony who was the one that was the bully. But Kenny assures him, he's not my bully anymore. He then gets down next to Anthony's face and says, next year, we're in high school. Get ready, because you're going to be in a world of pain. You see, Kenny's last name is Pain, so that was a given. His name used to be ironic, but now that he knows karate, it fits. And he's using it perfectly. Robbie, though, is disgusted in Kenny's behavior and tells him this isn't how I trained you. But Kenny reminds him, this is Cobra Kai. No mercy. Back out on the mat, Tori advances to the finals, as does Sam. 
But before we can have the finals, we need to figure out what's going on with Miguel. Johnny walks in the back to check on him when Kreese cuts him off. He tells Johnny, I had no idea what Terry was doing back in the old dojo, and Johnny tries to walk away from him. It didn't have to be like this. It could have been with me and your real son. Johnny turns around and says, you don't care about Robbie any more than you cared about me. But Kreese rejects that notion, saying, I cared the most about you. Johnny tells him, you have a funny way of showing it. You had me fight dirty. Also, Cobra Kai could be number one. But Kreese says, that's not the case. You were down 2-0. I knew that if you lost, you were going to go down a downward spiral. Which, by the way, you did. I wanted to win for you. When Chris brings up that maybe one day Robbie could keep the Cobra Kai name going, Johnny tells him that's not going to happen because tonight Cobra Kai is going to die. He then walks in to check on Miguel, who's got maybe five minutes remaining on the clock. Miguel, however, has doubts that he can continue. Johnny starts giving him a pep talk about being a champion, fighting through adversity, but he ends it by saying, we're going to show Cobra Kai and LaRusso who's best. And Miguel realizes that's what this is all about. Johnny tries to remind him that if they lose, he can't be Miguel's sensei anymore. But after how the day is gone, Miguel doesn't even care. When the clock strikes zero, Miguel is not out on the mat. That means Eli and Robbie are going to be fighting in the finals. Miguel's actually headed home, but as he's walking at the door, he runs into Sam. He told her that it just felt like he wasn't fighting for himself anymore. Sam completely commiserates because she gets it from her dad all the time, and Miguel reminds her, Johnny's not my dad. He then wishes Sam luck, orders an Uber, and heads home. Eli and Robbie end up fighting first. If Robbie wins, Cobra Kai clinches the championship. Robbie takes the first point, and when Eli goes back to his corner, he tells Daniel, I don't know what to do. He trained at Miyagi-Do a lot longer than I have, and he knows all of my moves. That's when Daniel flips the script. He reminds Eli that he was at Cobra Kai longer than Robbie's been. He tells Eli, put him on defense. Eli ends up getting the next point, and after three minutes, these guys are still tied, which means we're going into sudden death. Terry Silver, though, is not happy with Robbie's performance. He feels like the fight should be over by now, and Robbie is sick of Terry's crap and says, do you want to go fight him? Terry goes to step to Robbie, but Kreese gets in the middle and says, you're angry. Good. Use it. On the other side of the mat, exact opposite. Daniel is thrilled, and when it comes time for advice, he looks at Sam, looks at Johnny, and says, give him all you got. And he does. Eli Moskowitz ends up winning the All-Valley Tournament. He also keeps the hopes of Cobra Kai not winning alive. Now it's just up to Sam. She's got to fight Tori. But as Tori is heading out to the mat, she runs into Amanda. Amanda tells Tori that she spoke to her therapist. And her therapist confirms that Tori is going to the meetings, just like they agreed upon. Tori then thanks Amanda because Amanda helped find a volunteer to help out with her mom. And that's when Amanda says, you can repay me now. I'm not asking you to back down, but just play by the rules. As those two were having an awkward conversation in the back, out on the mats, Daniel was also having an awkward conversation with Johnny. He's finally come to the realization that his way isn't the only way, and it's not the right way. He needs Johnny's help. Johnny agrees to help out, and now they're back to being Miyagi Fang. Tori and Sam then get on the mat for the finals. Sam takes the first point, thanks to the flying tornado kick that Johnny taught her. Tori ties it up at one, though, a few seconds later. Sam looks like she takes a 2-1 lead, but the referee decides that it was out of bounds. Tori then takes the next point, and now it's match point. Sam runs over to her corner to get some advice, and Daniel and Johnny tell her, use your instincts. She does. She ties it up at two, although that really should have won it for her if the referee hadn't called the last one out of bounds. Now both girls have two points. And during the fight, Tori accidentally elbows Sam in the face. It looks really bad. It also looks like Cobra Kai is back to their tactics, even though Tori didn't mean to do it. She actually apologized to Sam. They give Sam a little bit of time to get back to her bearings. And when Tori goes over into her corner, Terry Silver tells her to do it again. This is within earshot of all of the Cobra Kai kids. Terry promises her that this referee is not going to end it on a technicality. The worst she'll get is a warning. If given the opportunity, Tori is to elbow her in the face again. Tori, though, doesn't want to do that. She wants to win fairly, and she feels like she doesn't need to do those things to win. John Kreese, though, steps in, telling her, we've come this far, but this is your fight now. So whatever happens is up to you. Tori then goes out there and gets the winning point. She has won the championship, not just for herself, but for her dojo. Johnny and Daniel can no longer teach karate in the valley. As Cobra Kai is celebrating the victory, Terry Silver grabs the microphone. He says to the audience how proud he is of the kids on the stage, but he also says how proud he is to announce 
that they're going to be franchising Cobra Kai's all over the Valley. It's as if John Kreese has no say in it. Kyler is planning on having a victory party at his place, and Tori's planning on going, but she has to grab her bag from the locker room. When she heads in, though, she sees Terry Silver paying off the ref. Tori suddenly realizes she didn't actually win fairly, and she no longer feels like going to a party. After the tournament, Johnny headed to Cobra Kai. He was looking for Robbie, but what he finds is a completely empty dojo with a Ford lease sign on the outside of it. Luckily for Johnny, Robbie followed him there. Robbie tells him that they're moving to a new location, which is actually the old location. Johnny can tell that Robbie's not in a great mood. He thinks it's about the match, but Robbie tells him it's not. It's about this kid, Kenny. I was trying to help him, take him under my wing. But when I saw him today, it's like looking in a mirror. At this point, Robbie starts crying. He says to Johnny, I realize I screwed everything up because I had all this hate inside of me. For you and for Miguel. And I thought I could use Cobra Kai to control that. But it just made things worse and it's never going to get better. Johnny corrects him, telling him he had a great thing going with LaRusso and he got in the way of it. So Robbie should not blame himself. If anybody, he should be blaming Johnny. Johnny gives Robbie a big hug and tells him it's going to be all right. When he heads back to the apartment, he goes to check on his other son, Miguel. But Miguel's not there. Miguel headed home in that Uber, and then he wrote his mom a letter. Miguel needed to find out who his real dad is. So without his mom or his grandmother knowing, he hopped on a Greyhound bus to Mexico City to track him down, find out where his roots are. Carmen is worried sick because, as she tells Johnny, Miguel's dad has no idea Miguel exists. And on top of it, Miguel's dad is not the best guy. So Johnny reassures Carmen, I'm going to take care of this, don't worry. That night, as the Cobra Kai kids party it up, but their senseis are just sharing a drink, reveling in the victory. After some laughs, Silver tells Kreese, thought about what you said about your weakness, and I realized what it is. It's Johnny Lawrence. That's what this was all about. It was never about us teaming up, and I fell for that. And you know why? Because you're my weakness. The cops then show up, and Silver tells Kreese, I'm now shedding my weakness. And the cops arrest John Kreese for aggravated assault and attempted murder. Because Stingray was so desperate to get in a Cobra Kai that he was willing to let Terry Silver beat the ever-loving crap out of him. Silver told Stingray that when the cops come calling asking who did it, he is to tell them that it was John Kreese. If he does that, he's back in. So John Kreese is put behind bars. The next day, Daniel is trying to shake the loss. He heads to the gravesite of Mr. Miyagi, asking for advice and guidance. He knows he made a bet, but he doesn't want to honor it because the men that he made the bet with aren't honorable. Daniel realizes he needs help, but he can't just ask somebody from the grade. He needs to ask somebody who can actually help him in that moment. And the person he asked to help him out is Chosen. He asked Chosen to help him put an end to Cobra Kai. And that is the end of Season 4 of Cobra Kai. Thank you so much for getting this part of the recap. Consider subscribing to the channel. Thumbs up if you liked it. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought this sucked. If I do not get back to you in the comments section, don't take it personal. I'm like Eli without the Mohawk. Nasty comments make me feel bad, and I kind of shrivel up into a ball and cry. You know what would make me feel better, though? Merch. If you bought some, because I have some, go buy a t-shirt or something. I got bills to pay. But just know, I really do appreciate everybody checking this out.